Of what sort is cognitive experience? By Frederick J. E. Woodbridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of what sort is cognitive experience? By Frederick J. E. Woodbridge. Professor Dewey's recent article in this journal, footnote, the Postulate of Immediate Empiricism, Volume 2, Number 15, page 393, end footnote, has definitely contributed to a clearer understanding of what the term real means to many advocates of immediate empiricism and pragmatism. The real is simply that which is experienced and as it is experienced. It would seem that there could be little further misunderstanding on that point. The challenge to the pragmatist to tell what he means by reality appears thus to have been met successfully. If it were necessary to lend external authority to Professor Dewey's exposition, one might cite the ancient statement of Aristotle that reality is whatever can be the subject of investigation. From such a definition of reality, it is evident that reals may differ from one another in any way in which they are found to differ. And that, consequently, there may be true reals and false reals, if warrant can be found for such a distinction among the things which may be investigated. There is no need of an elaborate proof to show that this definition, in spite of, rather just because of, its simplicity and obviousness, is the only fruitful definition of reality. The history of thought is in evidence. To the metaphysician it is a real blessing, for it frees him from the trivial question whether there is anything real at all, and turns him to the more fruitful and important question, what is the nature of the real when it is most fittingly and appropriately defined? Now it is just that question which seems to cause confusion and dilemma, and it is here that further clarification is needed. For the natural and obvious answer to the question, when is reality most fittingly and appropriately defined, seems to be this, when it is truly defined. That this answer is the cause of the greater part of current controversies about pragmatism is obvious enough. It seems worthwhile, therefore, to say something about it, and elicit, possibly, further discussion from Professor Dewey and others. The dilemma in question is apparent. If reality as true is but one sort of reality, or one sort of experience, how can it possibly be affirmed that the nature of reality is most fittingly defined when we have that sort, when, that is, reality is experienced as true? The answer occasionally given, that it is thus most fittingly defined because defined in a way which most usefully meets the needs which raise the demand for definition, seems to many minds to be unsatisfactory. The reasons for dissatisfaction vary much, from quaking fear for the possible loss of an absolute, to a genuine conviction that the whole knowing experience is a transcendent kind of experience, related to all other kinds in a way in which they are not related to it. I willingly leave the absolutist to his fears, but would say something in favor of the transcendence of knowledge. As what I have to say has been definitely shaped in its formulation by Professor Dewey's article, I use some of his expressions to bring out the point I would raise for discussion. In each case, says Professor Dewey, the nub of the question is what sort of experience is meant or indicated, a concrete and determinate experience varying when it varies in specific real elements and agreeing when it agrees in specific real elements, so that we have a contrast not between a reality and various approximations to, or phenomenal representations of reality, but between different reals of experience. And the reader is begged to bear in mind that from this standpoint, when an experience or some sort of experience is referred to, some thing or some sort of thing is always meant. Now this statement that things are what they are experienced to be is usually translated into the statement that things, or ultimately reality, being, are only and just what they are known to be, or that things are or reality is, what it is for a conscious knower, whether the knower be conceived primarily as a perceiver or as a thinker, being a further and secondary question. This is the root paralogism of all idealisms, whether subjective or objective, psychological or epistemological. By our postulate, things are what they are experienced to be, and unless knowing is the sole and only genuine mode of experiencing, it is fallacious to say that reality is just and exclusively what it is or would be to an all-competent all-knower, or even that it is, relatively and piecemeal, what it is to a finite and partial knower. 
Or, put more positively, knowing is one mode of experiencing, and the primary philosophic demand from the standpoint of immediatism is to find out what sort of an experience knowing is, or, concretely, how things are experienced when they are experienced as known things. Again, Professor Dewey says in a footnote, the adequacy of any particular account of the truth experience is not a matter to be settled by general reasoning, but by finding out what sort of an experience the truth experience actually is. I have italicized the word actually. Now, my difficulty in getting a clear understanding of these and similar statements gets sharply pointed in the question, in what sort of experience do I find out what any sort of experience is, and is actually or otherwise? Is the answer to that question this? In the sort of experience you are having at the time? If so, I find out what sort of an experience a moral experience is by having it, and what sort a cognitive experience is by having it. But how shall I distinguish a moral experience from one that is cognitive? By having, I suppose the answer would run, a new experience, in which the two are experienced as different. Such an answer. And let it be kept in mind that I am not burdening anybody with such an answer but I'm using it as one which seems to be implied in the statement under consideration, deserves to be pushed to its full limit in order to get a clear view of the sort of experience which it indicates. So pushed, it appears to me to be this. If I am to find out what the different sorts of experience are, how they are related to one another, how they are distinguished, what sorts of objects constitute them, what has been their history, what their promise is, which of them may be called true and which false, I must have an experience in which what I desire to find out is to some extent at least experienced. But this desired experience, which would contain within it all the possible riches of science and philosophy, is just the sort of experience which is genuinely called a cognitive experience. If, therefore, the suggested answer is the correct one, it appears to me clear that in cognitive experience all other sorts of experience may exist without alteration. For otherwise, how could we find out what sort they are? How could they be identified as the concrete particular sorts of experience indicated? In other words, in the cognitive sort of experience, all other sorts appear to be transcended. The nub of the question, to use Professor Dewey's words once more, is undoubtedly what sort of experience is meant or indicated. But it would appear that this question can be answered only in a cognitive experience. As I have said, I burden no one with the answer which appears inevitably to lead to this conclusion. Yet I willingly take the burden myself. While I do not like the word experience as an ultimate term in metaphysics, I can find little objection to it when it is used as equivalent to something or some sort of thing, when thing may be apparently any term or any relation. Thus using the word, I can readily assent to such expressions as this. There are many sorts of experience, of which the cognitive sort is only one, and one which can be confused with the others only to the detriment of all. But I must now add that the cognitive experience is of such a sort that it enables us to tell what the others actually are when we ask the question about their sort. This question may not be asked and may not be answered. In that case, no one sort of experience is identified or distinguished. And what sort of an experience would that be if not precisely what we should mean by an unconscious experience? Footnote. That, I may remark, is why I dislike the word experience. Unconscious experience looks like a contradiction. End footnote. I do not know whether those philosophers who bear, by choice or by imputation, the name of pragmatists deny, as a rule, the transcendence of the cognitive experience as here defined. When it is denied, I see no alternative but to assert that in the cognitive experience, all other experiences become altered. But... If we must have cognitive experience in order to have science and philosophy, and cognitive experience alters things, why then it appears to me that science and philosophy will be hugged to the bosom of the absolute idealist as his legitimate offspring. In the endeavor to escape from the barren consequences of the position that all experience is in its nature cognitive and cognitive only, or, in other words, that all things are states of consciousness, there appears danger of running to the opposite extreme. That is why, as it seems to me, the revolt against absolutism fails to convince many who are by no means absolutists. We attempt to give an account of experience which will commend itself to thought. How can we succeed if we raise the suspicion 
that any account of experience for thought must necessarily be not only partial and inadequate, but radically different from what experience is. Surely here is a point where discussion cannot fail to be important and profitable. End of Of What Sort Is Cognitive Experience? by Frederick J. E. Woodbridge The Knowledge Experience and Its Relationships by John Dewey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Knowledge Experience and Its Relationships by John Dewey Professor Woodbridge's recent article in this journal Footnote, Volume 2, Number 21, page 573, end footnote, raises clearly and effectively certain questions involved in the conception of philosophy and its problems, which, in my mind, associate themselves with the ideas set forth in the first chapter of Studies in Logical Theory. At all events, I am going to make some points in his article an excuse for reverting to the position there taken viz. that the characteristic problem of philosophy is the relationships to one another borne by certain typical functions or modes of experience, e.g., the practical, cognitional, aesthetic, etc. Objectively put, philosophy arises because the reals, which are the distinctively appropriate subject matters of these different types, get into conflict with one another, a conflict so thorough as to leave us no choice except a to doubt all, b, somewhat arbitrarily, to select one as the standard and norm for valuing the others, or c, to effect a harmonization of their respective claims through a more thorough consideration of their respective historic and working positions and relationships. Footnote. One of the many merits of Bradley's appearance and reality is the way in which it thrusts this conception virtually, if not intentionally, to the foreground. It leaves but three alternatives. To accept Bradley's result. To explain away satisfactorily the seeming discrepancies of the various functions. Or to find another method and scheme of harmonization than his. End footnote. Woodbridge's article presents a special case of the general problem, viz. how to justify the peculiar claims of knowledge to provide a valid account of other modes of experience. If reality as true is but one sort of reality or one sort of experience, how can it possibly be affirmed that the nature of reality is most fittingly defined when we have that sort, when, that is, reality is experienced as true? Page 574. And again, we attempt to give an account of experience which will commend itself to thought. How can we succeed if we raise the suspicion that any account for thought must necessarily be not only partial and inadequate, but radically different from what experience is? Page 576. 1. Certainly, any empirical statement which ends up in the implication that the knowledge account is radically different from what experience is has committed suicide. But when we say, with Woodbridge, 1 that the real is simply that which is experienced and as it is experienced, page 573, and two, that there are many sorts of experience of which the cognitive sort is only one, page 576, we seem to be committed to the conviction that the knowledge experience is of things which, in some sense, are different from what the things of other experiences were, and from what they would continue to be in the future, were it not for an intervening knowledge experience. As I interpret the history of thought, it is precisely the fact that the knowledge account is different from what the things of other experiences are, contemporaneously with those experiences, which has been the main motivation of the transcendental, non-empirical conception of knowledge. Because the things of experience are so many different things, it has been thought that reality, to be one, single and comprehensive, must be exclusively identifiable with the content of the perfected knowledge account. And this is then set over against the things of other experiences, of all experience qua experience, as the absolute against the phenomenal, the really real against the world of appearances. 
Hence the attacks made by the transcendentalists upon recent empiricisms, however denominated, because they deny exclusive or isolated jurisdiction to the knowledge function. Hence also the charges by the empiricists upon the transcendent concept of knowledge, claiming that the isolation in which knowledge is placed leaves it an arbitrary, brute dictum, nonetheless arbitrary and even solipsistic because referred to a knower termed absolute, or else a subjectivistic aesthetic indulgence, since such isolation excludes verification in all the senses of verification hitherto employed by man. When, therefore, we have, as in Professor Woodbridge's account, a transcendence notion of knowledge put forth with an empiristic motivation and basis, we have the problem in an especially interesting form. How can the knowledge experience connect with other experiences in such a way as not to justify itself at their expense? How can, at one and the same time, knowledge be transcendent of other experiences and the things of other experiences be real? 2. What concretely is the knowledge experience? Three sets of facts are designated by the term knowledge. 1. It may denote the de facto presence in experience of a discriminate or outstanding quale or content. Some degree of distinction is necessary to any experienced thing, and such determinateness in experience one may agree to call knowledge. This sort of thing can hardly be referred to as transcendent, for what does it transcend? Not the things of other experiences, for it is the things of all experiences. It is a name for them in their determinate character. If transcendence refers to the relationships between such things, and things not at all determinately present in experience, then it has an intelligible meaning, but appears to involve a theory of the existence of reals apart from experience, or to be non-empirical. And transcendence, as a relationship of that which is in experience to out-of-experience things, would certainly make wholly meaningless any statement as to whether knowledge does or does not modify the out-of-experience. Such a statement can have intelligible meaning only when said of the things of knowledge in contrast and connection with other experienced things. Knowledge, in this sense, apart from the question of the appropriateness of the term, does not seem then to be anything more than a restatement of the postulate of immediate empiricism, that things are that which they are experienced to be recognizing that some sort of distinctiveness is necessary to any thing. All things, truth and error, the obscure and the clear, the practical, the logical, the aesthetic, are thus present, and all equally real, though not equally valuable and valid. 2. Reference as a contemporaneous empirical trait is not an inevitable accompaniment of presence as just defined. The quail or content which discriminates a thing may not be referred explicitly to any other, nor any other to it. Connection may exist, however, practically. One thing may be found subsequently to affect, influence, or control, favorably or unfavorably, the quality of some other present thing. Reference as an empirical fact is then established. That is, becomes a discriminate element in the constitution of something which is complex. Hence, a second sense of knowledge. It is the experience in which the nature of such reference is investigated and defined. This involves such transformation of the character of antecedent things as makes possible the ascription to them and the maintenance by them of the relevant references. Recognizing that practical bearing or influence becomes explicit as reference in case of conflicting and therefore uncertain and contradictory bearings, and we get knowledge as Woodbridge has defined it, when he says, it is of such a sort that it enables us to tell what the others actually are when we ask the question about their sort. The practical conflict of experiences in bringing to light the problem of their reference also brings to light the question of their nature as fitted to sustain such and such a reference. It makes their old character suspicious, doubtful, precarious, in a word, problematic. This inherent dissentience is always, as to its terminus ad quim, a movement of inquiry, of institution or definition. This constitutes an answering or telling experience in which an unquestioned thing replaces the dubious thing. 
Hence, while it would not do to say that the statement quoted above is an innocuous truism, there are too many subjectivistic theories of knowledge abroad to render its realistic implication other than important. It may do to say that its excellence lies in the fact that it identifies knowledge as a doubt, inquiry, answer, experience. When Woodbridge adds to what was last quoted, the question may not be asked and may not be answered. In that case, no one sort of experience is identified or distinguished. And what sort of an experience would that be if not precisely what we should mean by an unconscious experience? Page 576. There appears to be a relapse to the first sense of knowledge set forth. It is one thing to say that distinctive character is necessary to any experience in order not to fall into the contradiction of an unconscious experience. It is another thing to say that that kind of identification and distinction, namely of reference, which follows from express questioning and constitutes express answering, is necessary to a conscious experience. Only of the first sense of knowledge can the contradiction be relevant. Only of the second sense is the reference to question and answer relevant. Bearing these things in mind, I do not appreciate the difficulty in the statement that reality is most fittingly defined as true because defined in a way which most usefully meets the needs that raise the demand for definition. Page 574. The needs, however, do not raise the demand. They are the demand. For the needs and their useful meeting are neither of them extrinsic to the situation. The needs are the unstable, dissentient characters constituting an intolerable condition, while usefully is the meaning of this demand, that is, their transformation into a stable, dependable state of affairs. Needs are not met more or less usefully. They are met more or less successfully, and the successful fulfillment defines the useful thing of the situation. There is no other measure of use. I am convinced that the charges of subjectivism and of an arbitrarily utilitarian practicalism brought against current empiricism are due to the fact that the critic, because he himself retains a belief in the independent existence of a subject, ego, consciousness, or whatever, external to the subject matters, ascribes similar beliefs to the one criticized, and hence suppose that the latter, when he talks about genesis in needs and outcome in success or fulfillment, is talking about something resident in a subject or consciousness, which arbitrarily pounces in, picks out its plum, and withdraws triumphant. But to the thoroughgoing empiricist, the self, the ego, consciousness, needs, and utility are all alike interpreted in terms of functions, contexts, or contents in and of the things experienced. 3. The empiricist of the immediate type will prefer to use the term knowledge experience or cognitional experience concerning the sort just described. For here, things are contemporaneously experienced as known things. It is now and here that they have knownness as one of their discriminate properties, just as they may have that of hardness or unpleasantness or monetary value. But knowledge is also used to denote the function or result of the doubt, inquiry, answer, experience in its outcome of critically assured presence with respect to further experiences. By the nature of the case, the sentiency of conflicting things reaches an end when the nature of reference is defined and the character of things altered so that they may sustain such reference. Hence, when Woodbridge says, page 575, in cognitive experience all other sorts may exist without alteration, he says something which seems obviously false if said of knowledge in the second sense discussed, since transformation is the salient trait of its things, but ideally true of knowledge in this third sense, that is, the precise and defining aim of knowledge in the second sense, is to secure things which are permanent or stable objects of reference, which may be persistently employed without thereby introducing further conflicts. Unalterability means precisely capacity to enter into further things as secured points of regard, established contents and quails, guaranteed methods. Footnote. Knowledge might thus be roughly defined as the function of economically or efficiently securing increasing complexity in experienced things. End footnote. 
we are thus enabled to give a precise statement of the relationship of the knowledge experience to alteration and to validity. In its second sense, knowledge arises because of the inherent discrepancy and consequent alteration of things. But it gives that alteration a particular turn which it would not take without knowledge. It directs alteration towards a result of security and stability. Hence, it is because knowledge is an experience. In organic connections of genesis and destiny with other experiences, that the validity of knowledge or truth has an assignable meaning. Because it is an affair of meeting the concrete demands of things, the demand of dissentient things for consensus, harmony, through defining reference and through redefining things which sustain the reference in question. Validity or invalidity is a trait or property of facts which may be empirically investigated and instituted. But validity is not definable or measurable in terms of the knowledge content if isolated, but only of the function of the knowledge experience in subsequent experiences. So, knowledge tells us the nature of the real when it is most fittingly and appropriately defined, because it is only when a real is ambiguous and discrepant that it needs definition. Its peculiar fitness is functional, relative and empirical, not absolutistic and transcendental. Yet we may admit a certain empirical transcendence. The outcome of the doubt-inquiry-answer experience literally goes beyond the state of suspense and dissentience out of which it originates. So far as the knowledge experience fulfills its function, it permanently transcends its own originating conditions. It puts certain things out of doubt, rendering them reliable, economical, and fruitful constituents in other more complex things. This transcendence is the very essence of the pragmatic empiricist account of truth. End of The Knowledge Experience and Its Relationships by John Dewey Cognitive Experience and Its Object by B. H. Boda This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cognitive Experience and Its Object by B. H. Boda In a recent issue of this journal, footnote, volume 2, number 15, pages 393 to 399, end footnote, Professor Dewey contributes an interesting discussion of the postulate which forms the basis of immediate empiricism. According to his presentation, this postulate amounts to the statement that things are what they are experienced to be. One experience must be held to be as real, as ultimate, as any other, and so the usual distinction between appearance and reality is necessarily wrong in principle. That is to say, the standard according to which we condemn certain experiences as erroneous, while others are judged to be true, is not some fact external to the experience itself to which the experience in question either does or does not manage to conform, but resides within the experience itself. This seems to mean that if the experience by inner motivation points to some further experience in which the prior experience fulfills itself, then this later experience is true to the extent to which the transition to the later experience takes place without any fundamental change in the quality or characteristic which continuously fulfills the corresponding quality present in the initial stage. Truth, then, is simply a relation which obtains among experiences that are equally real, and does not imply that certain experiences are simply appearances, in contrast to others which are not. That this postulate is actually involved in immediate empiricism appears to be beyond rational dispute. All experiences are equally real. At this point, however, Professor Woodbridge raises the doubt whether immediate empiricism has been sufficiently mindful of the unique character of those experiences which are commonly called cognitive. Footnote. This journal, volume 2, number 21, pages 573 to 576. End footnote. He expresses the fear that in their zeal to avoid the postulate of idealism, the pragmatists have gone to the opposite extreme and tend to dispose of all facts as experiences, 
without much regard to the difference between the cognitive and the non-cognitive the point involved becomes apparent when having accepted the empiricist definition of reality we take up the fruitful and important question what is the nature of the real when is it most fittingly and appropriately defined page 573 for in the face of this question another inevitably suggests itself if reality as true is but one sort of reality or one sort of experience how can it possibly be affirmed that the nature of reality is most fittingly defined when reality is experienced as true page 514 all experiences as has been said are equally real and moreover they alone are real yet this discovery does not absolve us from the obligation to answer the question in what sort of experience do i find out what any sort of experience is and is actually or otherwise page 575 and the answer to this question it is held necessitates the conclusion that the whole knowing experience is a transcendent kind of experience related to all other kinds in a way in which they are not related to it page 574 that is to say in the cognitive experience all other sorts of experience may exist without alteration or in the cognitive sort of experience all other sorts appear to be transcended page 575 at first sight it may appear that whatever difficulty may be felt arises from the fact that too sharp a separation is made by the critic between the cognitive experience and other experiences professor dewey says i should define a cognitive experience as one which has certain bearings or implications which induce and fulfill themselves in a subsequent experience in which the relevant thing is experienced as cognized as a known object and is thereby transformed or reorganized page 396 and this definition seems to take in all kinds of experiences so that no injustice can be charged with regard to a special class of experiences thus in the illustration given by professor dewey the first experience is a fearsome noise which by its own peculiar constitution induces an investigation or inquiry and so leads on to the experience labeled noise as a wind curtain fact with regard to the latter two things may be noted a its character differs from that of the preceding experience only in the circumstance that it is more predominantly of the kind described by james as knowledge about or pointing rather than of the kind known as direct acquaintance with and b it is a change of experienced reality affected through the medium of cognition page 395 considered as true it is superior to the prior experience because in it we find the fulfillment the readjustment the satisfaction of the preceding experience which clamored for reform considered as real both experiences are simply instances of present functioning and so stand on the same level this seems to dispose of the suggestion that the difference between the cognitive and the non-cognitive has been overlooked and that the transcendent nature of cognition has been treated with neglect if all experiences are the same in kind there need be no occasion to emphasize a difference of this sort nor is it obvious that the transcendent character of cognition does not receive due consideration while there is doubtless a change of experienced reality affected through the medium of cognition this does not preclude the possibility of satisfying the demand of the critic that in cognitive experience all other sorts of experience may exist without alteration for other sorts we must substitute other instances the other instances exist within it in the sense that they are continuous with it and are the objects to which the experience in question refers or points a difficulty can arise here it would seem only if we treat the former experiences as entities which are transferred bodily in order to be included as integral parts of the present experience yet the point urged by professor woodbridge cannot be set aside so easily the explanation of the pragmatist gains whatever plausibility it may possess from the fact that the implications involved in the concept of an experience developing solely by inner motivation are not carried out to their logical conclusion in a developing experience the later stage as we have seen is to be described as predominantly of the pointing type and this characteristic indicates that it is not a final stage if the experience beginning with the fearsome noise were permitted to run its full course the experience of noise as a wind curtain fact would turn out to be simply a stage in a process the goal of which would be another experience of the type of acquaintance with differing however from the initial stage in the fact that it would be of this type not merely predominantly 
but completely or ideally. The complete truth of any experience, it seems, must be sought in this final stage. This final stage or term, however, cannot apparently be considered as cognitive in the sense of answering a question regarding the nature of any other experience, nor can it be termed cognitive as this term is defined by Professor Dewey. I cannot say this is what that means, for such affirmation implies pointing, and pointing is a characteristic that pertains solely to the stages which precede the final goal. The final stage, therefore, is neither true nor untrue, except for the onlooking psychologist. Though it be conceded that the progressive fulfillment of an experience brings out with increasing clearness the truth or meaning of the starting point, the last stage is a born whence no traveler returns, even in retrospect. And the nature of this final stage is necessarily a question of supreme interest and importance. I wish to repeat that the final stage is not one in which any questions are asked or answered. And as Professor Woodbridge contends, if this be true, it follows that no one sort of experience is identified or distinguished. And what sort of an experience would that be if not precisely what we should mean by an unconscious experience? Page 576. In a measure, this sudden transition from a world which is synonymous with experience to a world which is most startlingly realistic is anticipated or at least suggested by statements such as the following, quoted from Professor Dewey. The reader is begged to bear in mind that from this standpoint, when an experience or some sort of experience is referred to, some thing or some sort of thing is always meant. Page 394. If these final terms can be properly characterized as unconscious experience, then conscious experience is a phrase which must be confined to relations between such final terms. And it seems to follow at once that consciousness may be defined, therefore, as a kind of continuum of objects. Footnote. This journal, volume 2, number 5, page 121. End footnote. It may perhaps be objected that Professor Woodbridge passes too hastily from an experience in which no one sort of experience is identified or distinguished to the conclusion that such an experience or reality can be properly termed an unconscious experience. It takes too much for granted. The opponent may point out that identifying and distinguishing are lacking only in the sense which presupposes comparison with other experiences. Nevertheless, this inference that the final experience may properly be termed unconscious seems capable of sufficient justification. In other words, it appears that, as the doctrine is stated, the element of knowledge about or pointing is a constitutive and essential part of any experience of which we can form any respectable conception. While in the presentation of this doctrine, it is usually made to appear that the first and the last stages of the continuous development through which experience becomes differentiated both belong to the same general type of acquaintance with, there is a difference which seems essential. This difference has been indicated already by the statement that the first stage is only predominantly of this type, while the last is completely or ideally so. If the first stage were never complete in this sense, the inner motivation by which it leads on to further experience could not be present, for the complete stage is a cave where all tracks lead inward. It would be a sort of island in an ocean of pointing experiences. In the actual experience, the feature which we discriminate is the one which forms the point of departure, which prompts investigation and further observation. Such a feature is necessary in order that this particular bit of experience may form organic connections with other experiences. And if we attempt the task of trimming away, mentally, from this experience all such features as would lead beyond themselves, we seem in the end to have nothing left but a mass of undifferentiated material for which the epithet unconscious seems entirely appropriate. And since the first stage can be made self-sufficient only by trimming, it would appear that in the last stage also, such sufficiency can be attained only at the cost of all inner differentiation. That is to say, Pragmatism tacitly postulates an object of reference which lies beyond the experience of the individual. To this conclusion, it may perhaps be objected that the final stage or term is simply an abstraction or limiting term and not to be regarded as an experience anywhere realized or realizable. On the basis of this interpretation, however, it is difficult to see how solipsism is to be avoided. If we are to have a common world, there must be numerically identical points which are common to the different systems of experience, and such identical points can be provided only by these final terms. 
It appears, then, that the realistic conclusion follows from the premises laid down by the doctrine of pure experience. The distinction between the cognitive and the non-cognitive cannot be evaded. And from the utter disparity between the two, it seems necessary to conclude that consciousness and knowledge do actually disclose to us that which is in no way dependent on consciousness and knowledge for its existence or character. Knowledge is thus palpably realistic. Page 123. Is a realistic view of knowledge then our final hope? The acceptableness of this conclusion must depend in part upon the account which is given of the nature of those objects which knowledge is said to reveal. It seems that consciousness is, in a sense, an accidental feature of reality, since objects are not particularly affected by the circumstance of being known. It is claimed that even in a world like this, no limits can be set to knowledge. Page 122. But it is not clear that any increase in knowledge would even approximate to the inner unity by virtue of which things are what they are. Knowledge reveals to us a set of qualities and relations, but the thinghood of objects inevitably escapes us. Or shall we say that this demand is a return to scholastic essences, and that whatever characteristics or attributes an object may possess are of the sort that are revealed to us in all knowing? This also involves implications which it is not easy to accept. What shall we say to such experiences as sweetness, contrast effects, and harmoniousness? They undoubtedly have a basis in fact. And what sort of a fact is it? To say that it is the same sort of fact as that which we know when we experience them is to me rather unintelligible. And if it is conceded to be a different sort of fact, we seem forced to fall back in the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, which is simply the entering wedge of idealism. Considerations of the sort here presented make it impossible for me to convince myself that the time has come to abandon the conception of selfhood as the ultimate category in metaphysics for that of pure experience or of objects existing independently of consciousness. Professor Woodbridge rightly warns the pragmatists against the tendency to do violence to the character of transcendence pertaining to the cognitive experience. That this character is put in jeopardy by their procedure I am forced to believe. But in order to be just to this character, is it necessary or even defensible to postulate objects which are not dependent upon consciousness for their existence and their nature? Idealism, whatever its form, has difficulties in plenty. Yet, to my mind, it indicates the direction in which the solution of our problems is to be sought, if it is to be found at all. End of Cognitive Experience and Its Object by B. H. Boda The Knowledge Experience Again by John Dewey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Knowledge Experience Again by John Dewey I owe an apology to the editor and to the readers of this journal for returning a third time to the defense of my article on immediate empiricism. Footnote, Volume 2, Number 15, Page 393. End footnote. But Dr. Boda's recent article, Footnote, Volume 2, Number 24, Page 658, End footnote, is so clear and compact that I cannot refrain from again taking a hand. Dr. Boda points out that since I recognize that an experience which is not itself a knowledge experience may be cognitive, i.e. have bearings which lead out into a distinctively knowledge experience, I cannot readily be charged with making such a gap between the dominantly non-knowledge experience and the knowledge experience as deprives the latter of all point when it comes. But he claims, one, that this later experience which identifies the thing of the first as being thus and so, a fearsome noise as a wind curtain fact, is essentially a pointing experience, a knowledge about, and hence does not give the full meaning or truth of the first, which can be found only, two, in an experience which is wholly of the acquaintance with type, having neither the leadings of the first nor the pointings of the second. And this he claims must be, three, an unconscious experience, a term which can have no other meaning assigned to it than the implication or presupposition of an object out of experience, 
conscious experience being then confined, on this basis, to relations between final out-of-consciousness terms. This position is, for, acutely identified with Woodbridge's definition of consciousness as a continuum with its realistic implications. I wholly agree with the first two points, save that empirically the complete acquaintance thing need not necessarily be an entire experience, but may be an element in a more complex experience, and this as a whole may have cognitive leadings. But if this third point is correct, empiricism, in presupposing things which cannot be experienced, has hanged itself on the topmost bough of the tree whose seed and fruit it meant and pretended to be. I marvel that Dr. Boda, in seeing so clearly the first two implications, did not follow the empirical clue. And instead of arguing conceptually that the terminal experience must refer to something unexperienced, did not look about for some experience which should meet the conditions of complete cognitive fulfillment in a thing which itself is neither a leading on nor a pointing back. Take again the case of the fearsome noise which develops into a wind curtain fact. What is its appropriate career? Surely not into an unconscious experience, but into an experience which in so far forth is practical or moral and aesthetic. The complete acquaintance which is self-adequate is, one might say, a relationship of friendship or affection, or of contempt and disregard, and of assurance or control. The complete acquaintance determines the attitude of, say, management of the thing as a means to an end, or of, say, amused recollection, not remembrance as logical pointing, i.e., you are what once fooled me, an SP experience or judgment, but remembrance as recreation or revival in their literal immediate senses. I am enough of a Hegelian to believe that perfect knowledge is not knowledge in its intellectual or logical connotation at all, but such a thing as religionists and practical people have in mind, an attitude of possession and of satisfaction, the peace that passes understanding. It means control of self, because control of the object on which the status of the self contemporaneously depends. Here, if anywhere, the pragmatic is justified, like wisdom of its children. And if we have something more than the pragmatic, it is because this attitude of attained adjustment is so saturated with emotional or morally and aesthetically conscious content. If one will realize how largely discursive knowledge empirically fulfills itself in a coloring or toning, an immediate value element in subsequent experiences. Footnote. There is much in Dr. Gordon's article on feeling, this journal, volume 2, numbers 23 and 24, which I should gladly adopt as exegetical of my position. End footnote. One will, I think, be fully guarded against supposing that unconscious experience is the sole alternative to intellectualized experience. Unconscious the experience is with respect to logical determinations, but immediate experience is saturated with values that are not logical determinations. The epistemological idealist cannot deny this as a fact, because it is precisely this fact which makes him discredit immediate experience, and insists, therefore, upon its absorption into an absolute which is just and wholly logical. Such a position also differentiates itself from the realism which Bode criticizes. If consciousness were just cognitional awareness, Woodbridge would seem to have said the last word in calling it a continuum of objects, of objects which are, as objects, out of consciousness. For as cognitional or intellectual, it is surely the business, so to say, of consciousness to be determined, that is, determinate, solely in and through objects. Otherwise, common sense is crazy and science an organized insanity. But the things of which knowledge constitutes a continuum may be precisely immediate values which are not constituted by logical considerations, but by attitudes, adjustments, coordinations of personal activities. Knowledge, in the strict or logical sense, mediates these activities, which include, of course, passivities. Establishing certain leadings and pointings, certain equivalences, and thereby certain intermediaries and transitional points of immediate valences or worths. And when it has completely wrought out a certain equivalence, finds its own surcease in a new value, expressive of a new aesthetic moral attitude. From this point of view, knowledge is not, but develops, a continuum. 
an emotional content being as substrate, the continuum of which knowledge pointings or discriminated identities are the discretes. Footnote. See again Dr. Gordon's articles, and also her thesis, The Psychology of Meaning, pages 22 through 26. End footnote. Have we not the elements of a reconciliation of what is significant in realism and in idealism? We have something which is beyond consciousness as cognitional, and which determines consciousness as cognitional, literally determines it, in the sense that the practical aesthetic attitude, in order to maintain itself, evokes the reflective attitude, and logically determines it, in that the content of knowledge must conform to conditions which the knowledge consciousness does not itself supply. Footnote. See Studies in Logical Theory, page 85, and for a statement in psychological language, pages 253 to 256. End footnote. But this efficient and formal cause presents a situation in which a conscious agent or person is indispensably present. It is not a non-empirical thing in itself, against which idealism has stood as a protest, and it is something in which a conscious being plays a part. Is epistemological idealism anything but a transfer into the knowledge situation of a relation which actually holds in the practical aesthetic situation, a mistranslation which always calls out realism as a counterbalance, which tends, in the end, to destroy the peculiar individuality that is the essence of such situations? Resolving individuality into terms of the universal, objective content which is alone appropriate to knowledge and which hopelessly complicates the treatment of the knowledge situation itself by deliberately throwing away the key to its interpretation. I wish to take this occasion to say a few words also about Professor Bakewell's interesting contribution to this discussion. Footnote. This journal, Volume 2, Number 25, Page 687. The preceding paragraphs stand as written prior to the appearance of Professor Bakewell's article. End footnote. My original contribution was intended, as Bakewell sees, to bring into sharper relief what seemed to be the fundamental point at issue, so that the artillery of the opponents of recent empiricism, for whose range and shot I profess the greatest respect, might fire there rather than at bogeymen or side issues. I must confess I did not succeed in so presenting it to Professor Bakewell. He says the idealist denies that any single actual experience, as existent or as known, is immediate and simply immediate. Page 690. By turning to page 394 of my original article, it will be seen that I there declare the nub of immediate empiricism to be precisely the thoroughgoing fallacy of the absolute identification for metaphysics of experience as known with experience as existent. This is the point at issue. Hence, objections which rest upon the fact that all knowledge involves immediate element are just non-relevant. That the distinction between the immediate content and the mediate content, together with their reference to one another, is necessary in and to the knowledge experience as such, I not only fully accept, but have been at considerable pains to expound and to attempt to explain in studies in logical theory. So when the idealist page 688 of Bakewell's article, says that experience is always a complex of the immediately perceived and the immediately conceived. He is saying something which the empiricist accepts, so far as the content of a distinctively knowledge or logical experience is concerned. While he, one, takes fundamental issue with the implication that experience is always distinctively logical, and also, two, points out that even the distinctively logical experience is still always, in toto, an immediate experience, or, more specifically, that the distinction between immediate perception and its material, data, and immediate conception and its methods, thinking, is always within and for the sake of a value in experience which is pragmatic, personally, I should add, aesthetic, not reducible to cognitional terms. Since it is only as elements in the content of an immediate experience that the distinction between the immediately perceived, the sensibly given, and the immediately conceived, the relationally thought, occurs, it is obvious that immediate empiricism does not identify the immediacy for which it stands with one of the terms of its own content at a special juncture. Footnote. I repeat what I have said before. 
It is the essential vice of sensationalistic empiricism to make this identification between a functionally determined instrument and test of knowledge and experience as such. End footnote. When Professor Bakewell says that immediacy in this enlarged and general sense as noting that aspect of direct ownership, of personal appropriation, which is always found in concepts and principles of mediation, is a fact fully taken into consideration by idealism, he is saying something which doubtless his idealism takes due account of, but which many of us believe epistemological idealism is wholly impotent to take account of. It gladly assumes the benefit of such facts, but only by introducing elements which are not and cannot be reduced to cognitional terms and relations, which connote emotional and volitional values, and to which humanism, pragmatism, radical empiricism are desirous of assigning their metaphysical weight. If Professor Bakewell's idealism takes such facts into consideration, then I believe he is, for all intents and purposes, an immediate empiricist, though seemingly one not yet entirely free from epistemological bondage. End of The Knowledge Experience Again by John Dewey Cognitive Thought and Immediate Experience by J. A. Layton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cognitive Thought and Immediate Experience by J. A. Layton. In a former discussion, I maintained that the genesis and plausibility of some recent metaphysical realisms were due to a confusion between the psychological and the logical treatment of thought. In the present discussion, I shall endeavor to point out that the doctrine known as pure or immediate empiricism derives its plausibility in part from the same confusion. There is indeed today a widespread tendency to hypostatize experience, to regard it as the all-comprehending reality of which men and things are elements, from which thought sets out on its reflective quest and into which, in the end, it is somehow absorbed. But one does not find a distinction made and kept between experience as actual and personal and experience as possible. What in strict logic holds only of the latter is asserted of the former and vice versa. This treatment of experience one finds with varying contexts in Bradley and his disciples and in Professors Dewey and James. It is with the views of the latter two alone that I shall be herein concerned. Professor James tells us that a physical object, e.g. his pen, is an experience which may be taken in two contexts. One, in the personal context of my or your experience. Two, as a pure experience or pen experience in itself. The pen experience, we are told, in its original immediacy is not aware of itself. It simply is, etc. Footnote, this journal, volume one, pages 538, 566, etc. Volume two, page 180, etc. End footnote. Now what does this latter expression mean? I have some notion of the existence of a physical object when no one thinks it. I have even a glimmering notion of what it might mean for the pen's existence to depend on the thought of an all-thinker. But I can frame no intelligible notion of what a pen is as a bit of pure physical experience which no person has and which has itself no feeling. Surely, it can only conduce to confusion of thought to apply the term experience to anything that actually figures in no consciousness. Footnote. Ibid. Volume 2. Page 181. Etc. In footnote. If the personal quail be eliminated from experience, there is nothing left but the bare possibility of experience. And surely it is a mistake to call an unconscious possibility experience. Words should have some sort of definite meaning, even in philosophy. And the following definition of experience taken from the Century Dictionary states the actual historical meaning of the term and brings out its personal quail. The state or fact of having made trial or proof, or of having acquired knowledge, wisdom, skill, etc., by actual trial or observation, personal and practical acquaintance with anything. The consequence of the loose use of this term experience is that so short and easy a road is found to some all-comprehending unity of experience. We are told by James that the sum total of experience is a pure experience on an enormous scale, 
undifferentiated and undifferentiable into thought and thing. Footnote, Ibid, Volume 2, page 181. End footnote. Now this sum total of experience, this pure experience, either is had by some psychic center or it is not. In the latter case, we are landed in a mist, I was about to say mysticism, which is fatal to clear thinking. We are told that experiences are confluent, etc. Now qua experience, my psychic life is uniquely and unshareably my own. As experiencing centers, in the sea of life and isled, with echoing straits between us thrown, dotting the shoreless watery wild, we mortal millions live alone. The interrelations of selves, the common truth and the social activity, doubtless do refer to common or over-individual conditions or implications of experience. But these common conditions must transcend any actual experience. Footnote. When Professor James says that experience itself, taken at large, can grow by itself, that it proliferates by continuous transitions, etc., does he mean in the individual or is he talking about the totality of experience? End footnote. I do not get my individual experiences by taking a slice out of a social or cosmic common sensorium, nor can I without further ado logically pool my experience in a social pot. Professor Dewey does not assume that experience is a comprehensive flux or matrix in which all separate experiences meet and blend. Experience for him is always determinate. Footnote, Ibid, Volume 2, page 393, FF. End footnote. Every experience is a real thing, and every change in experience is a change in reality. Determinate experiences are conterminous with things. There are just as many reals as there are experiences. He says that when I am frightened by a noise, that is one experience or thing. And when I discover that the cause of the noise is the flapping of the window blind, that is another real thing. And when I see Zollner's lines as convergent, they really are convergent. When the experience is corrected, we have a new real. Now, of course, all my experiences, whether judgments, true or false, hallucinations, emotions, good and bad and whatnot, are actual in the sense of having psychical existence. The plausibility of Professor Dewey's contention that reality equals immediate experience is due to the paralogism of identifying the psychically existent with the total reality, actual with possible experience. In logic, as I have previously insisted, reality is primarily that which judgment means or refers to. In the Zollner line illusion, my experience as cognitive gets the wrong reference. My percept does not mean what I take it to mean and I reconstruct or transform this particular bit of cognitive experience by a reference to other conditions of the perception, i.e. by reference to a more systematized experience of reality. Similarly, when I discover the cause of the noise, I may not alter at all the fact of the window blind wind blowing. I make a new judgment by a systematic reference and so alter my personal state. In such cases, we rectify our cognitive relations, not the external reality. These rectifications mean that the references of our meanings to the reality, which has not changed, must be altered in order that cognition may work. Professor Dewey insists that any experience is determinate. He says the vague impression of something in the dark is as good a reality as the self-luminous vision of an absolute. But it isn't if it does not work as well. If I take this vague impression for a soft couch, and it turns out to be a coil of hot steam pipes or a bathtub, I do not consider my former judgment to be good. I say it was an erroneous experience and the steam pipes are and were real all the time. Professor Dewey insists that to find the meaning of any philosophic concept, we must go to experience. True, but how? To whose experience and how shall experience be controlled? We must think in order to make experience yield its fruitage. And because it fails to yield complete fullness and harmony, our thought must continue ever to transcend actual experience in its own interests. The urge and stress of thinking is born of the partial failure and partial promise of actual experience. Professor Dewey says that the method of immediate empiricism is identical in kind with that of the scientist. But the scientist is continually remaking experience, and by thought constructions transcending the actual. The all-pervading frictionless massless fluid and the electric corpuscles of the physicist certainly transcend immediate experience. Actual experience, which always belongs to a self, and hence is not a substantive reality, does not stand self-sufficient on its own feet. 
if every determinate experience did so stand, like Professor James's pure pin experience, unconscious and absolute in its own right, of course there would be no occasion for thought's corrective and supplementary work. Things would be just what they seem, even when there was no one for them to seem to. The sun would go round the earth, there would be two marbles when the fingertips are crossed in the Aristotelian experiment, two moons in the sky for the extreme devotees of Bacchus, etc. The strictly theoretical parts of physical science abound in thought constructions, by which actual experience is corrected, made more consistent, supplemented. Of course, the value of these constructions has reference to a possible self-consistent or complete experience, but this is an ideal which becomes actualized only in part. And even in the case of a perfect possible experience, if we do not presuppose an experiencing center or self, we are assuming an unconscious experience had by no one. Such a conception seems to me to have about as much meaning as wood and iron. In short, pure or immediate experience is the hypostatization of the psychological abstraction of consciousness or experience in general. It is legitimate for the psychologist to treat consciousness as a fact by itself, but is it legitimate to assert that experience is the bedrock of reality, apart from whether any self has consciousness of it or not? And if we stick to the personal quail of experience, all philosophical concepts will not be found on the same level or yield their meanings in the same terms. So-called immediate experience is simply the indifferent starting point for all philosophy as for all science and rational activity. But it is shot through and through with mediacy, and it is the function of reflective thought to justify the element of mediacy in each specific case. Our immediate experiences are being constantly corrected by thought. This is notoriously the case with perceptual experience. But it is quite as true that aesthetic, personal, and religious experiences do not yield their full fruitage without the interpreting and transforming activity of cognition, an activity that does its work by developing the element of mediation already there and without which experience would be a meaningless brute datum. Just herein lies the dynamic and constructive quality of thought. The vital function of thought consists in submitting immediate experiences to reflective treatment by which they are made to yield up to thought interpretation of their meanings and submit to control and transformation at the hands of thought. Mere thought is not life, but thought's contribution to life consists in interpreting, transforming, harmonizing, and supplementing actual experiences. This work logical thinking performs just because it is not a mere psychological existent on a dead level with every sort of grain and smut that may be grist for the psychological mill. In the performance of this work, Cognitive thinking transcends a mere psychical existence and reaches beyond actual experience. It develops implications in regard to the real that are required to render more consistent and harmonious actual experiences that are in themselves fragmentary. These implications, we may say, refer to some self's possible experiences, but they are not now convertible, and we may not understand the conditions under which they may become convertible into the current coin of our immediate experiences. In this sense, reality for thought that goes to the bitter end must include implications that are only possible experiences. Every immediate experience has, without further consideration, whatever reality may belong to any psychical process. In this sense, cognition is just one element in experience. But, when we remind ourselves that thought as psychological fact and thought as valid meaning or reference are two different things, and that it is in the latter sense alone that thought in its dynamic actuality is adequately conceived, we shall not make the mistake of putting cognition on a level with other psychical facts, and so eliminating its transcendent reference. The psychological treatment of thought is responsible for the assumption that reality equals experience. It is one thing to say, experience is real, and of course all experience is real, in the sense of being actual psychical process, although we hardly need a new philosophy to convey this very obvious bit of information, and quite another thing to say that all reality is immediate experience. Our immediate experiences, cognitive and non-cognitive, are often misleading, fragmentary, and inharmonious. Reality in the fullest sense means the objective system of conditions in relation to which these experiences make it corrected, enlarged, harmonized. Of course, thought must make a difference to reality, both extra-experiential and intra-experiential, and some reality must be of the sort to which thought can make a difference. 
thought both transforms experience and alters some element in reality, so making way for a readjustment of experience. Of what sort this reality must be, so to undergo the action of thought is a question remaining over, the metaphysical problem of logic. In his latest discussion, footnote, this journal, volume 2, pages 707 to 711, end footnote, Dewey lays emphasis on the end state of knowledge as saturated with emotion. Knowledge mediates activities whose aims are the development of emotional substrates or continua into perfect feeling harmonies, moral, aesthetic, personal. Now it seems to me perfectly true that the goal of a completed cognition is always a personal state suffused with emotional coloring. But I should deny that the differentiae of cognitive feeling are reducible to moral and aesthetic terms. Since all higher feeling is a reaction of the unity of self to a content, cognition involves feeling, and the articulation of knowledge is the articulation of feeling. But I should maintain that the personal feeling which accompanies any relatively complete insight in science or philosophy may have a unique quail due to the specific character of the cognitive reaction. In other words, cognitive feeling may be and often is sui generis, i.e. not reducible to moral, aesthetic, or religious terms. And I should agree with the contention that thought has always personal reference while insisting that pragmatism ignores the ontological implications of this reference. Thought is never wholly external to any personal experience. Pure experience, devoid of thought, is a grinsbegriff. There are two chief desiderata in the epistemological treatment of experience. One, the explication of the chief logical stages through which, in the individual and the race, experience passes by the action of reflective thinking, and which stages run, of course, from a beginning in which thought is inchoate to a relative conclusion in which it has become definitely articulated. Two, the explication of the objective or universal implications of the individual's having experience. This is the problem of the definition of an environing world or reality, social and physical. The fact that my experience is uniquely my own as well as determinate, does not abolish, but rather sets a metaphysical problem. We are repeatedly told that pragmatic empiricism is a new method of treating philosophical concepts, but so far we have been given only vague generalities, and those of us who are not convinced thereby are told that it is because we are irretrievably mired in the bog of transcendentalism. By their fruits ye shall know them. Let the pragmatical or immediate empiricists give us a thoroughgoing treatment by their method of one or two fundamental philosophical concepts, substance, causality, thinghood, selfhood, etc., and then perhaps the actual demonstration of the pragmatic uses of this method will let light into our skulls. In the meantime, perhaps one may be pardoned for the perversity of holding on to a point of view which seems both to be more in harmony with the whole procedure and function of reflective thought and to have yielded some definite results. And I will be specific and say that I mean that the philosophies of Kant, Fichte, and Hegel have yielded definite results in rendering the actual world more intelligible in terms of an idealistic footnote. When I use the term idealism without qualifying phrase, I mean metaphysical, not epistemological or psychological idealism. End footnote. Rendering of experience. End of Cognitive Thought and Immediate Experience by J. A. Layton Reality as Experience by John Dewey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reality as Experience by John Dewey There are those who find that the assimilation to each other of the ideas of experience and reality is seriously hampered or even put out of court by the fact that science makes known a chronological period in which the world managed to live a respectable existence in spite of not including conscious organisms. Under such conditions, there was no experience, yet there was reality. Must we not then either give up the identification of the two conceptions, or else admit we are denying and sophisticating the plain facts of knowledge? One is entitled to enter a caveat against any attempt to impose science, whether physical or psychological, as philosophy. 
one is moved to suggest that the greater the accumulation of interesting and professedly important details, the more urgent the question of what the import and interest are, the philosophic meaning of it all. Yet most empiricists would hardly be willing to adopt any philosophic position of which it could be clearly shown that it depends upon ignoring, denying, or perverting scientific results. Let us then analyze the situation which is offered to justify such charges. It is a situation of which, by scientific warrant, it always is to be said that it is on its way to the present situation, that is, to experience, and that this way is its own way. The conditions which antecede experience are, in other words, already in transition towards the state of affairs in which they are experienced. Suppose one keep in mind the fact of qualitative transformation towards, and keep in mind that this fact has the same objective warrant as any other assigned trait, mechanical and chemical characteristics and relations, etc. What then becomes of the force of the objection? If at some point one shoves a soul substance, a mind or even a consciousness, footnote, consciousness is the faint rumor left behind by the disappearing soul upon the air of philosophy. James, this journal, volume 1, page 477, end footnote. In between the prior condition of reality and experience, then, of course, the suggested implication of identification of reality and experience does not hold. Reality and experience are separable because this heterogeneous factor interposes and makes their difference. It, not reality, is responsible for the transformation. It somehow modifies reality and makes experience out of it, the resulted experience being heterogeneous to reality in the degree in which the intervening mind, subject, or substance is interjective in its nature and sudden or catastrophic in its workings. I am not concerned here with all the hopeless puzzles that now emerge, puzzles which constitute metaphysics in the popular, hegeristic sense of that word. I am not even concerned with pointing out the difficulty, with respect to an experience so constituted, of picking out the features which belong to reality, pure and uncontaminated, and those for which mind or consciousness or whatever is held accountable. I am only pointing out that such a conception is incompatible with the idea that the earlier chronological condition of reality is, for philosophic purposes, henceforth identifiable with reality. For philosophy, reality, on this basis, must include mind, consciousness, or whatever, along with the scientifically warranted early dated world, and philosophy must worry through as best it may with the questions of a reality so hopelessly divided, by conception and definition, within and against itself. It is, in any case, a notion irrelevant to the particular problem under discussion. I return to the supposedly strictly scientific objection. Unless some heterogeneous kind of reality is shoved in, then the early reality is at any and every point on its way to experience. It is only the earlier portion, historically speaking, of what later is experience. So viewed, the question of reality versus experience turns out to be only the question of an earlier version of reality against a later version. Or if the term version be objected to, that of an earlier rendering or expression or state of reality compared with its own later condition. We cannot, however, say an earlier reality versus a later reality, because this denies the salient point of transition towards. Continual transformation in the direction of. This is the fact which excludes on the basis of science to which we have agreed to appeal any chopping off of the non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality from later experience. Footnote. I insert this word because it is essential. By hypothesis, this prior state now is experienced, namely, in science, or so far as experience becomes critical. This is the scientific fact on which are wrecked all strictly objectivistic realisms. It is also the fact which, on the basis of a psychological analysis of reality and the substitution of psychological science for physical science as a methodological clue, is perverted into idealisms. Of course, it may be pointed out that this psychological procedure always starts from the body and its organs, the senses, brain, muscles, etc. So that, as Santayana says, idealisms hold that because we get our experiences through a body, therefore we have no body. But, on the other hand, it may be pointed out that this body, the organism, and the behaviors characteristic of it, 
is just as real as anything else, and hence that an account of reality based upon systematically ignoring its curious attitudes and responses, that is, a philosophy based preferentially upon physical sciences, is also self-contradictory. In such a situation, the important point would seem to be the significance of science or experience in its critically controlled forms, whether physically or psychologically directed. And here is where the pragmatic variety of empiricism, with its interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in control of experience, seems to have the call. End footnote. So viewed, the question for philosophy reduces itself to this. What is the better index for philosophy of reality, its earlier or its later form? The question answers itself. The property or quality of transition towards, change in the direction of, which is to say the least, as objectively real as anything else, cannot be included in the statement of reality qua earlier, but is only apprehended or realized in experience. In a very real sense, the present experience of the various unenlightened ditch digger does philosophic justice to the earlier reality in a way which the scientific statement does not and cannot cannot that is as formulated knowledge as itself vital or direct experience as man's experience which as geologists or physicists or astronomers formulation is ignored the latter is more valuable and is truer in the sense of worth more for other interpretations for the construction of other projects and the basing of projects upon them the reason the scientist can suppress in his statement of the reality factors which the reality possesses is just because one he is not interested in the total reality but in such phases of it as serve as trustworthy indications of imports and projects and because two the elements suppressed are not totally suppressed but are right there in his experience in its extra scientific features in other words, the scientist can ignore some part of the man's experience just because that part is so irremediably there in experience. Suppose a theoretically adequate cognition of the early reality as early, prior to the existence of conscious beings, is attained. Call this O. Call its properties lowercase a, b, c, d, etc. Call its laws the constant relations of these elements capital A, b c d etc now since by the evolutionary theory to which appeal is made this o is in qualitative transformation towards experience o is not reality complete is not r but is a selection of certain conditions of r but it may be replied the theory of evolution does recognize and state these factors of transformation so be it but where is the locus of this recognition if these factors are referred to o to the prior object, we have the same situation over again. We just have certain additional properties, lowercase e, f, g, etc., with additional functions, capital E, f, g, etc., which, as referred to O, are still in qualitative transformation. Something essential to reality is still omitted. Recognize that this transformation is realized in present experience, and the contradiction vanishes. Since the qualitative transformation was towards experience, where else should its nature be realized save in experience, and in the very experience in which O, the knowledge object, is present? The O, as scientifically known, is thus contained in an experience which is not exhausted in its quality of presenting O as object, and the surplusage is not irrelevant, but supplies precisely the factors of reality which are suppressed in the O taken as the chronologically prior thing. The only reason this is not universally recognized is just because it is inevitable and universally so. Only in philosophy does it require recognition. Elsewhere, it is taken for granted. The very motive and basis for formulating R as O is in those features of the experience which are not formulated and which can be formulated only in a subsequent experience. What is omitted from reality in the O is always restored in the experience in which O is present. The O is thus really taken as what it is, a condition of reality as experience. This immersion of a knowledge object in an inclusive, vital, direct experience, which terms like immediate are tautological, serving only as warnings against taking experience partially or abstractly, is the solution, I take it, of the problem of the transcendent aspect of knowledge. 
What is said of the overreaching, diaphanous character of knowledge in relation to its object is something which holds of the experience in which knowledge and its object is sustained, and whose schematized or structural portion it is. Every experience thus holds in suspense within itself knowledge with its entire object world, however big or little. And the experience here referred to is any experience in which cognition enters. It is not some ideal or absolute or exhaustive experience. Thus the knowledge object always carries along contemporaneously with itself another, something to which it is relevant and accountable, and whose union with it affords the condition of its testing, its correction and verification. This union is intimate and complete. The distinction in experience between the knowledge portion as such and its own experience content as non-cognitional is a reflective analytic distinction, itself real in its experience content and function. In other words, we cannot dispose of the margin or surplus of the experience in which knowledge is immersed as being emotional and volitional, and therefore just psychological, and hence philosophically irrelevant. Because the distinction between knowledge in relation to its object, qua known, and other supposedly irrelevant features is constituted in one and the same subsequent reflective experience. The experience in which O is presented is one in which O is distinguished from other elements of the experience as well as held in vital connection with them. But it is not one in which the knowledge function is discriminated from other functions, say the emotional and volitional. If the later experience in which this discrimination is made is purely psychological, then the knowledge function itself, as well as the emotional and volitional, is merely a psychological distinction. And again, the whole case falls. In other words, whether taken directly as the scientist's experience or later as the philosopher's or logician's experience, we have the same type of situation, that of something discriminated as a condition of experience over against and along with those features of experience of which it is the condition. If one is inclined to deny this, let him ask himself how it is possible to correct supposed knowledge of the earlier history of the globe. If O is not all the time in most real connection with the extra scientific features of its experience, then is it isolated and final. If, however, it has to square itself up with them, if it enters as just one factor into a more inclusive present reality, then there are conditions present which make for accountability, testing, and revision. To take O as an adequate statement of reality, adequate, that is, for philosophy, is to exalt one scientific product at the expense of the entire scientific procedure by which that product is itself legitimated and corrected. End of Reality as Experience by John Dewey Pure Experience and Reality by Evander Bradley McGilvery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pure Experience and Reality by Evander Bradley McGilvery In this scientific age, no philosopher feels comfortable if he finds that his doctrines bring him into conflict with scientific facts. Scientific theories at variance with his own philosophical theories he can venture to criticize and reject. But facts made out by science he prefers not to deny. As Professor Dewey says, one is entitled to enter a caveat against any attempt to impose science, whether physical or psychological, as philosophy. Yet most empiricists would hardly be willing to adopt any philosophic position of which it could be clearly shown that it depends upon ignoring, denying, or perverting scientific results. Footnote. Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods. Volume 3, page 253. Hereafter, this journal will be referred to simply as journal. End footnote. Now the philosophy of pure experience, which has recently been developed by Professors James and Dewey, has been suspected by many of involving just such a denial of scientific results. If the reality of anything is the reality it has as experienced and only when experienced, then it would seem that the sciences which deal with objects purporting to have existed before any verifiable experience do not have to do with reality. Yet these very sciences claim to prove as scientific fact the real existence of objects prior to zoic periods, 
Hence the philosophers of pure experience feel it incumbent on them to set themselves at rights in this matter. Professor James has recently so defined his position that it ceases to have any anti-realistic suggestions which might bring him into contradiction with the sciences of geology and astronomy. In answer to a question put to him by Mr. Pitkin as to whether his theory precludes the possibility of something not experienced, Professor James says, assuredly not, how could it? Yet in my opinion we should be wise not to consider anything or action of that nature, and to restrict our universe of philosophic discourse to what is experienced or, at least, experienceable. Footnote. Journal. Volume 4. Page 106. The italics in the last four words are mine. End footnote. What kind of reality the experienceable has when it is not experienced, Professor James does not tell us, at least in his recent writings. In his psychology, there was no attempt to abbreviate such reality and write it down to a tentative program, waiting for the signature and seal of experience to put it into execution. Likewise, there is nothing in the address on the pragmatic method delivered before the Philosophic Union of the University of California, which should commit him, so far as one can see, to denying the full and genuine reality of the things which, though not experienced, make a tremendous difference in what we do experience and shall continue to experience. In default, therefore, of any express avowal by Professor James of adherence to the notion that unexperienced but experienceable reality is incomplete reality, one may assume, provisionally at least, that there is nothing in his experientialism to which a scientist may reasonably object on the score that it deprives him of the very objects of his investigation. Whether Professor James's philosophy remains pure experientialism when it is interpreted in the light of the sentences just quoted is another question which does not concern us here. Professor Dewey has taken another course. He has tried to put himself at one with science by admitting something non-contemporaneously experienced. Footnote. Journal, Volume 3, page 254. Italics mine. The quotations from Professor Dewey and what follows are all from his article on reality as experience, in Volume 3 of this journal, pages 253 to 257, except where otherwise designated. And as the article is short and the passages and phrases quoted are easily found in it, I shall not page the references. End footnote. But he also maintains his pure experientialism by qualifying this admission. The pre-experiential something is not to be considered completely real. The readers of Professor Dewey's Studies in Logical Theory must have been prepared for such a statement from him. In that work, he insisted that the object of thought, when it has emerged from the experience of stress and strain and appears in a subsequent tranquil experience as the result of pragmatic adjustment, must not be read back anachronistically into the time preceding the adjustment. The reader was therefore left to infer that no truth made out by intellectual labor is to be held valid of anything real that may have existed before that labor was ended. This inference is now for the first time explicitly confirmed by Professor Dewey in the article just referred to. This article has, therefore, the importance of a definitive statement of his attitude towards facts dealt with in some fundamental sciences. We have here a touchstone of the scientific character of his experiential philosophy. If his philosophy cannot stand at this point the test of comparison with the results of science, then that philosophy is anti-scientific. And the pure experientialist of Professor Dewey's type stands at the parting of the ways. Either he must take leave of science, or he must surrender his peculiar views and the logic which issues in these views. We need not here decide which course anyone would reasonably choose with these alternatives before him. We must first see whether these are exclusive and exhaustive alternatives. Professor Dewey himself evidently appreciates the crisis which his system here faces. The article in question is a resolute attempt to avert the crisis. Let us see whether it succeeds. As we have already said, Professor Dewey admits the existence of something prior to experience, something non-contemporaneously experienced. The something, however, though it is called an earlier reality, is not to be set over against the later experience of it, as one complete reality against another. It is only the earlier portion, historically speaking, of what later is experience. So viewed, the question of reality versus experience turns out to be only the question of an earlier version of reality against a later version. Or if the term version be objected to, than of an earlier rendering or expression or state of reality compared with its own later condition. We cannot, however, say an earlier reality versus a later reality, because this denies the salient point of transition towards. Continual transformation in the direction of this is the fact which excludes on the basis of science to which we have agreed to appeal any chopping off of the non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality from later experience. So viewed, the question for philosophy reduces itself to this. 
what is the better index for philosophy of reality, its earlier or its later form? In the earlier form, something essential to reality is still omitted, and thus the earlier reality was not really and entirely real. Wanting is what? Summer redundant, blueness abundant, where is the blot? Be me the world, yet a blank all the same, framework which waits for a picture to frame. What of the leafage, what of the flower? Roses embowering with naught they embower. Come then complete, in completion no comer, pant through the blueness, perfect the summer, breathe but one breath, rose beauty above, and all that was death, rose life, rose love, grows love. The comer fulfills the promise and potency of the past, immersing the knowledge object which before was only reality in the making in an inclusive, vital, direct experience. And lo, reality is made, perfect and entire, wanting nothing. But it does not remain made for good and all. It has a way of slipping back into its inchoate state every time it ceases to be experienced, every time it is withdrawn from the bath. Reality is invulnerable to philosophical attack only so long as the waters of experience flow over it. But this gives no serious trouble, for it can be dipped again and again. The charm, though momentarily lost, can be regained. Reality is always at hand, a portable bath for anyone who needs it in his pragmatic business. A need is possible only in experience, and experience is itself the magic water. Every experience thus holds in suspense within itself knowledge with its entire object world, however big or little. And the experience here referred to is any experience in which cognition enters. It is not some ideal or absolute or exhaustive experience. Every pre-experiential creature is by experience delivered from the bondage of incompleteness into glorious reality. The vision beatific culminates and reifies the qualitative transformation towards. We have in this theory a daring derealization of the pre-experiential past. What is the justification for it? We are told that the justification is found in the fact that all the objects of which astronomy and geology treat are objects for the scientific experience. When the scientist predicates reality of them apart from his experience of them, he ignores the fact that he is necessary to make this predication and therefore to realize them. This realization of them in his scientific judgment abates the perfection of the reality they had before they were ever experienced. For to realize means to make real. And when the scientist realizes the existence of long bygone things, he makes that existence real. If he makes that existence real, it could not have been real before. For what already is, why doth a man yet make? Recognize that the transformation of pre-experiential qualities towards experience is realized in present experience, and the contradiction vanishes. Since the qualitative transformation was towards experience, where else should its nature be realized save in experience, and in the very experience in which O, the knowledge object, is present? What is omitted from reality in the O is always restored in the experience in which O is present. The O is thus really taken as what it is, a condition of reality as experience. In other words, the world of knowledge is from start to finish a performance, going on before the eyes of virginal experience. Even though she cannot bar from the board certain really objective facts, they are not objectionable, for they appear completely clad in robes she has provided. What they might have been before they were thus clothed upon she can never see. Should perchance visions of the dressing room flit before her maiden fancy, she merely thinks of the occupants as undergoing continual transformation in the direction of investiture. They could never be real for her, because they become real only when they appear garbed before the footlights. Everything that experience touches is thereby made clean for the grace of her favor, and made whole in the entirety of her embrace. Without such cleansing and such integration, nothing can enter into her presence. The object as it existed before it was experienced was not reality, but only a condition of reality, and the condition is not sufficient to produce reality. Only when the condition is supplemented by an experience which realizes the object does the object become real. It is a great pity that before writing of the realizing power of experience, Professor Dewey had not made as exhaustive a study in some dictionary of the word realize as he has made of the words idea and consciousness. For any even fairly complete dictionary would have shown him that realize means at least two things. One, make real, and two, recognize or think of as real. To argue that because the nature of the object is realized only in experience, it could not have been completely real before the experience looks suspiciously like a play upon words. A pun can hardly be a scientific fact, on which are wrecked all strictly objectivistic realisms. The result will not be substantially different if we regard the emphasis which Professor Dewey lays on the word realize in his article as merely the employment of the convenient word to enforce a view obtained otherwise, 
and not as an attempt to rear a pretentious philosophic structure on such a logical study of language. The foundation of his system is laid on the fact that, before any object can be posited as real, there must be some cognitive experience in which the object is thus posited. Experience, as the presupposition of scientific objects, it is asserted is ignored in the physical sciences which deal with objects and abstract from the experience for which such objects exist as real. The reason the scientist can suppress in his statement of the reality factors which the reality possesses, more specifically the factor of being experienced, is just because, one, he is not interested in the total reality, but in such phases of it as serve as trustworthy indications of imports and projects, and because, two, the elements suppressed are not totally suppressed, but are right there in his experience, in its extra scientific features. In other words, the scientist can ignore some part of the man's experience, just because that part is so irredeemably there in experience. There is no question that we have here a very important truth, which realism may ignore to its ultimate philosophic undoing. But we have the truth stated in a way that leads to confusion, and it is on this confusion that Professor Dewey builds that part of his philosophy which is anti-realistic. By avoiding the confusion, and yet by recognizing the truth which Professor Dewey expresses, only to impress it wrongfully into the service of a false experientialism, the realist can round off his realism with an idealism. He would thus get an ontological realism and an epistemological idealism. Of course, this result would be an abomination to anyone who abhors the very word epistemology, and who has brought himself to believe that knowing the external world through ideas which are merely within us is an inherent self-contradiction. Footnote, Studies in Logical Theory, page 83. End footnote. The confusion to which I refer is that between the intellectual cognition of a fact as a present experience and a fact cognized as a reality temporally prior to the experience which cognizes it. The former is pure experience in Professor Dewey's meaning of the term. All the mediations by which such a cognition has been attained have also been purely experienced as processes of tension and inner distraction, terminating in purely experienced reintegration of contents, in pure experience of rest after toil, port after stormy seas. Nothing can enter into the kingdom of knowledge and acquire citizenship in the scientific domain with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereunto without having taken out naturalization papers in the court of experience. Without this preliminary process, even a star cannot be domiciled as a star and allowed to stake out a claim to a quarter section in the stellar universe of science. This necessity, that something should first be experienced in some way and then be known in a scientific way before that thing can be treated by science, does not seem to be overlooked by scientists today. Most of these worthy gentlemen would probably be amused by the suggestion that they could ignore the knowing part of their experience and pay attention only to the known part, because forsooth the knowing part is irredeemably there in experience. What are microscopes and telescopes and spectroscopes, from the epistemological point of view, but eloquent witnesses to the scrupulous extraction the scientist makes that every object should first be experienced before it be inventoried in the scientific catalog? What are the method of least squares and the allowance for personal equation, but the recognition that, whatever may be the final scientific statement, that statement must take as its point of departure the experience of the scientist? The scientific statement is not shut out of a pistol. It is the fruition of a developmental process whose germination and whose fluorescence occur in the atmosphere of pure experience. Experience is the very life, the self-conscious life of science. And of such life, the scientist agonizingly exclaims, "'Tis life whereof our nerves are scant, O life, not death, for which we pant, More life and fuller that I want." Then he is told by a philosopher, who desires a rapprochement between his philosophy and science, that in a very real sense the present experience of the veriest unenlightened ditch-digger does philosophic justice to the earlier reality in a way which the scientific statement does not and cannot, cannot, that is, as formulated knowledge. I presume that the ditch-digger is dignified with laudatory mention and disparagement of the scientist, because the ditch becomes real in the digging experience, while the fossil does not. If the geologist could only dig his fossils in while he is digging them out, then his pure digging experience would do philosophic justice to the reality. Where else should the nature of fossils be realized save in experience, and in the very experience in which fossils as knowledge objects are present? This kind of pure experience, however, would probably be branded by professional geologists as impure science. It is well enough to lay emphasis on the experience of the scientist as indispensable to the scientific validity of his results. When we do, 
we get what I have ventured to call an epistemological idealism, or the doctrine that there would be no scientific reality were there no scientists, with scientific ideas and ideational experiences. If there were a universe of real things which did not include somewhere or some time within it cognitive experience of at least some part of it, and which were so completely self-contained that no thinker of another universe could even guess its existence, the reality of that universe could not be scientific reality, whatever else in its meaninglessness it might be. Even the idolist dream of such a universe would require a dream experience, for which it could have a quasi-reality. The reality we know and the reality we predicate with any intelligibility or significance is reality for us as predicators. Even when we think of this kind of reality as being possible in another universe unradiated by a single gleam of intelligence or sense experience, we still are thinking of it. We cannot think ourselves and everything else out of such a universe without being in this universe to do the thinking anyway. No thinker, no thought object, no experience somewhere and some when, no meaningful reality anywhere and any time. This is the truth which is contained in Professor Dewey's contention. But it is one thing to say no experience, no reality, and it is another thing to say no contemporaneous experience, no reality. It is this contemporaneousness that Professor Dewey surreptitiously introduces into the statement of the truth, thereby converting it into, well, let us say a huge assumption. Thus the knowledge object always carries along contemporaneously with itself an other something to which it is relevant and accountable and whose union with it affords the condition of its testing, its correction and verification. This union is intimate and complete. The distinction in experience between the knowledge portion as such and its own experience content as non-cognitional is a reflective, analytic distinction, itself real in its experience content and function. Footnote. All the italics are mine, except the last. End footnote. By thus synchronizing the experience and the reality, the object of knowledge, which for the scientific geologist may be a real object belonging to the remote past, becomes so tied down to the present by the fact that it is cognitively experienced that it loses the character of past reality which it claims to have for scientific knowledge. Knowledge of the past becomes a self-contradictory thing. To use expression of Bosanquet's, the time of judgment and the time in judgment get so badly mixed that they must be reduced to the same time the time of judging. Lotz's view that the ways of thought and the ways of things are different is ridiculed out of court to make way for the sole alternative view, which regards reality as developing in and through judgment. Footnote. Dr. Helen Bradford Thompson in Studies in Logical Theory, page 126. End footnote. The development of our ideas of reality and the development of reality itself are economically merged into one development the development of objects in our cognitive experience of them. Let us now follow the results of this merger. I think we shall see that the stock of the holding company rises at the expense of the manipulated stock, which falls to zero. In geology, the scientist deals with facts cognized as prior to his cognizing experience of them. Professor Dewey tries to acknowledge this. He goes as far as his theory will allow him, but his theory will not allow him to regard the geological fact as complete reality. It is simply reality in the process of transformation towards experience. This process of transformation towards reality is a fact as objectively real as anything else and is realized in present experience. Hence, what is omitted from reality in the scientist's statement of the nature of the object is always restored in the experience in which that fact is present. In dealing with reality in the process of transformation towards experience, if, dropping out the first hyphen, you try the experiment of the chopping off of the non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality from later experience, you do violence to the pragmatic variety of empiricism with its interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in control of experience. And you must remember that this pragmatic variety of empiricism seems to have the call here. If you put down your axe and let the hyphen be, that hyphen will wreck every fortune that is tied up in strictly objectivistic realisms. The real trouble with this pragmatic variety of empiricism is that it is so much engaged in the business of the interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in the control of experience that it ignores the right of the object to the place it claims, a place in time prior to the date of the experience. It claims that place not as an incomplete reality, 
but as a genuine ready-made reality, waiting all these ages to be recognized as such. The recognition does not, in the knowing experience, pretend to give reality to what it recognizes as real, any more than the registration of a deed of conveyance with the registrar of deeds makes the deed real. The deed is already real, or no registrar registering to doomsday can register reality into it. The pragmatist of Professor Dewey's type of empiricism writes as if a change in geological science involved a change in the actual past history of geological objects. But I am afraid that he would find it hard to make terms with the scientific geologist on the proposition that the discovery of geological development made that development real. The geologist would be unkind enough to say that discovery is not invention. The map of the past may be changed after the discovery, but that does not change the real past. If the map becomes more accurate in the effort of reflective knowledge to control present experience, that is because there was a real past now fixed in its eternal state, which one map can more truthfully represent than another. It would be a queer sort of past that should complacently adjust itself to conform to every change that the cartographer felt obliged to make in the effort to reintegrate his pure experience of cartographical distractions. Or let us take the momentous day when Copernicus first hit upon his famous reintegration of astronomical experience after Ptolemaic tensions. Was the real Earth at that time uprooted out of its place in the center of the universe and sent spinning in an elliptical orbit about the sun? Mighty as was the thought of Copernicus, it would be hard to suppose that it could suddenly impart a motion of many miles per second to the huge masses of the Earth and the other planets, and cap the climax by performing the miracle of Joshua. The scientist is more apt to suppose that the real solar system at that moment kept on in the equable course it had been pursuing for countless millenniums, and that it did not feel a single tremor throughout its whole frame, save in the little nervous system of Copernicus himself. In all these pre-Copernican aeons, where was the other which the knowledge object of Copernicus had always carried along contemporaneously with itself? Had Copernicus's experience existed continuously through all pre-Copernican times? Or did the knowledge object of Copernicus not exist except contemporaneously with historical Copernicus? I must confess that the attempt to think out this puzzle in terms of the pragmatic variety of empiricism with its interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in control of experience gives me a pure experience of tension and distraction, of particular elements which are in strife. The facts I seem to get are crude, raw, unorganized, brute, they lack relationship, that is, assured place in the universe. They are deficient as to continuity. Footnote, Studies in Logical Theory, page 52. End footnote. And this, I am told, is an index of pragmatic untruth. But we are assured that we can escape all this difficulty by recognizing the objects prior to Copernicus as incompletely real. The real is a sop to science. The incompletely is the acknowledgment of the truth of the pragmatic variety of empiricism. This seems to be an easy way out of the difficulty, but let us look ahead a little before committing ourselves to this reconciliation of science and philosophy. The non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality is not complete reality because it is undergoing change in the direction of, which is, to say the least, as objectively real as anything else. Does this not prove too much? The function of the solar system as an object of knowledge was not exhausted in the experience of Copernicus. It continues in the experience of every educated man today. If it be said that what is continuously undergoing transformation in the direction of is not complete, the solar system is incomplete yet, because it seems to be undergoing just such a hyphenated transformation every day. And it is hard to fix the term of that transformation before Byron's last man shall have found surcease for his unshared sorrows in the grave of all experience. And yet even then, the solar system cannot be real, for the experience which is necessary to realize it is gone. We thus get the interesting result that nothing can be completely real till nothing is left to be possibly real. No wonder that the philosopher whose view of complete reality involves this paradox should have found that the paradox wrecks all strictly objectivistic realisms. But why does he not see that every other ism shares the same fate? But it may be argued that, although pure experientialism may be a floating mine which wrecks the whole philosophic navy in exploding itself, still any other philosophic doctrine negatives the value and the reality of thought. The reply is, not in the least, unless by reality is meant the whole universe, past, present, and to come. 
and by value is meant inclusiveness of such total reality. Thought may be real without being omnitudo realitatis. It may be an integral part of the universe, with its definite place in time and its definite work to do. What its place is, is scientifically determined, as everything is properly determined in science, by appeal to the witness of harmonized and reintegrated experience. Experience assigns to itself a place in the world of reality, as posterior to much of the reality experienced in scientific ideation. Experience also recognizes its own function in the world, just as it recognizes the function of other parts of the whole of reality. When it recognizes itself as necessary for the recognition of reality, it recognizes in itself a unique value. But if it tries to emancipate itself from the duties of its sphere and to usurp the function of another sphere, it makes itself a laughingstock, much as the would-be male females of our time do. Even though experience is bone of the bones and flesh of the flesh of reality, still she ought to realize that there were some real ribs whose prior existence was necessary to her making. She may give names to the animals brought before her, but if she arrogates to herself the power of giving reality to the very conditions that brought her into being, she is trying to become greater than Spinoza's God, who is merely causa sui. She wants to become causa causae sui. Experience may look before and after, but she may not translocate. She may embrace the real, but not reduce it to a dependency of herself. If it be asked how the real, which may exist prior to experience, can come to be an object of subsequent experience of it, unless the obsolete doctrine of representative knowledge be true, I should answer that perhaps there is more truth in that doctrine than many would be disposed to acknowledge today. Let us look at experience as it actually is, and see what are the facts. At present, I am experiencing my typewriter, i.e. there is awareness of it along with other things, among which is a group of contents called by Professor James the empirical me. The awareness comprehends them all, including many relations subsisting between them severally and collectively. The awareness is not in any one of them, but of them together. These various things do not exist for the awareness as borrowing their reality from it. They exist for it as just being there in various relations to each other. The awareness as embracing the color and the shape of the typewriter is called seeing it, as embracing the hardness of the keys is called touching them. What is thus seen and touched stands in bold relief in space before my body. Now let me close my eyes and raise my fingers. There is a change in the field of objects. Instead of the thing in clear outlines, there is now something of which I am aware as similar to what was before my body a while ago, but also as somehow different. What I formerly experienced is not now present, along with this new something, but by its presence furnishing one of the relata for the relation of similarity. On the contrary, I am aware only of this new something as similar, and yet as different. The thing it resembles and does not entirely resemble is absent from my awareness as a definite content of my present experience. But I know that it was experienced only a moment ago. Now I move my fingers, still keeping my eyes closed. I again become aware of the kind of hardness I experienced a moment ago when I touched the keys before. The present hardness is much more similar to that previous hardness than the present color I see with closed lids is to the color viewed with open eyes. The keys I still see are ghostly white and black. The fingers I see are ghostly fingers, but the hardness I feel is not ghostly. Now this object of my vision so sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought is called a visual image, corresponding to and resembling the thing I saw once and can again see if only I open my eyes. The image is, moreover, not merely something in the field of vision. It is there a standing for something else, for what is called the real typewriter, which I can see and do touch. I know the reality through this image. If you ask me what is the color of the typewriter frame, I answer black. I see the black of my image, and it means the black of the real typewriter. In this case, unquestionably, I know the reality through the image. I can do so because I am aware of the resemblance the image has to the real typewriter which I saw a moment ago standing in its naked reality before my eyes. If I were to doubt the resemblance, I should only have to open my eyes, and lo, the real thing would stand revealed as having just the color I attributed to it, because I saw that color in the image. That is to say, when my eyes are closed, I have a representative visual image of the reality I have previously seen face to face. 
It is to be noted that such representative knowledge differs greatly from the representative knowledge of the school of Hamilton. Hamilton thought that the thing we saw with open eyes was not the real thing. It was merely a replica of the real thing. Hence he believed that all our knowledge is representative. According to the account given above, not all knowledge is representative. The knowledge of the real thing's visual characters, which we get when our eyes are open, is direct and immediate. It is intuitive. It is only when my eyes are closed that I have to depend upon representative knowledge. Now as I can have both intuitive and representative knowledge of reality, and as I can be aware of the similarity or dissimilarity between them, I can, when I have intuitive knowledge, test the correctness of the representative knowledge I previously had. The arguments, therefore, which have been directed against the theory of the representative character of all knowledge lose their force when turned against the asserted fact of the representative character of a large part of our knowledge. If we call this representative part of our knowledge knowing the external world through ideas which are merely within us, it is hard to see the justification which Professor Dewey has for saying that such knowledge is an inherent self-contradiction. The question, however, may properly be asked whether the image is merely within us. Answering from experience, I should say that it is. I have never found any reason for supposing that the image can exist apart from the awareness of it. And I presume that by merely existing within us, Professor Dewey means existing only when there is an awareness of what exists. On the other hand, I think that I have good reason for believing that the real thing I see continues to exist when I no longer see it, when I do not even think of it, and when, so far as I know, no one experiences it in any way. The trouble with Hamilton's school is that having convinced themselves that some of our knowledge is representative, they allow themselves to infer that all knowledge is representative. The trouble with philosophers of Professor Dewey's way of thinking is that having convinced themselves that some of our knowledge is not representative, and that if all our knowledge were representative, we should never have any criterion for truth, they jump to the conclusion that none of our knowledge is representative. If people would only give up trying to reduce all knowledge to a dull uniformity of character, and would describe facts as they are, we should have neither the insoluble problem of proving copies authentic when we can never get at the originals, nor the anti-scientific view that things are real only in experience, and that real things change when our purely experienced images of them change, and that the changes of these images are the changes of the things. The theory above, outlining as to the partially intuitive and partially representative character of our knowledge makes possible a meaning of transsubjective reference, which accords with the facts and does not involve contradictions. By transsubjective reference, according to this theory, is meant reference to what exists beyond the direct object of awareness when that object is merely subjective. When I close my eyes and remove my fingers from the keys of my typewriter, I am aware of images, which are called merely subjective because they are supposed to have no existence except as they appear in consciousness. But I am also aware of a reference of these images to what is not now directly present in consciousness, viz. my typewriter. This transsubjective reference finds its simplest illustration in memory. The thing remembered and the image present in consciousness when we remember are of course not the same thing. We cannot literally recall our boyhood days, but we do have images which, however, are not mere images and nothing more. We have images which reproduce, with some verisimilitude, those bygone days. Not only is there reproduction, there is also recognition of the past experience. The images come to us in the character of representatives, present ambassadors bearing credentials from a court which has long been leveled in the dust of time. But we honor the credentials and treat the embassy with all the consideration due to the power they represent. This treatment of the present image as representative of a past reality is a transsubjective reference. The image is a relatum in relation to a non-existent correlatum. We might call the relation, so far as the immediate contents of experience are concerned, a one-term relation. The other term is not present in the pure experience of the moment. But its absence does not mar the character of the present term as a related term recognized as such. There is pure experience of reference, too. And if the phrase is to be completed, the completement lies beyond the immediate experience. 
an image thus referred to what is not present in consciousness to complete the reference is what i would call an idea all our reminiscent knowledge is by means of ideas now if we may know the past of which we are no longer immediately aware by means of ideas why may we not know present objects of which we are not immediately aware in the same way at present for instance i have an image of my bed in another room the image is not my bed and the bed is not an object of my immediate pure experience while i am writing nevertheless the image refers to the real bed now existing in the same way in which the memory refers to something not itself something not now existing but having existed in the past the fact that in the one case the object referred to is past and in the other case exists simultaneously with the image does not make any difference in the transsubjective character of the reference if it be asked how i know that the bed is up in my room a distinct reality from my image of it as my body sits here at my writing table i should say that hume has fairly stated the facts on which my belief in this distinction rests although of course hume did not think that the belief was logically valid the belief was for him a mere fiction of the imagination but for him when he was consistent the memory image had no transsubjective reference either whether we call the motive which prompts to the belief an instinct or reason or common sense the fact is that the belief is in normal experience present and no argument can be given for its untenableness which does not at the same time assume its tenableness and its correctness now just as i have memory images referred to realities previously experienced and just as i have images referring to present realities not immediately experienced so i can have images referring to past or future realities which have never been experienced the fall of constantinople the martyrdom of bruno the next fourth of july and my deathbed experience are all present to me by representative images i know them more or less accurately by means of ideas all my knowledge of the past all my forecast of the future and all my knowledge of facts now existing save the few i have before me in the way of sense perception inner and outer are representative bosenkett therefore does not seem to be far from the truth when he says that we come into contact with reality in sense perception everywhere else we have images referring to reality ideas of reality but not reality itself if i read professor james aright this view is not far from his yet it differs from his in one important respect he seems to make the truth of experience where substitutional images are employed to consist in the fact that these images do actually continue uninterrupted into the experience where the reality becomes an object of sense perception i should rather say that one important test of my imaging experience is found in subsequent or prior sense perceptions the truth of the images however consists in the correspondence of the images with a transsubjective reality which now exists or with a transsubjective reality which has existed in the past or will exist in the future whether ever actually an object of immediate experience or not the sense perception confirms the truth but is not the truth truth is the agreement between ideas and reality such agreement does not necessitate exact correspondence point for point between images and reality but for truth there must be correspondence in regard to the feature which is transsubjectively referred end of pure experience and reality by evander bradley mcgilvery Pure Experience and Reality, a Disclaimer, by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pure Experience and Reality, a Disclaimer, by John Dewey. It is hard to judge how far it is advisable to enter into a controversial discussion in reply to criticism. Observation of its usual course tends to the conclusion that the time devoted to it might ordinarily better be spent upon independent analysis or construction. And if one's original writings, put forth without controversial entanglements, are so awkwardly phrased as to provoke serious misunderstanding, 
Why give the philosophic brethren additional cause for offense? But silence gives assent, and may propagate misunderstanding in minds hitherto innocent. Moreover, Professor McGilvery's misconception of my position, as he sets it forth in the May number of this review, under the caption of Pure Experience and Reality, volume 16, pages 266 to 284, is so extreme that, to some extent, it may be categorically dealt with. 1. He refers to me as among those who hold that the reality of anything is the reality it has as experienced and only when experienced. Page 266, italics mine. And again, no contemporaneous experience, no reality. Page 274. I do not hold, never have held, and to the best of my knowledge and belief have never intimated nor implied any such views. That experience means experienced things, that all philosophic conclusions are to be drawn from the things as experienced, not from the concept of experience, which I have held to be purely empty, excepting as indicating a method of procedure and recourse, that things are what they are experienced as, or experienced to be, I have asserted. The only when in the quotation has no standing in anything I have written, and books, chairs, geological ages, etc., are experienced, so far as I am aware, as existent at other times than the moment when they are experienced. Does not Professor McGilvery experience them as that sort of thing, to be that sort of thing? 2. The question raised in the paper upon which Professor McGilvery bases his criticism is, granting the existence of things prior to experiencing organisms, what is the better index for philosophy of reality, its earlier or its later form? These words are in the original text and are quoted by Professor McGilvery himself. That is to say, shall philosophy build its interpretation of reality upon reality as existent prior to its experience, or upon the reality of that as now experienced? The answer given is in the latter sense, that the earlier, say, Eozoic geological age, is experienced as the condition of a present experience which expresses reality more adequately for philosophy, not for science, than the conception of it as merely pre-existent. This may be a false conception, but it is a totally different idea from that to which Professor McGilvery devotes much poetry, eloquence, and humor. How could it be a condition of the present experience unless it existed prior in time? But Professor McGilvery is so well aware that the prior existence of one thing to another thing in time leaves entirely untouched the question of the nature of the reality of time, and hence of the reality for philosophy, of the temporal sequence, that I do not understand the satisfaction he gets from writing, as if I were totally ignorant of this rudimentary distinction. Moreover, if the doctrine be false, it is still one that Professor McGilvery himself holds. He writes, No experience somewhere and some when, no meaningful reality anywhere and any time. This is the truth which is contained in Professor Dewey's contention. Page 274, italics mine. I should say it was the only truth for which I contended. My enjoyment, accordingly, of the ludicrous position in which Professor McGilvery places the pure empiricist with me as corpus vile is heightened by the fact that, in view of his expressed agreement, I can stand the joke, if he can. 3. Professor McGilvery quotes from me, The present experience of the veriest unenlightened ditch digger does philosophic justice to the earlier reality, whose existence he charges me with denying, in a way which the scientific statement does not and cannot, cannot, that is, as formulated knowledge. Page 273, italics mine. Unfortunately for his logic, though doubtless fortunately for his humor and poetic metaphor, he fails to quote or take into account the next sentence, which runs as follows. As itself vital or direct experience, the latter is more valuable and is truer in the sense of worth more for other interpretations. The pointed issue is not in the least whether the experience creates the things known, but whether the scientific formula as such or the direct vital experience as such is, for the philosopher, a better index of the nature of reality, it being expressly declared that a direct experience which includes the scientific formulation is better than one which does not. 
when Professor McGilvery himself comes out strongly for the representative character of knowledge, he seems to be again in favor of my contention that a direct experience is a better index for philosophy than the knowledge phase as such of an experience. But perhaps only the erring empiricist holds that direct is better than merely representative experience. If so, I am still content to err, and shall abide by my conviction that an experience in which a symbol is experienced in its fulfillment or embodiment is better than one in which the symbol alone is experienced, just as it is also better than one which remains as yet unrepresentative. And there are certain echoes from one Hegel, who held that the mediation finds its fruition in a new immediacy, which I hope still also reaches the ears of Professor McGilvery. 4. Professor McGilvery refers to studies in logical theory as follows. In that work, he, i.e. the present writer, insisted that the object of thought, when it has emerged from the experience of stress and strain and appears in a subsequent tranquil experience as the result of pragmatic adjustment, must not be read back anachronistically into the time preceding the adjustment. The reader was therefore left to infer that no truth made out by intellectual labor is to be held valid of anything real that may have existed before that labor was ended. Page 267, Italics Mine. The reader was not only left to infer this, but the reader who did infer it was left. The point of the contention to which Professor McGilvery refers is the anachronism of referring back the object of thought as characteristically a thought object to reality prior to the thinking. The old-fashioned empiricist held that thinking has no forms or modes of its own at all, being merely a complex of sensations or a disintegration of a prior complex. The epistemological idealist held that such forms or categories not only exist but are characteristic of reality as such, which therefore is to be conceived, philosophically, as a system of thought relations. The thought as such is constitutive of reality as such. Now, one object of the studies was to insist, as against the sensationalist, that thinking does determine a characteristic objective situation, and against the idealist, that it determines an object in process, through doubt and inquiry, of redetermination. Its purport, in short, is that all thinking is reflective, and that it is constitutive not of reality per se or at large, but only of such reality as has been reorganized through specific thinking, the reorganization finally taking place through an action in which the thinking terminates and by which it is tested. Thought is thus conceived of as a control phenomenon, biological in origin, humane, practical, or moral in import, involving in its issue real transformation of real reality. Hence the text abounds in assertions of reality existing prior to thinking, prior to coming to know, which, through the organic issue of thinking and experimental action, is reconstructed. That it should be possible for a thinker of Professor McGilvery's equipment to say nothing of his command of wit and of the poetry of picturesque and catastrophic metaphor, completely to invert the sense of my writing, even after its obscure and awkward character is taken into account, would be finally discouraging, were it not that I am buoyed up by three considerations. In the first place, he holds that knowledge is by subjective images which acquire a transubjective reference to the realities to which they subjectively mean to refer. The connection of the intention with the image unfortunately not being elucidated. Hence it would not be surprising if an image of my logical beliefs should spring up in Professor McGilvery's subjective resort for such creatures, which should be totally unlike its object. If such an image were of great aesthetic brilliancy and of an unusually vivacious quality, it might easily impose upon him. Or the image might get switched off during its transsubjective travels, and finally light upon my devoted head, though originally intended, say, for some sensationalistic idealist. It would be obviously unjust to hold Professor McGilvery responsible for such a faux pas on the part of his image after it left him. Again, thinkers who have got habituated to a mode of psychological analysis, which, in the interest of psychology, resolves experience into certain transient acts and states of a person, into sensations and images of a psychophysical organism, 
may forget that others employ the term experience in a more vital, concrete, and pregnant sense. Hence, when others talk about experience, it is assumed that this means the psychological abstract, which it means to the critic. Finally, modern philosophy has been built up on the foundations of epistemology. That is, it has held that reality is to be reached by the philosopher on the basis of an analysis of the procedure of knowledge. Hence, when a writer endeavors to take naively a frankly naturalistic, biological, and moral attitude, and to account for knowledge on the basis of the place it occupies in such a reality, he is treated as if his philosophy were only, after all, just another kind of epistemology. End of Pure Experience and Reality A Disclaimer by John Dewey Pure Experience and Reality, A Reassertion by Evander Bradley McGilvery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pure Experience and Reality, A Reassertion by Evander Bradley McGilvery. A page and a day are given me for replying to the above disclaimer. Hence, on this occasion, I cannot well take up all the points that need further discussion. Professor Dewey attributes my failure to understand him to the fact that my image of his logical views got switched off during its transsubjective travels. But of course, this is absurd. In fact, no mistake has occurred, and none could occur. Immediate empiricism postulates that things, anything, everything, in the ordinary or non-technical use of the term thing, are what they are experienced as. Hence, if one wishes to describe anything truly, his task is to tell what it is experienced as being. Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, Volume 2, page 393, Italics Mine. Now, in my article, I told exactly what Professor Dewey's logical philosophy was by me experienced as being. Hence, that article has described his philosophy truly. Professor Dewey disclaims having ever intimated or implied that he ever held any such view as that the reality of anything is the reality it has only when experienced. No doubt he does not experience having made any such intimations or implications. But on my part, after tensions over what seemed the absolute contradiction involved in the statement that things are what they are experienced as or experienced to be, I finally got the satisfying and redintegrating experience that Professor Dewey supposed the reality of anything is the reality it has only when experienced. I thereupon took the pragmatic outcome of my previous perplexity over the doctrine as containing the meaning of the doctrine. If I have made a mistake in this, it is simply the mistake of a disciple who follows too literally the master's instructions. Now let me describe the logical process which issued in my mistake. Zollner's lines are divergent when experienced as divergent, they are parallel when experienced as parallel. Loco Catato, page 397. This was the cue. The second epochal stage was reached when I began to think of what would happen if the reality of the divergence and the reality of the parallelism could somehow extricate themselves from the times of the experiences to which they severally belonged. It looked very much as if there would be imminent danger that these realities might, in their wanderings, meet each other in some common time to the logical embarrassment of each. This unpleasantness was obviated when the third stage of the logical process was reached. In this stage, I found peace in the thought that the real divergence and the real parallelism of Zoner's lines were severally pinned down to the times of the several experiences of which they formed each a part. Of course, the issue of this logical procedure makes the experientia mensura doctrine very much like the old homo mensura doctrine, but then one must describe things as he finds them in his experience. Professor Dewey claims that, in the article which I examined, he repeatedly referred to reality prior to experience, and that he spoke of such reality as the condition of the subsequent experience. This is true, I saw the words, but when I tried to get any meaning out of them, the past reality became for me a present one, for Professor Dewey's past realities have a way of now undergoing past changes every time they are differently experienced. A thing which now changes I cannot bring myself to experience as a past reality. A leopard which died in Jeremiah's day, and yet now manages to change the spots it had during the exile, seems to me not so much a creature of the past as an interesting monstrosity of the present.
End of Pure Experience and Reality, A Reassertion by Evander Bradley McGilvery. The Logical Character of Ideas by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Logical Character of Ideas by John Dewey. Said John Stuart Mill, to draw inferences has been said to be the great business of life. It is the only occupation in which the mind never ceases to be engaged. If this be so, it seems a pity that Mill did not recognize that this business identifies what we mean when we say mind. If he had recognized this, he would have cast the weight of his immense influence not only against the conception that mind is itself a substance, but also against the conception that it is a collection of existential states or attributes without any substance in which to inhere, and would thereby have done much to free logic from epistemological metaphysics. In any case, an account of intellectual operations and conditions from the standpoint of the role played and position occupied in the business of drawing inferences is a different sort of thing from that which regards them as having an existence per se, and which treats them as marking some sort of existential material distinct from the things which figure in inference drawing. This latter type of treatment is that which underlies the psychology which itself has adopted uncritically the remnants of the metaphysics of soul substance the idea of accidents without the substance. Footnote. This conception of consciousness as a sort of reduplicate world of things comes to us, I think, chiefly from Hume's conception that the mind is nothing but a heap, a collection of different perceptions, united together by certain relations. Treaties of Human Nature, Book 1, Part 4, Section 2. For the evolution of this sort of notion out of the immaterial substance notion, C. Bush, a factor in the genesis of idealism, in the James Festschrift. End footnote. This assumption from metaphysical psychology, the assumption of consciousness as an existent stuff or existent process, is then carried over into the examination of knowledge, so as to make the theory of knowledge not logic, an account of the ways in which valid inferences or conclusions from things to other things are made, but epistemology. We have, therefore, the result, so unfortunate for logic, that logic is not free to go its own way, but is comprised by the assumption that knowledge goes on not in terms of things. I use things in the broadest sense, as equaling race, and covering affairs, concerns, acts, as well as things in the narrower sense, but in terms of a relation between things and a peculiar existence made up of consciousness, or else between things and functional operations of this existence. If it could be shown that psychology is essentially not a science of states of consciousness, but of behavior conceived as a process of continuous readjustment, then the undoubted facts which go by the name of sensation, perception, image, emotion, concept, would be interpreted to mean peculiar, i.e. specifically qualitative, epochs, phases, and crises in the scheme of behavior. The supposedly scientific basis for the belief that states of consciousness inherently define a separate type of existence would be done away with. Inferential knowledge, knowledge involving reflection, psychologically viewed, would be assimilated to a certain mode of readaptation of functions, involving shock and the need of control. Knowledge in the sense of direct, non-reflective presence of things would be identified psychologically with relatively stable or completed adjustments. I cannot profess to speak for psychologists, but it is an obvious characteristic of the contemporary status of psychology that one school, the so-called functional or dynamic, operates with nothing more than at most a conventional and perfunctory reference to states of consciousness, while the orthodox school has to make constant concessions to ideas of the behavior type. It introduces the conception of fatigue, practice, and habituation. It makes its fundamental classifications on the basis of physiological distinctions, e.g. the centrally initiated and the peripherally initiated, which, from a biological standpoint, are certainly distinctions of the structures which are involved in the performance of functions. One of the aims of these studies in logical theory was to show, on the negative or critical side, 
that the type of logical theory which professedly starts its account of knowledge from mere states of consciousness is compelled at every crucial juncture to assume things and to define its so-called mental states in terms of things. Footnote. See, for example, page 31. Thus that which is nothing but a state of our consciousness turns out straightway to be a specifically determined objective fact in a system of facts. And page 58. Actual sensation is determined as an event in a world of events. End footnote. And, on the positive side, to show that, logically considered, such distinctions as sensation, image, etc., mark instruments and crises in the development of controlled judgment, i.e., of inferential conclusions. It perhaps was not surprising that this effort should have been criticized, not on its own merits, but on the assumption that this correspondence of the functional, psychological, and the logical points of view was intended in terms of the psychology which obtained in the critic's mind, to wit the psychology based on the assumption of consciousness as a separate existence or process. Thus when Dr. Pratt, in a recent discussion, footnote, this journal, volume 5, page 131, note, end footnote, says that the aforesaid essays might well have been written from the standpoint of solipsism, I accordingly find an unintended compliment. Not that they were written, I hasten to add, from the solipsistic standpoint, but that they were written from a logical standpoint, to which the solipsist controversy is irrelevant. Since a logical inquiry is concerned only with inferential relations among things, not with preconceptions about a lonely consciousness or soul or self. The assumption of a separate ontological world of consciousness, which either is the self or is the possession of some self, simply does not enter into the discussion. When Dr. Pratt speaks of a private stream of consciousness, of outer realities that never come within one's own private stream of consciousness, and of a relation between these realities and our judgments about them, a relation which from the nature of the case one can never experience, and puts a dilemma on the basis of these assumptions. Page 131. He puts, indeed, a dilemma to those who hold to these assumptions, but he misses the point of the logical studies. Whether with such assumptions Dr. Pratt and others who hold to them can logically escape solipsism, except by saying they escape it, is also a matter for them to consider. In the earlier part of his article, however, Dr. Pratt seems to admit that logical inquiry may be carried on in its own terms, without being compromised by the necessity of accommodating it to foregone epistemological assumptions. He accepts the position of the concrete situation, page 123, and emphasizes the notion that the center of the problem of the truth of ideas is found in the problem of judgment, page 130. Footnote. Just how this doctrine is to be reconciled with the other assertion that the problem of knowledge is concerned with the relation, which, by the nature of the case, cannot be experienced, between judgments in a private stream of consciousness and unexperienced objects outside the stream, it would be interesting to find out. End footnote. He gives an illustration, moreover, on the basis of which points at issue may be logically, not epistemologically, discussed. Dr. Pratt says, thus I believe my friend B is in Constantinople. If B really is in Constantinople, my thought is true. I confess it is impossible for me to see how anything could be simpler than this. Page 124. In short, a thought is true if the object of thought is as you think it. Just before this, however, page 123, Dr. Pratt has discriminated another sense of truth, which marks a current, a correct, and an intelligible usage. This is the identification of truth with known fact, italics and original. What is the relation of these two meanings? Dr. Pratt insists, quite correctly as it seems to me, that truth or falsity is a character of ideas only when ideas are in judgment. Only that is, as I understand it, when they intend a certain objective reference. The men who deny the existence of the antipodes presumably had the idea, or they could not have denied its truth, and the object was as they thought it when they had the idea. But their idea was not true, because their judgments denied a certain objective connection. And when I believe my friend is in Constantinople, I do not merely entertain the idea as a floating image, 
I intend a factual reference. In short, the question of truth is not whether an object is as you think it, unless the term think means as you judge it to be. The logical idea is short for a certain judgment about a thing. It states the way an object is judged to be, the way we take it in the inference process, as distinct from the way it actually may be. If we compare this conception of truth with that of identification with known fact, we get some striking results and some even more striking questions. When there is a known fact, there is a known fact and no judgment and no idea. The known fact may very well be the outcome of a judgment, but it cannot be part of any judgment that involves a thought of B's whereabouts. Or, since it is not the word judgment we are concerned with, the kind of judgment occurring when it is a known fact where B is, is radically different from that occurring when, his whereabouts not being certain, we inferentially judge him to be at Constantinople. Since the latter involves inference, consideration of evidence, it involves some doubt. Do we have any thought, as a part of an intended objective reference, of B's presence in Constantinople, save as we have also the thought of his possible presence somewhere else, plus the conviction that the weight of evidence is in favor of his being in Constantinople? These questions suggest that before we can raise intelligently the question of the truth of ideas, we must consider the question of their status in judgment, judgment being regarded as the typical expression of the inferential operation. 1. Do ideas present themselves except in situations which are doubtful and inquired into? Do they exist side by side with the facts to which they refer when these facts are themselves known? Do they exist except when judgment is in suspense? 2. Are the ideas anything else except the suggestions, conjectures, hypotheses, theories, I use an ascending scale of terms, tentatively entertained during a suspended conclusion? 3. Do they have any part to play in the conduct of inquiry? Do they serve to direct observation, colligate data, and guide experimentation, or are they otiose? Footnote. When it is said that an idea is a plan of action, it must be remembered that the term plan of action is a formal term. It throws no light upon what the action is with respect to which an idea is the plan. It may be chopping down a tree, finding a trail, or conducting a scientific research in mathematics, history, or chemistry. End footnote. 4. If the ideas have a function in directing the reflective process expressed in judgment, does success in performing the function, that is, in directing to a conclusion which is stable, have anything to do with the logical worth or validity of the ideas? 5. And finally, does this matter of validity have anything to do with the question of truth? Does truth mean something inherently different from the fact that the conclusion of one judgment, the known fact, previously unknown, in which it terminates, is itself applicable in further situations of doubt and inquiry? And is judgment properly more than tentative, save as it terminates in a known fact, i.e. a fact present without the intermediary of reflection? When these questions, I mean of course questions which are exemplified in these queries, are answered, we shall perhaps have gone as far as it is possible to go with reference to the logical character of ideas. The question may then recur as to whether the ideas of the epistemologist, that is, existences in a purely private stream of consciousness, remain as something over and above, not yet accounted for, or whether they are perversions and misrepresentations of logical characters. I propose to give a brief dogmatic reply in the latter sense, where, and insofar as, there are unquestioned objects, there is no consciousness. There are just things in their factual relations. When there is uncertainty, there are dubious, suspected objects, things hinted at, guessed at. Such objects have a distinct status, and it is the part of good sense to give them, as occupying that status, a distinct caption. Consciousness is a term often used for this purpose, and I see no objection to that term, provided it is recognized to mean such objects as are problematic 
plus the fact that in their problematic character they may be used more effectively even than accredited objects to direct observations and experiments which finally relieve the doubtful features of the situation. Footnote. Such a use differs from that of Perry, who would employ the term to connote formally accepted but now definitely discredited objects, recognized errors, illusions, etc. End footnote. Such objects may turn out valid, or they may not. But in any case, they may be used. They may be internally manipulated and developed through ratiocination into explicit statement of their implications. They may be employed as standpoints for selecting and arranging data, and as methods for conducting experiments. In short, they are not merely hypothetical. They are working hypotheses. Meanwhile, their aloofness from accredited objectivity may lead us to characterize them as merely ideas, or even as mental states, provided once more we mean by mental state just this logical status. We have examples of such ideas and symbols. A symbol, I take it, is always itself, existentially a particular object. A word, an algebraic sign, is just as much a concrete existence as is a horse, a fire engine, or a fly speck but its value resides in its representative character, in its suggestive and directive force for operations, which, when performed, lead us to non-symbolic objects, which without symbolic operations would not be apprehended, or at least be as easily apprehended. It is, I think, worth noting that the capacity, A, of entertaining objects as mere symbols, and B, of employing symbols instrumentally, furnishes the only safeguard against dogmatism i.e. uncritical acceptance of any suggestion that comes to us vividly, and that it furnishes the only basis for intelligently controlled experiments. I do not think, however, that we should have the tendency to regard ideas as private, as personal, if we stop short at this point. If we had only words or other symbols uttered by others, or written or printed, we might call them, when in objective suspense, mere ideas. But we should hardly think of these ideas as our own states, such extra-organic stimuli, however, would not be adequate logical devices. They are too rigid, too objective in their own existential status. Their meaning and character are too definitely fixed. For effective discovery, we need things which are more easily manipulated, which are more transitive, more easily dropped and changed. Intra-organic events, adjustments within the organism, that is, adjustments of the organism considered not with reference to the environment, but simply as events of their own account, are much better suited to stand as representatives of genuinely dubious objects. An object which is really doubted is by its nature precarious and inchoate, vague. What is a thing when it is not yet discovered and yet is being tentatively entertained and tested? Ancient logic never got beyond the conception of an object whose logical place, whose subsumptive position as a particular with reference to some universal, was doubtful. It never got to the point where it could search for particulars which in themselves as particulars were doubtful. Hence, it was a logic of proof, of deduction, not of inquiry, of discovery, and of induction. It was hard up against its own dilemma. How can a man inquire? For either he knows that for which he seeks, and hence does not seek, or he does not know, in which case he cannot seek, nor could he tell if he found. The individualistic movement of modern life detached, as it were, the individual, and allowed purely private, i.e. intra-organic, events to have transitivity and temporarily a worth of their own. These events are continuous with extra-organic events in origin and eventual outcome, but they may be considered in temporary displacement as uniquely existential. In this capacity, they serve for the elaboration of a delayed but more adequate response in a radically new direction. So treated, they are tentative, dubious, but experimental, anticipations of an object. They are subjective, i.e. individualistic, surrogates of public, cosmic things, and they may be so manipulated and elaborated as to terminate in public things which without them would not exist as empirical objects. Footnote. I owe this idea, both in its historical and in its logical aspects, to my former colleague, Professor Mead, of the University of Chicago. End footnote. 
the distinct perception, then, of intra-organic events, not as merely effects or distorted refractions of cosmic objects, but as inchoate future cosmic objects in process of empirical construction, solves, to my mind, the paradox of so-called subjective and private things which yet have objective and universal reference, and which operate so as to lead to objective consequences that test their own value. When a man can say this color is not necessarily the color of the glass, or the picture, or even of the object reflected, but is at least my color, an event which I may refer to my organism, till I get surety of other reference, he is for the first time emancipated from the dogmatism of unquestioned reference, and is set upon a path of experimental inquiry, which may lead to the discovery of a previously unexperienced thing, and possibly to a thing of a qualitatively different order from anything previously experienced. I am not here concerned with trying to demonstrate that this is the correct mode of interpretation. I am only concerned to point out its radical difference from the view of the critic, who, holding to the two-world theory of existences, which from the start are divided into the fixedly objective and the fixedly psychical, interprets the view that the distinction between the objective and the subjective is a logical, practical distinction in terms of his own theory. Whether the logical, as against the ontological, theory be true or false, it can hardly be fruitfully discussed without a preliminary sympathetic apprehension of it. End of The Logical Character of Ideas by John Dewey The Chicago Idea and Idealism by Evander Bradley McGilvery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Chicago Idea and Idealism by Evander Bradley McGilvery Every fundamentally new attempt at reconstruction in science involves, to some extent at least, a new terminology. The old words of a language may still be employed, but they are made to carry new meanings, and it is the task of the attentive reader to keep from slipping back into the old meanings when he would understand the new message. This commonplace reflection is suggested by the present status of the pragmatistic controversy. Professor Dewey has repeatedly complained that his critics have failed to understand him because they have interpreted what he says as if he were employing old words in their old meanings. The complaint is amply justified, and, of course, this misunderstanding is a bar to any true appreciation of his instrumental logic. There is no word which is apt to give more trouble to Professor Dewey's readers than the word idea. The fault is not Professor Dewey's, for he has taken great pains to make clear just what he means by the term. But what he means is so different from what is ordinarily meant that it is no wonder that his critics have failed to remain true to his definition when they try to appraise the value of his statements about ideas. For instance, when one finds this challenge thrown down by Professor Dewey, do ideas present themselves except in situations which are doubtful and inquired into? Footnote. This journal, volume 5, page 378, in footnote, one is apt to take up the gauntlet with confident heart, for does not everyone know that ideas do present themselves constantly in situations which are untroubled by any doubt? But the cautious reader knows that the gauntlet has a string attached to it, and may not be lightly taken up. In this paper, I shall try to state as best I may the new meaning of idea in Professor Dewey's writings, and then ask some questions which this new meaning suggests. But before doing this, let us take a brief survey of the current meanings of the term. The word idea has at least two different types of meaning in common use. These two meanings can be traced back in English to Locke and Hume. They may be called the inclusive and the exclusive significations of the word. Locke used the word of everything of which we are conscious when we think. Hume used it in antithesis to impression. And since their days, not to go farther back, both these usages have been classic. Of course, the particular nuance which the term has in either sense is determined by the views which are held in regard to the genesis and the function or reference of ideas. And these views are various. For instance, Lotze, like Locke, set over against the world of ideas used inclusively a world of reality outside of ideas, which ideas are to deal with as well as they can. Professor Dewey has shown with masterly skill how Sisyphean is the task which is set for ideas in this scheme of things. 
the idealist, also using idea in the inclusive sense, denies that there is any reality that is not idea. He has, therefore, no need to make ideas adjust themselves to a reality which is not ideal. The only adjustment necessary is among the ideas themselves. Hume, taking the term in an exclusive sense, finds, however, no work cut out for ideas in the fact that they are not exhaustive of reality. They carry no reference to the other class of realities. All they have to do is be more or less lively, and the laws of association manage this business for them. The psychologist of the present day is apt to use the word in the exclusive sense fixed by Hume. But, following the hint given by Hume himself, although not developed by him, the psychologist regards ideas as those elements in experience that are due to central stimulations of the cortex, as opposed to sensations which are due to peripheral stimulations. The plain man uses the term in a manner similar to that adopted by the psychologist, although of course he has very vague notions of the basis of the distinction between idea and sensation. I think that it can properly be said that the psychological employment of the term is merely a refined and critical adaptation of the vulgar use. Now, when ideas are used in this way in antithesis to sensation, it may be recognized that they not only are occurrences accounted for by their connection with brain processes, but also are in some way the vehicles of knowledge. They have not only a structure and a genesis, but also a function and a value determined by the success with which they perform their function. This function is knowing. The examination of this function and of the value of ideas in this functional process is generally turned over by the psychologist to the epistemologist. If the latter takes up the problem on its own account and ignores the psychological problems of structure and genesis, we have then two abstract sciences standing side by side, much to the scandal of pragmatists and humanists. The division of labor is regarded as an ultimate and hopeless scission of the material taken in hand. The living unity of experience is dissected into dead members, and where is the Isis to gather up the scattered anatomy of experience? And where is the Ezekiel to prophesy upon the dead bones that they may live? There is no goddess in Egypt, and no prophet in Israel these days. But we have the pragmatist who can see to it that the default of supernatural beings shall not be fatal to natural human knowing. He employs an ounce of prevention, where they would have resorted to tons and tons of miraculous cure. He would have no division of labor between psychology and epistemology, for, of course, division of labor is division of what you labor on, and this is to be avoided at all hazards. One unspecialized type of laborer is to be employed on the work, and this secures unity of finished product. Assembling is an impossibility in manufacture, hence do nothing that will make it necessary. The logician can do all the work and keep the parts together from start to finish. This, of course, necessitates a new terminology in the factory. The real trouble with the antiquated method is found in the kind of distinction that is made between ideas, meanings, thoughts, ways of conceiving, comprehending, interpreting facts, suggestions, guesses, theories, estimates, etc., on the one hand, and facts, objects, data, and whatnot on the other. These are not forever fixed in their eternal state, else they have done with things below. They are simply instrumental distinctions, functional variants, and are just what at any time you take them to be. Of course, even thus you cannot get rid of the distinctions, and so cannot get rid of division of labor. But you have a different kind of division of labor. The division here falls upon the material which the logician studies, not upon the students of the material. As this material is living reflective experience, it can temporarily endure all sorts of tensions and distractions, taking these up and working them over till it affects a reorganization. Indeed, without this tension and distraction, there would be no thinking life. But the student of this life must not divide what in life is connected, even in its division. So that while in this new way of ideas, datum and ideatum are divisions of labor, cooperative instrumentalities for economical dealings with the problems of the maintenance of the integrity of experience, the logician must recognize that either is a sheer abstraction from the standpoint either of the organized experience left behind or of the reorganized experience which is the end, the objective. Footnote, Studies in Logical Theory, page 52. The second quotation is taken out of its narrower context, where the subject of the sentence is a particular datum, namely, mere change of apparent position of sun, which is absolutely unquestioned as datum. But the larger context, I think, justifies the use to which I have put this clause. In footnote, thus the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity is not one between meaning as such and datum as such. 
It is a specification that emerges, correspondently, in both datum and ideatum, as affairs of the direction of logical movement. That which is left behind in the evolution of accepted meaning is characterized as real, but only in a psychical sense. That which is moved toward is regarded as real in an objective cosmic sense. Footnote, opera catato, pages 53 to 54. End footnote. The psychic, the ideal, on the one hand, the cosmic, the objective, on the other, are thus nothing but shifting values in an ever-growing unity of experience. Just what shift is made is determined by the problem and its solution in any definite concrete situation. When an intellectual problem is taken up in experience, there is always something that for the time being is accepted as fact. This is the datum. There is something else which is suggested as somehow appertaining to this fact. This is idea. The idea may be subsequently rejected in the outcome of thought's travail. It is then definitively for this occasion characterized as merely psychic. On the contrary, the suggestion may be accepted. It then merges with the datum after the latter has been correspondingly changed to receive the suggested content, and it ceases to be an idea for the occasion and becomes objective cosmic fact. Not only is this shifting according to the concrete emergencies and the concrete achievements of the logical process a fate which befalls ideas and data, it likewise draws into its kaleidoscopic field even the term sensation and image. One of the aims of the studies in logical theory was to show that such distinctions as sensation, image, etc., mark instruments and crises in the development of controlled judgment, i.e. of inferential conclusions. Footnote. This journal, volume 5, page 376. End footnote. Whether any experience is to be considered sensational is not determined then by resort to psychophysical investigation, except perhaps when the problem is psychophysical and not logical but by consideration of the harmonious outcome of the previously disturbed situation. We are not told whether sensation is synonymous with accepted fact, but we are at any rate warned not to consider it in terms of the psychology which obtained in the critic's mind. Footnote, Ibid, page 377. End footnote. Now these are perfectly clear distinctions, and although I may not have done justice to the clean-cut thought in which this view is worked out, still I hope that I have blocked the distinctions out sufficiently for recognition, by their author and by others. But what follows? I think that we must agree that one thing follows, namely, the necessity of giving just the kind of answer that Professor Dewey gives to the five sets of questions which he asks on page 378 of the current volume of this journal. According to this new definition of ideas and of facts, ideas do not present themselves except in situations which are doubtful and inquired into. They do not exist side by side with the facts to which they refer when these facts are themselves known. They do not exist except when judgment is in suspense. They are nothing but the suggestions, conjectures, hypotheses, theories, tentatively entertained during a suspended conclusion, and so forth and so forth. These answers are determined by the definitions already given of fact and idea and no examination of actual thinking experience is necessary for making the appropriate reply. All one has to do is to examine the definitions of the terms used. Just as in Euclidean geometry, all that one has to do in determining whether parallel lines meet is to consult the definition of parallel lines. The scheme is beautifully simple, and if you adhere to it, you get rid of some very disagreeable questions which force themselves on you if you refuse to adopt it. But if the questions referred to are asked with a view to determining whether the new way of ideas comports with facts, then we have a different matter on our hands. Into this question I cannot go at present. However, there are some questions which force themselves on me when I try to accept the new scheme on which the definitions rest. Is not the scheme a thoroughgoing idealism and a subjective idealism at that? But to guard against misunderstanding and putting the question, let me hasten to say at once I do not conceive the point of view underlying these definitions to be idealistic. If the connotation of idealistic is adapted to that of idea in the scheme, the studies in logical theory admit the existence of facts as well as of ideas, each defined in a special way. Professor Dewey, therefore, has a perfect right to repel the suggestion that his scheme is idealistic if idealism is defined according to idea in that scheme. We all remember how mildly indignant Bishop Barclay used to get when the suggestion arose that his way of ideas did away with matter. He easily showed that it did no such thing. Did not the whole choir of heaven and furniture of earth find its place in his idealism? And what is meant by matter anyway? 
but just such things as make heaven vocal and earth comfortable. But I believe that it is fairly settled these days, if it were ever doubted, that the fact that Berkeley's view admitted these material things did not make his doctrine non-idealistic. There is a current definition of idealism according to which we gauge systems as idealistic or not. Is Professor Dewey's system idealistic according to this definition? Idealism seems to be generally applied to any theory which regards all reality as embraced within experiences or within experience. It is the view that recognizes no residual reality uncatalogued after the inventory of all experience is taken. The thinker called idealistic may not even use the term experience, but we can see from his writings whether, if he had used that term as it is now generally used, he would have been willing to say with Mr. Bradley, I am driven to the conclusion that for me experience is the same as reality. The fact that falls elsewhere seems in my mind to be a mere word and a failure, or else an attempt at self-contradiction. It is a vicious abstraction whose existence is meaningless nonsense and is therefore not possible. Footnote, Appearance and Reality, 2nd edition, page 145. End footnote. If any thinker endorses these words, he is an idealist. And when any of Professor Dewey's critics calls him idealistic, the critic uses the term in this current sense. When Professor Dewey repudiates the epithet, does he use the term in another sense? If so, are they not both right, each in his own way? Professor Dewey hardly refutes the claim of his opponent by failing to meet the claim on its own grounds. A clear, unambiguous answer from Professor Dewey to the question whether he is an idealist in the current sense of idealism as defined above would, I am sure, make his views much more intelligible. Most of his readers have found him idealistic, only to be told that they are miserably mistaken. This has left them miserably nonplussed. If Professor Dewey thinks that it is too much of an accommodation to the weakness of his readers to answer the above question, he can at least tell us what he means by idealism when he denies that he is an idealist. And if, in the definition he employs the term idea, he can tell us whether that term is to be taken in the sense of the studies in logical theory. Footnote. While I am asking questions, I should like to put another. What does Professor Dewey mean by rationalism and rationalistic? The rationalism of the Aufklärung we think we know, and we know that we are not rationalists of that sort. But we do not know whether we are rationalists in this seemingly new and derogatory sense in which the term is frequently used in his recent writings. It is natural that we do not like to be charged with being rationalists without being allowed to plead guilty or not guilty with the law of the term before us. End footnote. But of course, when experience is used in the definition of idealism, we have another difficulty. What is meant by experience? The ordinary man, in his ordinariness, uses this term as in the first instance not inclusive of all reality, for he seems to find experience a very shifting thing. What is part of experience at one time is not part of it at another, even if experience be used in the most inclusive sense as embracing ideas, guesses, hypotheses, theories, as well as facts, still these, of course, are in constant flux, as pragmatism tells us. Not only do these unstable beings chasse backwards and forwards in the figures they describe, but they often chasse incontinently out of these figures altogether. When this evanishment occurs, the ordinary man is apt to say that the wayward beings are no longer parts of the experience. Experience goes along without them. Yesterday I saw a certain stone by a brookside. Today I remember that I saw it. In the interval, I neither saw it nor remembered seeing it, nor had the least inkling of its presence. Abait, excessit, evasit, erupit. Its eruption was clean out of experience. Experience, thus used, is a most labile thing. But this very slipperiness and instability is a part of its essence in ordinary thought. But there is another meaning of the term, an extraordinary meaning, but nevertheless prevalent in philosophical writings. Out of this experience there is no exit, not even by way of fire escape. It does even more for what we in our finitude and mutability lose from time to time than what the Grecian urn does for the lover and his lady. The urn stereotypes just one moment of their lives. Forever wilt thou love and she be fair. But experience stereotypes all the moments of all lives. Everything that was or is or ever shall be upon the bosom of a flowing river where it is both fixed and fluid. Either kind of experience has its difficulties for experience although we are told that neither kind has any for experience. But either kind is just what it is, and not what it is not. It contains just what it contains, and not what it does not. Professor Dewey will have none of the capitalized sort, yet he will have nothing that is not experience. 
But as we have seen, lowercase experience has no room for vanished stones, except as memories which themselves vanish most of the time. And this seems to be the reason why the humanistic pragmatist turns stones into self-supporting experiences. In this, Professor Dewey disdains to follow the humanist. Now the question is whether Professor Dewey uses experience in some other sense than one of those above mentioned. If he does not, is he not a subjective idealist? He is full of admiration for the miracle which the epistemologist works in getting his ideas united with fact. The epistemologist would feel justified in retorting the admiration if the pragmatist should attempt to make fragmentary and elusive experience without a purchase in something more permanent, bring out of non-existence just what it always needs for the solution of its logical puzzles. But if what has disappeared from experience still lives on in spite of its disappearance, and yet does so in no eternal experience, then how does this way of taking experience and its needed complement differ from strictly objectivistic realism? But how, according to the studies, can what vanishes from experience continue to exist, except as a sheer, unwarranted abstraction from the standpoint of organized or reorganized experience? There is one further difficulty that I wish to lay before Professor Dewey in connection with this new distinction between fact and idea. I suppose that most of us accept the other side of the moon as a fact, on a par as fact with this side of it. If we do not accept it, there seems to be considerable disturbance in experience, which I believe will continue in most of us till the other side gets accepted. Then it becomes fact. This fact, while as accepted fact it is on a parity with this side of the moon, yet as experienced fact seems to differ considerably from it. I can see the one, I cannot see the other. Grant that the term sensation would lose its ordinary acceptation and become merely a term to mark an instrument or crisis in the development of inferential conclusions. Still there is, after the conclusion is reached that the moon has two hemispheres, a considerable difference in our experience between the two hemispheres, and this difference does not seem to budge however we may pry upon it with changed meanings of terms. The realist, following the ordinary usage, says that while there are two lunar hemispheres, only one can be immediately experienced, and the other is acceptable to us only by means of idea. If he is forced to accept the Chicago lexicography, he finds himself at a loss to express himself on this point, but unfortunately he does not find any loss of the fact to be expressed. What is pragmatism going to do with this difference? If it ignores it, can it keep peace with science, a peace it is proud of proclaiming as one of its achievements? Science makes a thoroughgoing distinction between observation and inference, between empirical facts and scientific constructions upon the basis of facts. Now it is one of the great merits of the studies that it has pointed out the ambiguous nature of much of what is taken by science to be fact and what is taken to be theory. But may not the ambiguity be pressed just a little too far? What we take to be a satellite, 240,000 miles distant from the planetary Earth, may after all not prove to be what we think it is. But suppose that such a change in scientific construction should ever take place. All is not lost from present scientific fact. There remains the fact that there is a bright something, occasionally in experience, growing from slender crescent to full orb. This fact antedated Ptolemy, and has long survived Copernicus, and will, I think, survive Copernicanism, if the latter, having had its day, should ever cease to be. This fact may come to be interpreted as anything you please, and get accepted as that thing, but it will be there to be accepted somehow whenever any one constituted like us opens his eyes and turns them in the right direction at an opportune time. This kind of fact, and there are many of them, forms the inexpungible datum of thought. It is the givenest of givens, datissimum datorum. Thought does not seem to have anything to do with the making of it, although the idealist has another account of the matter. Nor can thought do much in the way of changing these datissima. Footnote, how much thought can do in this matter is an interesting question which we cannot enter into here. End footnote. Not only do they constitute the prime starting point of all scientific problems, but they retain their pristine character throughout the thought process and after thought has done its perfect work. While the ideas and data of secondary order play their game of hide-and-seek with each other, these data of the first order are in the game, but not of it. They give to one lunar hemisphere a primacy, which no terrestrial thought reorganization can give to the other. Now a philosophy which keeps close to experience cannot well ignore this distinction between the two kinds of data. Bow the difference out of the front door by refusing to recognize it under its old style of difference between sensation and idea, and it will come in at the back door unnamed but no less obtrusive. 
Can logic afford to ignore it? If it does not ignore it, can pragmatic logic fix it somewhere, amid this dance of plastic circumstance that it portrays so well, but which the old logic would fain arrest? Can it fix it there without giving up the thorough plasticity of circumstance? End of The Chicago Idea and Idealism by Evander Bradley McGilvery Objects, Data, and Existences, A Reply to Professor McGilvery by John Dewey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Objects, Data, and Existences, A Reply to Professor McGilvery by John Dewey I cannot be otherwise than grateful to Professor McGilvery for the pains he has taken in acquainting himself with my logical analysis and in setting forth his results so clearly and succinctly. Footnote. In his article entitled The Chicago Idea and Idealism, in this journal, volume 5, page 589, in footnote. Gratitude, if nothing else, would lead me to respond to his friendly challenge. Section 1. I begin by quoting almost in toto one section of his criticism, having inserted letters for convenience of subsequent reference to portions involved in the discussion. There is one further difficulty that I wish to lay before Professor Dewey in connection with his new distinction between fact and idea. A. I suppose that most of us accept the other side of the moon as a fact, on a par as fact with this side of it. B. This fact, while as accepted fact, it is on a parity with this side of the moon, yet as experienced fact seems to differ considerably from it. I can see the one. I cannot see the other. There is, after the conclusion is reached that the moon has two hemispheres, a considerable difference in our experience between the two hemispheres, and this difference does not seem to budge however we may pry upon it with changed meanings of terms. The realist, following the ordinary usage, says that while there are two lunar hemispheres, only one can be immediately experienced, and the other is accessible to us only by means of idea. What is pragmatism going to do with this difference? If it ignores it, can it keep peace with science? C. Science makes a thoroughgoing distinction between observation and inference, between empirical facts and scientific constructions upon the basis of facts. What we take to be a satellite, 240,000 miles distant from the planetary Earth may, after all, not prove to be what we think it is. But suppose that such a change in scientific construction should ever take place. D. All is not lost from present scientific fact. There remains the fact that there is a bright something, occasionally in experience, growing from slender crescent to full orb. This fact may come to be interpreted as anything you please and get accepted as that thing but it will be there to be accepted somehow whenever anyone constituted like us opens his eyes and turns them in the right direction at an opportune time. This kind of fact, and there are many of them, forms the inexpungible datum of thought. It is the givenest of givens, datissimum datorum. These data of the first order are in the game, but not of it. They give to one lunar hemisphere a primacy which no terrestrial thought reorganization can give to the other. Now a philosophy which keeps close to experience cannot well ignore this distinction between the two kinds of data. Contradictions confront one in the subject matter of this passage. The natural inference is that they have their source in my position. Is this the case, or do they inhere in the ground taken by my critic? Let me first state the gravamen of the charge brought against me, as briefly and as impartially as may be. I have held that objects accepted at the conclusion of a judgment, the lunar sphere, for instance, issue from a process of judging in which data, brute observational facts, and hypothetical meanings, conceptual ideata, are at once discriminated from and referred to each other, and that they issue in such fashion that the finally accepted object presents both a reorganization of the data through the idea and a verification of the idea through the experimental processes by which a meaning is taken up into the data. Mr. McGilvery holds that this lands me in subjective idealism, for it admits no facts or objects except those into whose constitution ideas have entered. It also puts me in conflict with scientific method, for it ignores data of the first order, which remain the same yesterday, today, and forever, 
so far as any thought reconstruction is concerned. Footnote. Mr. Nunn, in his suggestive aims and achievements of the scientific method, has also criticized the view of hypothesis and its functions set forth in the contributions to logical theory on substantially the same ground. See sections 67 and 68. End footnote. Section 2. My reply, in substance, is 1. That I have not ignored the existence of datissima datorum, that the assertion of their existence antecedent to ideas as such is essential to my theory of the reconstructive nature and work of the reflective process. 2. That my critic confuses such data, wholly non-cognitional, non-logical in character, with data which are in and of judgment, and hence distinctively logical in quality. 3. That he puts himself in conflict with science in ascribing to data of the second kind a higher knowledge value than belongs to the objects which are accepted as the conclusions of judgment. The following discussion, while involving the above propositions, will follow, however, a different order. I shall try to show that in the portions of the citation marked off by the letters B, C, and D, he has repeatedly transferred what holds good in one sort of situation to another sort of situation, and that the difficulties he notes flow not from my position, but from this interchange of propositions, each sound in itself, but so distinctive in meaning and reference as to negate the possibility of such transfer. 1. The lunar sphere. It is suggestive, as we shall see below, that my critic sticks closely to two hemispheres, rather than to one sphere, is related, as stated in B, to the individual's act of recognizing it in a twofold way. Just because the assertion in A is true, viz. that the two hemispheres stand as accepted facts on a parity, the individual in apprehending the single total fact cannot be related to the far and to the near sides in the same way. The statement about the difference in the modes of experiencing the two sides is thus congruous with the acceptance of the object in which a judgment is concluded, and it is congruous only with its acceptance. An analysis of the way a fact is apprehended cannot, by the nature of the case, be made to yield a statement of the nature of that fact which is incompatible with the nature whose method of apprehension is under analysis. I come in the sequel to the question of why I deny I am an idealist, but the gist of the matter lies right here. All idealist epistemologies with which I am acquainted perform exactly the self-contradictory act indicated in the last sentence. There are two alternative ways of interpreting the statement of my critic, that as an experienced fact, the other side of the moon differs from this side, even though it be on a parity as an accepted fact. In one way of interpretation, the fact that only one side can be immediately experienced and the other is accessible to us only by means of idea, refers precisely to the ways in which the different related elements in one complex fact are accessible to us. The proposition has, as its universe of discourse, not the relative cognitional status or respective knowledge values of this side and the other side of the moon, but the mode of our access to elements possessed of the same cognitional value. The other mode of interpretation concludes that because our mode of access is different, therefore the elements to which we have access stand on a different footing. Footnote. The implication in the quoted passage that the fact as immediately experienced occupies a position cognitionally superior to the fact accepted after judgment is somewhat startling in view of Mr. McGilvery's previous criticisms of me on the basis of attributing this notion to me, but of this more anon. End footnote. 2. Let us consider both of these alternatives in relation to Mr. McGilvery's argument. If we take the first, which seems to me perfectly sound, we may discriminate, with respect to the lunar sphere, different relations of the two sides to our manner of apprehension. And from the standpoint of the relation of the moon to our cognizing organism, distinguish the sensory quail of this side from the ideal or suggested quail of the other side. We may even, if we wish to, but I wish nobody wished to, speak of the former qualities as, in this relation, sensations, the latter as ideas, but of course, if we so name them, the facts control the meaning of the names, not the names the character of the facts. 
Sensations mean what Professor McGilvery, in an earlier article, well termed sensa, i.e., qualities of an object in relation to our modes of apprehension. Footnote. This journal, volume 4, page 457. End footnote. It is a disappointment that Mr. McGilvery has not borne in mind, in this article, what he so clearly pointed out before, viz. that the term sensation is an omnibus term. Page 458. If he had done so, he would have realized that in pointing out a fifth passenger in an obscure corner of the coach, in which Mr. McGilvery had already discovered four fellow travelers, I was neither altering the ordinary acceptation of the term, which of the four is the ordinary, I wonder, nor yet denying the existence of the facts to which any one of the other four refers. But in any case, if Mr. McGilvery intended or accepts this alternative interpretation, no inconsistency lies at my door. It is true as an accepted fact of astronomy that the two sides of the moon are on a parity, and it is true as an accepted fact of psychology, or whatever the universe of reference may be, that given this astronomical fact, the experience of apprehending it is related to its two sides in different fashions. If the other interpretation is accepted, then and then only does this side have a certain priority and supremacy over the other side. And only then can Professor McGilvery charge me with ignoring the plain procedure of science. But if he intends and accepts this second alternative, then he uses his analysis of our recognizing experience to discredit scientific knowledge, the conclusion that the two sides stand as hemispheres on a parity. In this case, it turns out to be he, not I, who should be worried about keeping peace with science. For I do not think he will persuade the astronomer to accept a moon which is fact on this side and idea on the other. Green cheese, possibly, but idea never. 3. In the portion designated C, a further confusion comes to view. The difference between the two modes of cognitive access to one fact appears now to be confused with a distinction lying within the process of judging or coming to know, viz. that between observation and inference, empirical facts, and scientific instructions upon them. Again, two alternatives are possible. Either it is meant that this distinction, with superiority resting on the side of observation and empirical facts, holds during the process of judging the real form of the moon, while, that is, we are still in search of an acceptable fact, or it is meant that this quality of values persists after the conclusion is reached, even after the problem of its form is solved. If he means the former, he has no quarrel with me. For it is precisely this antithetical relation of datum and ideatum which I have made the peculiar differentia of judgment in process, as distinct from in conclusion. But if he means the latter, how shall he keep peace with science? For the characteristic of scientific knowledge is that it finds its genuinely acceptable object in the conclusions of a systematic process of inferential inquiry rather than in observations isolated from all inferential matter or an empirical fact set over against rationally organized and explained facts. When doubt as to the objective character occurs or recurs, then of course the antithesis recurs, and then the datum becomes the factual element and the ideatum the hypothetical element. But as long as the conclusion remains unchallenged, so long the object is as the conclusion describes it. Moreover, when there is doubt, and hence when judgment is going on, not concluded, the factual superiority is only of the datum in that judgment over its hypothetically suggested interpretation, not over the accepted facts of scientific conclusions as such. For the entire process of re-coordinating the raw data rests upon the acceptance of a whole system of other facts, not questioned simultaneously, which are conclusions of other judgments in which thought has intervened. Or, in the passage marked D, the issue shifts to what seems to be a more tenable position. Up to this point, my critic has assumed the hemispherical quality of this side of the moon to be a given empirical fact from which the hemisphericity of the other side is an inference. If we had any direct knowledge that this side of the moon is a hemisphere, the conclusion that the other side is a hemisphere might adorn an exposition of Kant's analytic judgments or enliven a treatise on immediate inference, but it would not illuminate the history of astronomy. Of course, the inference is that the moon is a sphere, the hemisphere character of both sides being involved in this conclusion. 
This obvious fact is indicated in Mr. McGilvary's reference to the bright something occasionally in experience growing from slender crescent to full orb as the primary datum. The substitution of this statement for the hemispherical character of this side only strengthens, however, it may be truly replied, Mr. McGilvary's argument, for here at last are indeed datissima datorum. But how does this bear down on me? I have insisted, much to my discredit among objective idealists, that there are non-logical antecedents for every specific reflective situation, and that all reflective situations are specific, so that knowledge involving thought is occasioned by non-reflective or alogical, practical factors in an antecedent experience. Footnote. I may remark in passing that some of the criticisms made against this position from the side of the objective idealists would not have been made if it had been seen that my position does not demand that the prior situation as prior should be non-reflective per se, but only as calling out thought, that it does this in virtue of a clash or conflict which itself is wholly non-reflective, no matter how reflective the situation in which it is found. End footnote. I ask for no better proof of the hold of intellectualistic epistemology upon current thought then is afforded by the fact that the position that thought operates in all judging processes, and hence is embodied in all judgment conclusions, has seemed to so many critics to involve an idealistic theory of the nature of existence. Footnote. Professor McGilvery incidentally questions the use of the term rationalism in my later writings. I do not recall how extensive that use is, but I plead guilty. Rationalism is too closely associated with free thought or free criticism on one hand, and with the antithesis to empiricism on the other, to be conveniently used as a term to designate intellectualism as against pragmatism. For pragmatism may be rationalistic in the first sense, while empiricism may be, sensational empiricism has been, as intellectualistic as any rationalistic theory. End footnote. It would, if to exist and to be subject matter or result of cognition were equivalent terms. But the very denial of intellectualism claims that to exist, to exist even as matter of experience, is not to be identified with the status of a cognized something, whether during judgment or as its conclusion. And this mode of existence furnishes me, as well as Professor McGilvery, an impregnable fortress, a givenness of givens. If to believe in it makes him a realist, then it also makes me one. If there be a difference between us, it must be in the character assigned the prior factor. What is the nature of what happens whenever one constituted like us opens his eyes and turns them in the right direction? Italics mine. So that a crescent or an orb is seen. I say that what happens has the nature of an act, that it exists as an act. I have said that while the act may be cognitive, that is, exercise an influence upon further knowledge, it is not itself properly called cognition. Footnote. Aside from the question of fact, a dialectical difficulty should perhaps, to avoid misapprehension, be referred to. It may be said that I am assuming the primary data are here known, or may be known as acts, and hence I have myself reduced them either to data undergoing interpretation, or else to accepted objects of judgment. This objection, so frequently made, shows again the domination of the intellectualistic assumption. My position is that the term experience denotes primarily a mode of existence. Experience may exist as an act of a certain specific quality, and that does not have to be reduplicated as knowledge in order to possess the character which it has. As for the other objection frequently made, that this reference to an act is pure individualism, I only want here to point out that it is in the critic's assumption, not mine, that an act such as seeing is something attached to or possessed by an individual. As I see it, the individual is within, not without, the act, and within it as only one of its factors. End footnote. What does Professor McGilvery say? If he says that it is a mode or content or object of knowledge, qua knowledge, what relation does its content bear to the datum in judgment? Is it identical with the former? Are the heavens and the furniture of the earth which we see when we open our eyes and turn our heads the same thing as those isolated, selective data of observation which the astronomer accepts as given, and works upon in figuring out the shape of the moon? Then is the rational or objective idealist lying in wait to swallow up Professor McGilvery by his simple method of pointing out the merely particular, merely observational, i.e. sensible, 
merely fragmentary, chaotic, lawless character of such data, and the necessity of conceptual or thought relations to organize such brute trivialities into our significant world of related objects. Or, on the other hand, does Professor McGilvery mean that looking and seeing things is knowledge par excellence, that it represents the cognitional function at its best? Then how does he keep peace with science? How does he avoid the conclusion that scientific knowledge is a hoax, an intentional arbitrary perversion of or declension from what we already know in a better, truer way? But, on the other hand, if it be admitted that what occurs when one, constituted as we are, uses his organs in accordance with their own structure is not knowledge at all, in any intellectual or scientific sense of that term, we are free to admit the primary existence of something with respect to any and all thinking, and at the same time free to admit that when the standpoint of knowledge as knowledge is once taken, the conclusions of systematized inference have a status superior to any other determinations. This, I hope, at least answers the question of Professor McGilvery as to what I mean when I say I do not conceive my position to be idealistic. I do not think it requires thought to see and to hear any more than it does to digest. Though I also think that after thought has intervened, such an action may be performed better, more economically and effectively, and also more chaotically and wastefully, to say nothing of its results, having an infinitely more precious value. Section 3. Professor McGilvery inquires whether I am not, in any case, an idealist in the current sense of idealism, a sense which he states as follows, the theory which regards all reality as embraced within experiences or within experience. He adds a clear, unambiguous answer by Professor Dewey to the question whether he is an idealist in the current sense as defined above would, I am sure, make his view much more intelligible. Ah, my dear questioner. I am tempted to reply there are certain prerequisite conditions for a clear and unambiguous answer, namely that the question be clear and unambiguous. What is meant by embraced? Is it to have an existential meaning? That some thing called experience holds physically or metaphysically other things in its embrace? Then I do not accept the theory. Or is its meaning methodological, that philosophy like science proceeds intelligibly and fruitfully to verifiable results only by taking experienced, not transcendental things, and by discussing them in the characters they empirically possess, not in the characters which, according to some a priori method, they ought to possess. In that case, my answer might be affirmative, coupled with the admission that I know shamefully little about all reality, since my empiricism is precisely that the only realities I do know anything about, or ever shall know anything about, are just experienced realities for I do not suppose the phrase all reality was a trap laid for me. Again, would not a clear and unambiguous definition of experience be both a boon in general and a prerequisite to a clear and unambiguous answer to the question asked? In neither of the two senses of experience, which Mr. McGilvery expressly sets forth on page 595, can I answer the question affirmatively? In the sense in which he uses the term on his next page, in the passage quoted, but without defining it, my answer would probably be affirmative. But in that case I am confused, for Professor McGilvery says that view is realism, and a reply that made me out both realist and idealist at the same time might not strike anybody as clear and unambiguous. But perhaps if Mr. McGilvery should make explicit the sense in which he uses the word experienced when he talks, for example, about our experience of the moon as changing from crescent to full orb, and should contrast that with his use of experience in the instance of the perceived stone, he would discover a vital and pregnant meaning of experience which would reveal that he and I, as human beings, are much alike in what we mean by experience. And in that case, I am quite willing to leave it to my critic by what names he and I are to be labeled. End of Objects, Data, and Existences, A Reply to Professor McGilvery by John Dewey The Reflex Arc Concept in Psychology by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Reflex Arc Concept in Psychology by John Dewey. That the greater demand for a unifying principle and controlling working hypothesis in psychology should come at just the time when all generalizations and classifications are most questioned and questionable is natural enough. 
It is the very cumulation of discrete facts creating the demand for unification that also breaks down previous lines of classification. The material is too great in mass and too varied in style to fit into existing pigeonholes, and the cabinets of science break of their own dead weight. The idea of the reflex arc has upon the whole come nearer to meeting this demand for a general working hypothesis than any other single concept. It being admitted that the sensory motor apparatus represents both the unit of nerve structure and the type of nerve functioning, the image of this relationship passed over into psychology and became an organizing principle to hold together the multiplicity of fact. In criticizing this conception, it is not intended to make a plea for the principle of explanation and classification which the reflex arc idea has replaced, but on the contrary, to urge that they are not sufficiently displaced, and that in the idea of the sensory motor circuit, conceptions of the nature of sensation and of action derived from the nominally displaced psychology are still in control. The older dualism between sensation and idea is repeated in the current dualism of peripheral and central structures and functions. The older dualism of body and soul finds a distinct echo in the current dualism of stimulus and response. Instead of interpreting the character of sensation, idea, and action from their place and function in the sensory motor circuit, we still incline to interpret the latter from our preconceived and preformulated ideas of rigid distinctions between sensations, thoughts, and acts. The sensory stimulus is one thing, the central activity standing for the idea is another thing, and the motor discharge standing for the act proper is a third. As a result, the reflex arc is not a comprehensive or organic unity, but a patchwork of disjointed parts, a mechanical conjunction of unallied processes. What is needed is that the principle underlying the idea of the reflex arc as the fundamental psychical unity shall react into and determine the values of its constitutive factors. More specifically, what is wanted is that sensory stimulus, central connections, and motor responses shall be viewed not as separate and complete entities in themselves, but as divisions of labor, functioning factors within the single concrete whole now designated the reflex arc. What is the reality so designated? What shall we term that which is not sensation followed by idea followed by movement, but which is primary, which is, as it were, the psychical organism of which sensation, idea, and movement are the chief organs? Stated on the physiological side, this reality may most conveniently be termed coordination. This is the essence of the facts held together by and subsumed under the reflex arc concept. Let us take for our example the familiar child candle instance. James, Psychology, Volume 1, page 25. The ordinary interpretation would say the sensation of light is a stimulus to the grasping as a response. The burn resulting is a stimulus to withdrawing the hand as a response, and so on. There is, of course, no doubt that is a rough practical way of representing the process. But when we ask for its psychological adequacy, the case is quite different. Upon analysis, we find that we begin not with a sensory stimulus, but with a sensory motor coordination, the optical ocular, and that in a certain sense it is the movement which is primary and the sensation which is secondary, the movement of the body, head, and eye muscles determining the quality of what is experienced. In other words, the real beginning is with the act of seeing. It is looking and not a sensation of light. The sensory quail gives the value of the act, just as the movement furnishes its mechanism and control, but both sensation and movement lie inside, not outside the act. Now if this act, the seeing, stimulates another act, the reaching, it is because both of these acts fall within a larger coordination, because seeing and grasping have been so often bound together to reinforce each other, to help each other out that each may be considered practically a subordinate member of a bigger coordination. More specifically, the ability of the hand to do its work will depend, either directly or indirectly, upon its control, as well as its stimulation, by the act of vision. If the sight did not inhibit as well as excite the reaching, the latter would be purely indeterminate. 
it would be for anything or nothing, not for the particular object seen. The reaching, in turn, must both stimulate and control the seeing. The eye must be kept upon the candle if the arm is to do its work. Let it wander, and the arm takes up another task. In other words, we now have an enlarged and transformed coordination. The act is seeing no less than before, but it is now seeing for reaching purposes. There is still a sensory motor circuit, one with more content or value, not the substitution of a motor response for a sensory stimulus. Footnote. See The Psychological Review for May, 1896, page 253, for an excellent statement and illustration by Mr. Engel and Moore of this mutuality of stimulation. End footnote. Now take the affairs at its next stage, that in which the child gets burned. It is hardly necessary to point out again that this is also a sensory motor coordination and not a mere sensation. It is worthwhile, however, to note especially the fact that it is simply the completion or fulfillment of the previous eye-arm-hand coordination and not an entirely new occurrence. Only because the heat pain quail enters into the same circuit of experience with the optical, ocular, and muscular quails does the child learn from the experience and get the ability to avoid the experience in the future. More technically stated, the so-called response is not merely to the stimulus, it is into it. The burn is the original seeing, the original optical ocular experience enlarged and transformed in its value. It is no longer mere seeing. It is seeing of a light that means pain when contact occurs. The ordinary reflex arc theory proceeds upon the more or less tacit assumption that the outcome of the response is a totally new experience. That it is, say, the substitution of a burn sensation for a light sensation through the intervention of motion. The fact is that the sole meaning of the intervening movement is to maintain, reinforce, or transform, as the case may be, the original quail. That we do not have the replacing of one sort of experience by another, but the development, or as it seems convenient to term it, the mediation of an experience. The seeing, in a word, remains to control the reaching, and is, in turn, interpreted by the burning. Footnote. See, for a further statement of mediation, my syllabus of ethics, page 15. End footnote. The discussion up to this point may be summarized by saying that the reflex arc idea, as commonly employed, is defective in that it assumes sensory stimulus and motor response as distinct psychical existences, while in reality they are always inside a coordination and have their significance purely from the part played in maintaining or reconstituting the coordination. And secondly, in assuming that the quail of experience which precedes the motor phase and that which succeeds it are two different states, instead of the last being always the first reconstituted, the motor phase coming in only for the sake of such mediation. The result is that the reflex arc idea leaves us with a disjointed psychology, whether viewed from the standpoint of development in the individual or in the race, or from that of the analysis of the mature consciousness. As to the former, in its failure to see that the arc of which it talks is virtually a circuit, a continual reconstitution, it breaks continuity and leaves us nothing but a series of jerks, the origin of each jerk to be sought outside the process of experience itself, in either an external pressure of environment or else in an unaccountable spontaneous variation from within the soul or the organism. Footnote. It is not too much to say that the whole controversy in biology regarding the source of variation, represented by Wiseman and Spencer respectively, arises from the beginning with stimulus and response, instead of with the coordination with reference to which stimulus and response are functional divisions of labor. The same may be said, on the psychological side, of the controversy between the Wundtian apperceptionists and their opponents. Each has a disjectum membrum of the same organic whole, whichever is selected being an arbitrary matter of personal taste. End footnote. As to the latter, failing to see the unity of activity, no matter how much it may prate of unity, 
it still leaves us with sensation or peripheral stimulus, idea or central process, the equivalent of attention, and motor response or act as three disconnected existences having to be somehow adjusted to each other, whether through the intervention of an extra experimental soul or by mechanical push and pull. Before proceeding to a consideration of the general meaning for psychology of the summary, it may be well to give another descriptive analysis, as the value of the statement depends entirely upon the universality of its range of application. For such an instance, we may conveniently take Baldwin's analysis of the reactive consciousness. In this, there are, he says, feeling and will, page 60, three elements corresponding to the three elements of the nervous arc. First, the receiving consciousness, the stimulus, say a loud, unexpected sound. Second, the attention involuntarily drawn, the registering element. And third, the muscular reaction following upon the sound, say flight from fancied danger. Now in the first place, such an analysis is incomplete. It ignores the status prior to hearing the sound. Of course, if this status is irrelevant to what happens afterwards, such ignoring is quite legitimate. But is it irrelevant, either to the quantity or the quality of the stimulus? If one is reading a book, if one is hunting, if one is watching in a dark place on a lonely night, if one is performing a chemical experiment, in each case, the noise has a very different psychical value. It is a different experience. In any case, what precedes the stimulus is a whole act, a sensory motor coordination. What is more to the point? The stimulus emerges out of this coordination. It is born from it as its matrix. It represents, as it were, an escape from it. I might here fall back upon authority and refer to the widely accepted sensation continuum theory, according to which the sound cannot be absolutely ex abrupto from the outside, but is simply a shifting of focus of emphasis, a redistribution of tensions within the former act, and declare that unless the sound activity had been present to some extent in the prior coordination, it would be impossible for it now to come to prominence in consciousness. And such a reference would be only an amplification of what has already been said concerning the way in which the prior activity influences the value of the sound sensation. Or we might point to cases of hypnotism, monoideism, and absent-mindedness, like that of Archimedes, as evidences that if the previous coordination is such as rigidly to lock the door, the auditory disturbance will knock in vain for admission to consciousness. Or, to speak more truly in the metaphor, the auditory activity must already have one foot over the threshold if it is ever to gain admittance. But it will be more satisfactory, probably, to refer to the biological side of the case and point out that as the ear activity has been evolved on account of the advantage gained by the whole organism, it must stand in the strictest histological and physiological connection with the eye, or hand, or leg, or whatever other organ has been the overt center of action. It is absolutely impossible to think of the eye center as monopolizing consciousness, and the ear apparatus as wholly quiescent. What happens is a certain relative prominence and subsidence as between the various organs which maintain the organic equilibrium. Furthermore, the sound is not a mere stimulus or mere sensation. It again is an act, that of hearing. The muscular response is involved in this as well as sensory stimulus. That is, there is a certain definite set of the motor apparatus involved in hearing just as much as there is in subsequent running away. The movement and posture of the head, the tension of the ear muscles, are required for the reception of the sound. It is just as true to say that the sensation of sound arises from a motor response as that the running away is a response to the sound. This may be brought out by reference to the fact that Professor Baldwin, in the passage quoted, has inverted the real order as between his first and second elements. We do not have first a sound and then activity of attention unless sound is taken as mere nervous shock or physical event, not as conscious value. The conscious sensation of sound depends upon the motor response having already taken place. Or, in terms of the previous statement, if stimulus is used as a conscious fact and not as a mere physical event, 
It is the motor response or attention which constitutes that which finally becomes the stimulus to another act. Once more, the final element, the running away, is not merely motor, but is sensory motor, having its sensory value and its muscular mechanism. It is also a coordination. And finally, this sensory motor coordination is not a new act, supervening upon what preceded. Just as the response is necessary to constitute the stimulus, to determine it as sound and as this kind of sound, of wild beast or robber, so the sound experience must persist as a value in the running, to keep it up, to control it. The motor reaction involved in the running is, once more, into, not merely to, the sound. It occurs to change the sound, to get rid of it. The resulting quail, whatever it may be, has its meaning wholly determined by reference to the hearing of the sound. It is that experience mediated. Footnote. In other words, every reaction is of the same type as that which Professor Baldwin ascribes to imitation alone, viz. circular. Imitation is simply that particular form of the circuit in which the response lends itself to comparatively unchanged maintenance of the prior experience. I say comparatively unchanged, for as far as this maintenance means additional control over the experience, it is being psychically changed, becoming more distinct. It is safe to suppose, moreover, that the repetition is kept up only so long as this growth or mediation goes on. There is the new in the old, if it is only the new sense of power. End footnote. What we have is a circuit, not an arc or broken segment of a circle. This circuit is more truly termed organic than reflex, because the motor response determines the stimulus, just as truly a sensory stimulus determines movement. Indeed, the movement is only for the sake of determining the stimulus, of fixing what kind of stimulus it is, of interpreting it. I hope it will not appear that I am introducing needless refinements and distinctions into what, it may be urged, is, after all, an undoubted fact, that movement as response follows sensation as stimulus. It is not a question of making the account of the process more complicated, though it is always wise to beware of that false simplicity, which is reached by leaving out of account a large part of the problem. It is a question of finding out what stimulus or sensation what movement and response mean? A question of seeing that they mean distinctions of flexible function only, not of fixed existence. That one and the same occurrence plays either or both parts, according to the shift of interest. And that because of this functional distinction and relationship, the supposed problem of the adjustment of one to the other, whether by superior force in the stimulus or an agency ad hoc in the center or the soul, is a purely self-created problem. We may see the disjointed character of the present theory by calling to mind that it is impossible to apply the phrase sensory motor to the occurrence as a simple phrase of description. It has validity only as a term of interpretation, only, that is, as defining various functions exercised. In terms of description, the whole process may be sensory or it may be motor, but it cannot be sensory motor. The stimulus, the excitation of the nerve ending and of the sensory nerve, the central change, are just as much, or just as little, as the events taking place in the motor nerve and the muscles. It is one, uninterrupted, continuous redistribution of mass and motion. And there is nothing in the process, from the standpoint of description, which entitles us to call this reflex. It is redistribution, pure and simple as much so as the burning of a log, or the falling of a house, or the movement of the wind. In the physical process, as physical, there is nothing which can be set off as stimulus, nothing which reacts, nothing which is response. There is just a change in the system of tensions. The same sort of thing is true when we describe the process purely from the psychical side. It is now all sensation, all sensory quail, the motion, as psychically described, is just as much sensation as is sound or light or burn. Take the withdrawing of the hand from the candle flame as example. What we have is a certain visual heat pain muscular quail, transformed into another visual touch muscular quail. 
the flame now being visible only at a distance, or not at all, the touch sensation being altered, etc. If we symbolize the original visual quail by V, the temperature by H, the accompanying muscular sensation by M, the whole experience may be stated as VHM dash VHM dash VHM prime, M being the quail of withdrawing, M prime the sense of the status after the withdrawal. The motion is not a certain kind of existence. It is a sort of sensory experience interpreted, just as is candle flame or burn from candle flame. All are on par. But in spite of all this, it will be urged there is a distinction between stimulus and response, between sensation and motion. Precisely, but we ought now to be in a condition to ask of what nature is the distinction, instead of taking it for granted as a distinction somehow lying in the existence of the facts themselves. We ought to be able to see that the ordinary conception of the reflex arc theory, instead of being a case of plain science, is a survival of the metaphysical dualism, first formulated by Plato, according to which the sensation is an ambiguous dweller on the borderland of soul and body. The idea or central process is purely psychical, and the act or movement purely physical. Thus the reflex arc formulation is neither physical or physiological nor psychological. It is a mixed materialistic spiritualistic assumption. If the previous descriptive analysis has made obvious the need of a reconsideration of the reflex arc idea, of the nest of difficulties and assumptions in the apparently simple statement, it is now time to undertake an explanatory analysis. The fact is that stimulus and response are not distinctions of existence, but teleological distinctions, that is, distinctions of function or part played with reference to reaching or maintaining an end. With respect to this teleological process, two stages should be discriminated, as their confusion is one cause of the confusion attending the whole matter. In one case, the relation represents an organization of means with reference to a comprehensive end. It represents an accomplished adaptation. Such is the case in all well-developed instincts, as when we say that the contact of eggs is a stimulus to the hen to set, or the sight of corn a stimulus to pick. Such also is the case with all thoroughly formed habits, as when the contact with the floor stimulates walking. In these instances, there is no question of consciousness of stimulus as stimulus, of response as response. There is simply a continuously ordered sequence of acts, all adapted in themselves and in the order of their sequence to reach a certain objective end, the reproduction of the species, the preservation of life, locomotion to a certain place. The end has got thoroughly organized into the means. In calling one stimulus another response, we mean nothing more than that such an orderly sequence of acts is taking place. The same sort of statement might be made equally well with reference to the succession of changes in a plant so far as these are considered with reference to their adaptation to, say, producing seed. It is equally applicable to the series of events in the circulation of the blood or the sequence of acts occurring in a self-binding reaper. Footnote. To avoid misapprehension, I would say that I am not raising the question as to how far this teleology is real in any one of these cases. Real or unreal, my point holds equally well. It is only when we regard the sequence of acts as if they were adapted to reach some end that it occurs to us to speak of one as stimulus and the other as response. Otherwise, we look at them as a mere series. End footnote. Regarding such cases of organization viewed as already attained, we may say positively that it is only the assumed common reference to an inclusive end which marks each member off as stimulus and response, that apart from such reference we have only antecedent and consequent. Footnote. Whether even in such a determination there is still not a reference of a more latent kind to an end is, of course, left open. End footnote. In other words, the distinction is one of interpretation. Negatively, it must be pointed out that it is not legitimate to carry over without change 
exactly the same order of considerations to cases where it is a question of conscious stimulation and response. We may, in the above case, regard, if we please, stimulus and response, each as an entire act, having an individuality of its own, subject even here to the qualification that individuality means not an entirely independent whole, but a division of labor as regards maintaining or reaching an end. But in any case, it is an act, a sensory motor coordination, which stimulates the response, itself in turn sensory motor, not a sensation which stimulates a movement. Hence the illegitimacy of identifying, as is so often done, such cases of organized instincts or habits with the so-called reflex arc, or of transferring, without modification, considerations valid of this serial coordination of acts to the sensation movement case. The fallacy that arises when this is done is virtually the psychological or historical fallacy. A set of considerations which hold good only because of a completed process is read into the content of the process which conditions this completed result. A state of things characterizing an outcome is regarded as a true description of the events which led up to this outcome, when, as a matter of fact, if this outcome had already been in existence, there would have been no necessity for the process. Or, to make the application to the case in hand, considerations valid of an attained organization or coordination, the orderly sequence of minor acts in a comprehensive coordination, are used to describe a process, viz. the distinction of mere sensation as stimulus and of mere movement as a response, which takes place only because such an attained organization is no longer at hand, but is in process of constitution. Neither mere sensation nor mere movement can ever be either stimulus or response. Only an act can be that. The sensation as stimulus means the lack of and search for such an objective stimulus, or orderly placing of an act. Just as mere movement as response means the lack of and search for the right act to complete a given coordination. A recurrence to our example will make these formulae clearer. As long as the seeing is an unbroken act, which, as experienced, is no more sensation than it is mere motion, though the onlooker or psychological observer may interpret it into sensation and movement, it is in no sense the sensation which stimulates the reaching. We have, as already sufficiently indicated, only the serial steps in a coordination of acts. But now take a child who, upon reaching for bright light, that is, exercising the seeing-reaching coordination, has sometimes had a delightful exercise, sometimes found something good to eat, and sometimes burned himself. Now the response is not only uncertain, but the stimulus is equally uncertain. One is uncertain only insofar as the other is. The real problem may be equally well stated as either to discover the right stimulus, to constitute the stimulus, or to discover to constitute the response. The question of whether to reach or to abstain from reaching is the question, what sort of a bright light have we here? Is it the one which means playing with one's hands, eating milk, or burning one's fingers? The stimulus must be constituted for the response to occur. Now it is at precisely this juncture, and because of it, that the distinction of sensation as stimulus and motion as response arises. The sensation or conscious stimulus is not a thing or existence by itself. It is that phase of a coordination requiring attention because, by reason of the conflict within the coordination, it is uncertain how to complete it. It is to doubt as to the next act, whether to reach or no, which gives the motive to examining the act. The end to follow is, in this sense, the stimulus. It furnishes the motivation to attend to what has just taken place, to define it more carefully. From this point of view, the discovery of the stimulus is the response to possible movement as stimulus. We must have an anticipatory sensation, an image of the movements that may occur, together with their respective values, before attention will go to the seeing, to break it up as a sensation of light, and of light of this particular kind. It is the initiated activities of reaching, which, inhibited by the conflict in the coordination, 
turn round, as it were, upon the seeing, and hold it from passing over into further act until its quality is determined. Just here, the act as objective stimulus becomes transformed into sensation as possible, as conscious stimulus. Just here also, motion as conscious response emerges. In other words, sensation as stimulus does not mean any particular psychical existence. It means simply a function, and will have its value shift according to the special work requiring to be done. At one moment the various activities of reaching and withdrawing will be the sensation, because they are that phase of activity which sets the problem, or creates the demand for the next act. At the next moment the previous act of seeing will furnish the sensation, being in turn that phase of activity which sets the pace upon which depends further action. Generalized, sensation as stimulus is always that phase of activity requiring to be defined in order that a coordination may be completed. What the sensation will be in particular at a given time therefore will depend entirely upon the way in which an activity is being used. It has no fixed quality of its own. The search for the stimulus is the search for exact conditions of action, that is, for the state of things which decides how a beginning coordination should be completed. Similarly, motion as response has only a functional value. It is whatever will serve to complete the disintegrating coordination. Just as the discovery of the sensation marks the establishing of the problem, so the constitution of the response marks the solution of this problem. At one time, fixing attention, holding the eye fixed, upon the seeing, and thus bringing out a certain quail of light, is the response, because that is the particular act called for just then. At another time, the movement of the arm away from the light is the response. There is nothing in itself which may be labeled response. That one certain set of sensory quails should be marked off by themselves as motion and put in antithesis to such sensory quails as those of color, sound, and contact as legitimate claimants to the title of sensation is wholly inexplicable unless we keep the difference of function in view. It is the eye and ear sensations which fix for us the problem, which report to us the conditions which have to be met if the coordination is to be successfully completed. And just the moment we need to know about our movements to get an adequate report, just that moment, motion miraculously, from the ordinary standpoint, ceases to be motion and becomes muscular sensation. On the other hand, take the change in the values of experience, the transformation of sensory quails. Whether this change will or will not be interpreted as movement, whether or not any consciousness of movement will arise, will depend upon whether this change is satisfactory, whether or not it is regarded as a harmonious development of a coordination, or whether the change is regarded as simply a means in solving a problem, an instrument in reaching a more satisfactory coordination. So long as our experience runs smoothly, we are no more conscious of motion as motion than we are of this or that color or sound by itself. To sum up, the distinction of sensation and movement as stimulus and response respectively is not a distinction which can be regarded as descriptive of anything which holds of psychical events or existences as such. The only events to which the terms stimulus and response can be descriptively applied are to minor acts serving by their respective positions to the maintenance of some organized coordination. The conscious stimulus or sensation and the conscious response or motion have a special genesis or motivation and a special end or function. The reflex arc theory, by neglecting, by abstracting from this genesis and this function gives us one disjointed part of a process as if it were the whole. It gives us literally an arc instead of the circuit, and not giving us the circuit of which it is an arc does not enable us to place, to center the arc. This arc, again, falls apart into two separate existences, having to be either mechanically or externally adjusted to each other. The circle is a coordination, some of whose members have come into conflict with each other. It is the temporary disintegration and need of reconstitution which occasions, which affords the genesis of, the conscious distinction into sensory stimulus on one side and motor response on the other. 
The stimulus is that phase of the forming coordination which represents the conditions which have to be met in bringing it to a successful issue. The response is that phase of one and the same forming coordination which gives the key to meeting these conditions, which serves as instrument in effecting the successful coordination. They are therefore strictly correlative and contemporaneous. The stimulus is something to be discovered, to be made out. If the activity affords its own adequate stimulation, there is no stimulus save in the objective sense already referred to. As soon as it is adequately determined, then, and only then, is the response also complete. To attain either means that the coordination has completed itself. Moreover, it is the motor response which assists in discovering and constituting the stimulus. It is the holding of the movement at a certain stage which creates the sensation, which throws it into relief. It is the coordination which unifies that which the reflex arc concept gives us only in disjointed fragments. It is the circuit within which fall distinctions of stimulus and response as functional phases of its own mediation or completion. The point of the story is in its application, but the application of it to the question of the nature of psychical evolution, to the distinction between sensational and rational consciousness, and the nature of judgment must be deferred to a more favorable opportunity. End of The Reflex Arc Concept in Psychology by John Dewey Prolegomena to a Tentative Realism by Evander Bradley McGilvery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prolegomena to a Tentative Realism by Evander Bradley McGilvery. In an article recently published in this journal, footnote, The Stream of Consciousness, Volume 4, page 225, end footnote. I tried to show that psychology presupposes an awareness distinct from the objects of awareness, and that this awareness is aware of itself as aware, as well as aware of what are usually called objects. In some subsequent article, I hope to examine the arguments brought forward to disprove the existence of such an awareness. But meanwhile, I shall assume that there is such a thing as awareness distinct from objects, and proceed to examine the bearing of this fact provisionally assumed upon the tenability of realism. Let me begin with a typical experience. Suppose that while I am having an experience of red, say of a postage stamp on my desk, my attention is distracted by a disturbance outdoors, and that I turn my head away from the desk to look out the window. Meanwhile, a friend with whom I have been discussing the stamp keeps his eyes fixed on it. Presently I return to the interrupted discussion, look again toward the desk, and thus get the red a second time as object of awareness. And when I do so, I am also aware that there has been an interval during which the red has not been an object of consciousness. My friend, however, informs me that he has been examining the stamp all the time that I was diverted by the dogfight. In view of his assurance, I now think of the red as having been a fact in his experience when it was not in mine. It existed as red when it was not in my experience as one of the immediate objects of that experience. It was red in spite of the fact that it was not red for me, red for my awareness. I thus distinguish between red for my consciousness and red that was not for my consciousness, while yet it was red. The red existed in independence of my consciousness. Of course, in this case I have described, the red, while it was not found in my experience, was an object of another's experience. Now let us proceed to another case, where both that other person and I myself cease to see the red, and even to think of it. We, too, go out of the room, and as we depart, a third person enters, sees the stamp, and subsequently joining us, tells us what he saw. Still again, a fourth person reports to us that he saw the stamp when he was alone in the study, and that he has just come from the study, leaving no one behind. We begin conversation on other matters, and half an hour later someone says, but about that stamp, 
and enters upon a philatelic disquisition, which, as Mr. Kipling would say, is another story. Our present interest is in the red of that stamp during the half hour when, so far as anyone knows, no consciousness gave it a visible means of support. Was there any red in that interval? Or does the assertion that there was mean merely that if anyone had been in the study, there would have been a red for him? If I were to say that what can exist apart from my consciousness, and also apart from the consciousness of B, and of C, and of D, must also exist apart from all consciousness, I would be told that I was committing a gross fallacy. The rebuke would be deserved. And yet logic does not forbid us to conceive the possibility of the truth of a dictum simpliciter when the dictum secundum quid is true. It merely forbids the passage from the latter as premise to the former as foregone conclusion. The latter is not proved by the former, but surely no logician would dare say that it is disproved thereby. The truth of the dictum simpliciter remains an open question with a meaning. If so, why may I not say that there is meaning in the question whether the red of the stamp, when no one sees it, is still red? A thing that has a way of passing from one consciousness to another, and of presenting itself to several consciousnesses at the same time, arouses the suspicion of being independent of any consciousness. Footnote. To obviate misunderstanding at the outset, I wish to say that by independence I do not mean what Professor Royce understands the thoroughgoing realist to mean by independence. Professor Royce maintains that the resolute realist is committed to the view that if a meteor is real in his realistic sense, its mass, extension, or other primary qualities would remain real if there never were any knowledge in the world. The World and the Individual, First Series, page 200. This may be true of certain realisms, but in regard to such I agree with Professor Royce that if their realistic definition of being is simply and rigidly applied, it destroys its own entire realm, denies its own presuppositions, and shows us as its one unquestionable domain the meaningless wilderness of absolute nothingness. But the realism which I am trying to study out in its ultimate implications is not a realism that tells us what would be the character of a world in which there is no consciousness anywhere throughout its whole temporal and spatial extent. It speaks of this world of ours, which has consciousness in it, seemingly as a function of certain brain states. By the independence of an object, I do not mean that the object would exist if this world were mindless from start to finish assuming there be start or finish. If this world were from everlasting to everlasting without mind as a constituent part of it, it would be so different from what it is that I do not know whether with the absence of mind there might not also be the absence of everything else. At any rate, the most confident assurance I can allow myself to entertain about such a world is that in it there would be no realist to make absurd philosophical statements in unreal conditional propositions, and no Professor Royce to point out these absurdities with consummate dialectical skill. Definitively, therefore, I refuse to discuss the philosophy of such a mindless world. If I were so foolish, Professor Royce would in this world show up the folly, as folly goes in this world, for his dialectic in this matter is relentless. In this paper I am speaking of this world, where I believe that there are minds, or consciousnesses, at least in spots, and where the question is whether there are any objects existing in other spots. More specifically, the independence spoken of in this paper is temporal independence, not absolute independence. By temporal independence, again, I mean existence at a time when there is no awareness of what thus exists. Of course, what is thus temporally independent is, in another sense, temporally dependent, i.e. in the sense that being in the same time, though not at the same time, there is relation between the awareness existing at one time and the object existing at another time, which relation can be expressed in terms of logical dependence. I venture to think that such a conception of being does not fall under any one of the four historical conceptions of being, which Professor Royce discusses with such power and persuasiveness. But at the same time, I believe that this conception of being is an historical conception, older than any of the others, and more persistent. Perhaps it is too naive to be treated of in Gifford lectures.
End footnote. But of course, the opponent of realism will not let me off so easily. He would reply that I beg the whole question in saying that the same object presents itself to several consciousnesses and passes from one consciousness to another. He would say that it is of the very essence of red to be perceived. Red is a perception and nothing but a perception, and that is the end of it. Its essay is per kippy, and there are as many reds as there are awarenesses of it. The obvious reply to such a statement is that saying so does not make it so. The view that the essay of color is per kippy is not prima facie the true view. The plain man, unsophisticated by science and by philosophy, does not see in the essence of red anything that involves the necessity of its being perceived in order to be. Of course, the plain man's view is not final in this matter any more than in any other matter. But his naive attitude shows that it is a perfectly possible feat of thought to regard red as capable of independent existence, and that there is nothing in red as it is seen which points incontrovertibly to its subjectivity. The belief in the subjective character of red is a thing that has had a history, and fortunately we can examine the reasons that have led to the present widespread opinion among scientists and philosophers that red cannot be read except when there is an awareness of it. In one important point, the matter is on all fours with the Copernican theory of astronomy. This theory is not proved these days by saying that it is the essence of the sun to be the center of the solar system, nor is it proved by saying that all learned people believe it to be the center of that system. The theory is proved by just the very arguments that have led the learned to their belief. Anyone is at liberty to examine these arguments. And if he sees a flaw in them, he can afford to dispute the conclusion. Fortunately, the same thing is true of the arguments for the subjectivity of colors and temperatures and everything else that is now the fashion to regard as definitively subjective. The arguments are matters of history, known and read of all men. If these arguments are not cogent, then no appeal to the essence of red as a mere perception or to the common belief of the initiated, will convince anyone who is not joined to the idols of essential forms or to the idols of the marketplace. These arguments I propose to examine in subsequent articles, but before doing this, I wish to do two things. First, to examine two sophistries which have been very common in discussions of realism. Second, to discuss the possible meanings of the term sensation and to fix these meanings by the use of distinctive terms so that unnecessary confusion may not result in the treatment of what is at best an intricate problem. The first sophistry that I wish to expose is that which attributes to the realist the assumption of two numerically different objects, the perceived object and the unperceived object, lying forever beyond the field of awareness. I think that I have shown that except for those who will appeal, as to a final tribunal, to the essence of red as involving its presence to awareness, there is meaning in the question whether red can exist when not perceived. Now I wish to say that it is not necessary to suppose that if such a conceivable red really exists when unperceived, it must exist double when perceived, once as the perceived red and once as the unperceived red. Of course, if the red that is perceived is merely a perception and cannot exist except in consciousness, then any red which one might conceive as existing beyond the perceived red would necessarily be a second red, numerically distinct from the perceived red. The perceived red could at best be only a duplicate or copy of the red that is out of the mind. But we must not mix up what would follow if red is merely a perception with what would follow if red should prove to be an independent reality. This confusion is constantly met with in the writings of those who argue against the independent reality of perceived qualities. Thus Barclay, in one of his arguments for idealism, assumes that the realist maintains that though the ideas themselves do not exist without the mind, yet there may be things like them whereof they are copies or resemblances which things exist without the mind in an unthinking substance. Footnote. A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, Section 8. End footnote. In refutation of such a contention, 
Barclay says that an idea can be like nothing but an idea. A color or figure can be like nothing but another color or figure. If we look but never so little into our own thoughts, we shall find it impossible for us to conceive a likeness except only between our ideas. Again, I ask whether those supposed originals or external things of which our ideas are the pictures or representations be themselves perceivable or no. If they are, then they are ideas and we have gained our point. If you say they are not, I appeal to anyone whether it be sense to assert a color is like something which is invisible, hard or soft like something which is intangible, and so of the rest. Footnote. A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge. Section 8. End footnote. Professor Strong argues in a similar matter in opposition to the realist. He thinks that for the realist there are really two material worlds, one accessible to touch and vision, and another lying concealed behind it. It cannot but strike us that worlds here have been multiplied, praetor necessitatum. Footnote. Why the mind has a body. Page 178. End footnote. It does look that way on this representation, but the multiplication has been performed by the idealist in his inability to see anything but through the distorted lens of his idealism. There is surely another course open, lying between the doctrine that everything that is perceived is a modification of consciousness, and beyond such modifications of consciousness there is nothing, and the doctrine that everything that is perceived is a modification of consciousness, and beyond these modifications there is something like them in quality, but forever inaccessible to consciousness. It is perfectly permissible to conceive the object of vision as being not a modification of consciousness at all, but as the real thing. In this case, there is no duplication of worlds, praetor necessitatum. This is the view of the naive man, and as we have seen, there is nothing antecedently improbable in it. It may prove to be a mistaken view, but there is no contradiction in the terms of it. This third course is generally completely ignored by idealists. They assume that there is no question that our perceptions are states of consciousness and therefore ideal. Now, if consciousness is to be distinguished from its objects, as I have maintained, then it is improper to call the objects of consciousness in perception, or any other objects of consciousness for that matter, a state of consciousness. There are no states of consciousness in any proper sense of the term. Consciousness is always similar in character, whatever be its objects. Consciousness does not change its character from what it is when a sense quality is its object to become another kind of consciousness when later there is an emotional reaction upon this sense quality. It remains the same qualitatively similar consciousness throughout the time within which qualitatively different objects are presented to it. What is usually called a state of consciousness is either an object of consciousness or a state of such object. It may very well be that some of the objects exist only when there is an awareness of them. For instance, we have no reason for supposing that pleasure ever exists except as there is an awareness of it. But this does not make pleasure a state of consciousness, any more than the fact that color does not exist except as it is extended makes color a state of extension. Now those objects of consciousness which can exist, so far as we know only as there is an awareness of them, we may call subjective. Other objects, which there is reason for believing to exist when there is no awareness of them, we may call objective. But we may not argue that because these two classes of objects are alike in being objects of consciousness when we are aware of them, therefore what is true of the one class, namely its subjectivity, is also true of the other class. This is exactly what is done when we call everything a state of consciousness, and then suppose that we have proved idealism true. Footnote. Of course, there is need of further discussion as to the nature of consciousness as it is treated in the above remarks. For instance, consciousness is an abstraction, but it is none the less real for being so. Color is an abstraction. But I do not think that any man in his senses has ever supposed that this fact abolishes color out of the universe. But into these matters we must not go here. End footnote. Now if idealist would only bear in mind that realism can regard things as indeed at times objects of consciousness without thereby becoming states of consciousness, they would save themselves the trouble of constructing a fallacious dilemma with a view to impaling realist upon one of its horns. 
but they will not bear this in mind, and hence they keep on saying in complacent self-satisfied tone, the same red cannot be both in and out of consciousness. But the red we see is admittedly in consciousness. Therefore, if there is a real red independent of consciousness, it must be another red. For how can the red we see be at the same time the red we do not see? If they would only stop their iterations and reiterations long enough to give themselves time to examine the realist position, they would see that all they are saying amounts to the assertion that if the realist would only concede to the idealist the truth of the idealistic contention, then the realist could not consistently maintain something that is at variance with the conceded truth. The idealist thus begs the question as naively as ever the plain man does, whom the idealist despises so much. The idealist assumes that the red we see cannot be independent of the seeing, which is, of course, the pointed issue. And then he finds it easy to prove that if there is an independent red, it must be a numerically different thing from the red we do see. Now it can be easily seen that if the idealist would only treat the realist conception as he would treat anything else, he would never say, as Professor Strong says, if we start from the realistic assumption of an object existing independently of consciousness, the conclusion to which we are driven is that this object and our perception of it are distinct and separate things. There are really, on this assumption, two candles, the candle that is extra-mentally real and the candle that is a mental modification. They differ in a variety of ways, one being permanent, the other transient, one made of matter, the other of mind stuff, etc., being distinct and separate, each can exist without the other. Footnote, Apera Citato, page 185. End footnote. On this principle, Mr. Strong is professor of psychology, and Mr. Strong is playing golf for two gentlemen. They differ in a variety of ways, one being permanent and the other transient, one addressing his classes, the other addressing his ball, etc. Being distinct and separate, each can exist without the other. Now Locke expressly duplicated the object, but Professor Strong gives us no warning that he is dealing with realism of the Lockean type alone. He represents realism as being in general, especially in its naive form, unqualifiedly committed to duplicating the object. It is only because Professor Strong supposes that the realist would cheerfully make certain idealistic admissions that the duplication of objects is foisted on the realist. But the idealist returns to the fray when he has been foiled in his attempt to down the realist with this sophistry. But he only brings another sophistry to accomplish what the first failed to accomplish. He tries his hand at another misinterpretation of his opponent's position. The realist will surely be kind enough to admit that if we see the independent red, then that red is both in and out of consciousness at the same time. That it is in consciousness when it is seen, no one can doubt and that it is out of consciousness is just the gist of the realist contention. The realist, even at the risk of seeming unaccommodating, refuses to admit that the real red he is contending for is both in and out of mind at the same time and in the same sense. When the real red is in consciousness, it is in consciousness, and when it is out of consciousness, it is out of it. Its independence of the mind only means that it is not necessary for it to be in the mind in order to be at all, and also that while it is in one mind, it may also be in another. The independent thing does not exhaust all its being in being perceived by one mind. Put this way, there is no more contradiction in the assertion that the same object can be both in and out of mind at the same time than in the assertion that the same person can be father and son at the same time. The particular respect in which a man is father is not the same particular respect in which he is son. So the particular respect in which red is in consciousness is not the same particular respect in which it is not in consciousness. As Bradley has well observed, Contradictions exist so far only as internal distinction seems impossible, only so far as diversities are attached to one unyielding point assumed, tacitly or expressly, to be incapable of internal diversity or external complement. And there is only one way to get rid of contradiction, and that way is by dissolution. Instead of one subject distracted, we get a larger subject with distinctions, and so the tension is removed. Footnote, Appearance and Reality, pages 566 to 567 and 192. End footnote.
The idealist maintains that the realist's red is one unyielding point, while the realist maintains that his red, like anything else we can think of, may be capable either of internal diversity or of external complement, may be a larger subject with distinctions. There are other sophistries frequently appearing in the course of arguments for idealism, but I think that those I have mentioned are the most common and the most generally overlooked. Professor Strong's writings will convince anyone that the idealist can get intense satisfaction in rolling them as sweet morsels under his tongue. Let us now proceed to examine the distinctions I refer to as necessary to be recognized before at least one kind of realism can be understood and intelligently estimated. There is no word in modern philosophical literature which is more ambiguous than the word sensation, and yet many writers use it with as much confidence in its constancy of meaning as the geometrician reposes in the symbol pi. Thus Professor Strong says in one place that if it were possible for us to know that objects exist whether perceived or not, we might know them to be independent of the mind, and they could not then be composed of sensation. Footnote. This journal, volume 1, page 549, italics mine, end footnote. Here it is arbitrarily assumed that sensations can mean only one thing, namely the modification of consciousness, which accompanies the brain event initiated by an external stimulus applied to a sense organ. If this be merely a matter of words, it is not worth spending our time on it. But opponents of realism often use the fact that sensation means for them just sense qualities while appearing in consciousness as a kind of sacred and inspired revelation that what we are aware of in such sensation must be subjective. They apply the hagiograph sensation to a thing, and forthwith the thing becomes ideal in its nature. Reality is in its mental temple. Let all the realistic world keep silence. This is just what such words as these imply. Sensation presents to us an object that is real and present, but that object is not distinct from the sensation. Footnote. This journal, volume 1, page 549. As in many other hagiographa, we have here a sentence that charms the ear with its mystery of meaninglessness and assumption of unfathomable profundity. If it could be interpreted by ordinary standards, it would mean the object presents to us an object that is real and present, or sensation presents to us a sensation that is real and present. This, of course, would be flat. Hence, we must begin by distinguishing sensation and object in order to get a giver and a gift, and then we cancel the distinction in order to get idealism. End footnote. It is not thus that a great psychologist writes of sensation. When we adults talk of our sensations, we mean one of two things, either certain objects, namely simple qualities or attributes like hard, hot, pain, or else those of our thoughts in which acquaintance with these objects is least combined with knowledge about the relations of them to other things. Footnote, James, Principles of Psychology, Volume 2, Page 3, End footnote. According to this statement, which seems to me to express the truth in the matter. There are at least two things to be distinguished in every sensation of an adult. There is a sensum, quality or attribute, and there is a sentire, thought, as Professor James calls it. I should prefer to call it awareness. Not that in sensation these facts are separate. They exist together in a concrete unity, wherein they can be distinguished. They are two aspects of an undivided whole. Now, if this be so, I think we should, for the sake of clearness, recognize that sensation may mean not merely sensum and not merely sentire, but also the whole of which sensum and sentire are aspects. Sensation, therefore, means also sentire sensum. Over against this, and with explicit rejection of this distinction, Professor Strong maintains that the object is not distinct from sensation. Footnote. So Barclay maintained that, in truth, the object and the sensation are the same thing and cannot, therefore, be abstracted from each other. Treatise, section 5. End footnote. From sensation in what sense? Obviously, in the sense of sensum. Obviously, not in the sense of either sentire or of sentire sensum. 
but the dictum once uttered is forthwith used as an axiom in the obviously not sense. Of course, if no distinction can be made between sensum and sentire, then Professor Strong's identification of sensation with sensum and his ignoring everything else are justified. Professor Strong says that he regrets he cannot recognize the distinction. The contention then narrows down to a question of fact. Is there a clearly recognizable distinction between sensum and sentire? I have tried in an article already mentioned to show that the distinction is obvious. In a later article, I shall try to show that unless the distinction is recognized, any attempt to understand the world of experience lands one in absurd paradoxes. Meanwhile, I will leave the matter to the discrimination of the reader. Now, if it is proper to distinguish sensum, sentire, and sentire sensum, the realist maintains that these distinctions give an intelligible realistic meaning to the term Professor Strong uses so frequently, namely possible sensation. If sensa are sense qualities or attributes like hard or soft, then why may not sensibilia be just these same sense qualities when existing apart from any sentire? If sensum is a sense datum, then why may not sensibile be sense dandum? And why may not such a dandum exist before it becomes a datum, much as a toy which I buy a week before Christmas exists as a dandum until Christmas Eve when it becomes a datum? This change from dandum to datum does not make the toy any more real. Its nature has not changed. Its reality has not changed in ceasing to be a mere dandum and becoming a datum. The only change is in the relation to the lad. So the realist maintains that red may be real before it is given or presented to any sentire as a sensum. If this contention be valid, then just as the toy quad dandum and the toy quad datum are the same toy at different times and in different relations, so the sensibile and the sensum may be the same quality at different times and in different relations. Resuming our results, we may say that the term sensation is an omnibus term, meaning either sensum or sentire or sentire sensum, or even sensible, the last when we speak of possible sensation. We shall need these distinctions kept clearly in mind in our further study of realism as a tenable theory. End of Prolegomena to a Tentative Realism by Evander Bradley McGilvery. Pragmatic Realism, The Five Attributes, by John E. Budin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pragmatic Realism, The Five Attributes, by John E. Budin. Footnote. A preliminary statement of this doctrine under the title of The Attributes of Reality appeared in the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods in 1907. As the statement is now somewhat antiquated, I have used parts of it freely in the present article. A fuller statement will appear soon in a volume entitled A Realistic Universe. End footnote. The problem of attributes is somewhat out of fashion since the dominance of modern idealism. It has become a habit to think of reality simply in terms of experience, and reflective experience at that. It seems to me, however, that with our new epistemological tools we are in a position to take up seriously some of the metaphysical problems applying the pragmatic method. In using the term pragmatic, I do not mean to commit myself to any of the special doctrines which have recently passed under that name. I mean that any reality must be conceived as the differences it makes to our reflective purposes. This holds whether the reality in question be of the thing type or the self type or some other type. Section 1. Substance has come to have a distinct scientific meaning in modern times. So far as it is possible to revive the Spinozistic conception of substance, it would now amount to the epistemological postulate of totality, viz. that facts are part of one world in such a way that every fact can, under certain conditions, make a difference to other facts. Footnote. See Truth and Reality, Chapter 7, Macmillan, 1911. End footnote. 
What those conditions are, it is for science to investigate. The differences must also be capable of becoming differences to a reflective consciousness under certain conditions in order to concern us. These differences are capable of being systematized into certain attributes, summa genera, of differences not further reducible. My reflections have led me to believe that there are five such attributes, irreducible to terms of each other, viz. stuff, time, space, consciousness, and form. Future investigations will have to determine how far these are ultimate attributes and whether there are others. It is true that such attributes are abstractions from the total matrix of reality. But to say that they are abstractions does not mean that they are ideal or phenomenal in the sense that they belie reality. Without abstraction, we can have no science of reality. These attributes are genuine aspects of reality if we must recognize them as such in the procedure of experience. The classical discussion of attributes goes back to Spinoza. Spinoza makes causal difference, as well as conceptual, depend upon the possession of a common attribute on the part of the contents. He even goes farther and reduces the causal relation to the conceptual. If things have nothing in common, it follows that one cannot be apprehended by means of the other, and therefore cannot be the cause of the other. Footnote, Spinoza, Ethics, Part 1, Proposition 3. End footnote. This, evidently, is a confusion of causal dependence with logical dependence, a confusion of which later idealism has so often been guilty. With Spinoza, this identification easily follows from the ambiguity of his parallel attributes, as we shall see later. The same reality, according to Spinoza, figures in different attributes. Thus, substance must figure as both thought and extension. It must also figure in infinite other ways, not included in experience. Thus, substance must possess not only the attributes of which there is evidence, but infinite others. This is the medieval doctrine of the ens realissimum, of which we still find evidence in the idealist conception of the infinite variety in which is absolute is supposed to revel. It is not necessary to point out that Spinoza is inconsistent with his own thesis, that every fact within reality must be conceived with reference to a context, or, as he would put it, must have a common attribute with the rest of reality. He is inconsistent, first, as regards the relation between thought and extension, for extension must be conceived, and so must be capable of making a difference to thought. To be indifferent or parallel to thought would be to be without significance. He is still more inconsistent as regards his infinite attributes. These, by hypothesis, make no difference to thought, and yet are assumed. On the contrary, insofar as we make an a priori assumption, we must start with a finite number of attributes, else knowledge becomes impossible. As a matter of fact, we have a right to assume only as many attributes as make a difference to judging a reflective experience. The question whether these are altered by being known can have no meaning, since it is only for reflective experience that attributes have significance. We must assume that the attributes are what they are consistently known as in progressive human conduct. It is unnecessary to point out that extension, with the geometrical qualities it implies in Spinoza, cannot be made an independent attribute apart from the energetic context in which a thing figures, including our perceptual organic context. Extension is as much a quality as is color or tone. To be sure, the quality of extension may be said to exist in context independent of experience, but extension, to be known at any rate, must figure in the context of our perceptual consciousness. And if so, it cannot be parallel to experience in Spinoza's sense of forming an exclusive and complete world of its own. Spinoza himself was far from consistent in the relative emphasis he put upon the two attributes. When he dealt with the problem of knowledge, he was inclined to regard mind as the mere consciousness of the actions of the body, idea corporis. He at least came dangerously near being a materialistic realist. As he puts it, the object of the idea constituting the human mind is the body, and the body as it actually exists. Footnote, part two, proposition eight. End footnote. And again, the human mind is the very idea or knowledge of the human body. Footnote, part two, proposition 19. End footnote. No wonder, then, that the order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. Footnote, part two, proposition seven. 
end footnote, or as he puts it elsewhere, as the order and connection of causes, footnote, part two, proposition 19, end footnote. It follows also that his theory of association must be strictly physiological. Memory is simply a certain association of ideas involving the nature of things outside the human body, which association arises in the mind according to the order and association of the modifications of the human body. Footnote, part two, proposition 18, note, end footnote. This materialistic tendency is seen also in his physiological theory of emotions. Whatsoever increases or diminishes, helps or hinders the power of activity in our body, the idea thereof increases or diminishes, helps or hinders the power of thought in our mind. Footnote, part three, proposition 11. End footnote. It follows on this view that our knowing the object does not in any wise alter the object though our ideas may be inadequate, fragmentary, or confused. Such privation of knowledge is falsity. Knowledge, when clear and distinct, takes account of the object as it really is in its own eternal system of relations, which Spinoza calls God. Materialistic realists of today have repeated both the theory and inconsistency of Spinoza. For while holding that mind is just the awareness of the body, he finds it hard to rule out mental facts as such with their own unique relations. What blinded Spinoza to his epistemological materialism was doubtless his play on words. Thus he argues, as we have seen, that mind is the consciousness of the body. But he argues further that this idea of the mind is united to the mind in the same way as the mind is united to the body. Footnote, part two, proposition 21, end footnote. He thus, after telling us that the object of our mind is the body as it exists and nothing else, substantializes this idea of the body as having a distinct quality of its own. Footnote, part two, proposition 21, note, end footnote. This process can then be repeated on the idea of the idea, etc. ad infinitum. But the fact is that there is no new content provided for in this repetition. It is purely a trick of language. We remain where we started, with mind as the consciousness of the bodily modifications. That we know that we know in any case only signifies that the attitude of knowing brings its characteristic feeling of belief with it, insofar as it is successful. When Spinoza, on the other hand, turns to the problem of conduct, he becomes as idealistic as he is materialistic in his epistemology. He attributes all agency to systematic thought, and the passive becomes synonymous with the confused and unreal. For in the case of ethical conduct, cause no longer means physiological processes, but clear and distinct ideas. Our mind is active insofar as it has adequate ideas. Footnote, part three, proposition one, end footnote. The passive states of the mind depend solely on inadequate ideas. Footnote, part three, proposition three, end footnote. And man can be said to act obediently to virtue only insofar as he is determined for the action because he understands. Finally, the mind's highest knowledge and highest virtue is to know God. And to know God is to love God and to love him with that very love whereby God loves himself. Footnote, part five, proposition 36. End footnote. Wherein our salvation or blessedness or freedom consists. Thus Spinoza halts between divided motives. Spinoza's logic at any rate leaves us only one attribute, one complete system, whether of matter or thought. Modern science, insofar as it has been allowed to pursue its own task, unhampered by metaphysical assumptions, whether of the materialistic or idealistic sort, has always insisted upon as many attributes or independent variables as the facts seem to require. These seem to be three for natural science, space, time, and energy. The conception of energy has gradually supplanted the conception of mass as a universal ideal of description. Footnote. I am using mass here in the sense of gravitational mass, not in the sense of inertia. End footnote. Mass is applicable only within a limited field. It is not applicable, for example, to electricity, while energy with its equivalence of transformation can be made to cover the whole extent of process, material and immaterial, physical, and psychological. In spite of the fact that natural science has found it necessary to work with these three attributes, it has failed to define them in any clear way. 
The desire for simplification has always made itself felt. Thus space and time have always been regarded as pure quantity. But if space and time are pure quantity, how can they be given distinct meaning? We must look for the differentia of these attributes, as they are in fact implied in our attitudes to the world of processes with which science deals. Not the serial tools which they have in common, but their specific character is what we must try to make clear. Certainly, as pure quantity, time and space are indistinguishable from each other and from quantity in general. While it is convenient to reduce time and space to pure quantity for certain artificial purposes of prediction, this should not blind us to their true character in the world which we intend thus to simplify. Not only has the attempt been made to reduce time and space to pure quantity, but the same attempt has been made in regard to mass. Thus Carl Pearson would reduce mass to acceleration, but if mass and energy are pure quantity, how can we get the different units with which quantity must deal? Quantity, obviously, means something different, whether it is connected with chemical elements or electric potentials or neural reactions. But this only shows the confusion that has been too prevalent in the analysis of scientific concepts. Moreover, while natural science, in its task of simplifying and anticipating the world of perception, has been forced to emphasize the above attributes, there are other attributes which, though neglected, are nevertheless implied in the whole procedure of natural science. Thus the attribute of consciousness, the condition of the unique relation to mind, of being experienced or interesting, in short the awareness of a world with its complexity, has been neglected by the natural scientist. This is natural inasmuch as this attribute is equally present to the whole field of problems with which he deals, and therefore for his specific purpose can be neglected. He has set himself the task of dealing with a specific part of experience, not with experience as such. Again, natural science assumes that its facts can be formulated into a system, i.e. that they can be explained in terms of a finite number of simple principles. This obviously is not deducible from the attributes of space, time, and energy. On the contrary, it is a formal presupposition or ideal which is implied in all our cognitive endeavor. It holds, at any rate, in the part of the universe which is molded by our will. And if science is to be possible, this presupposition must hold in the universe at large. Section 2. It must be obvious from this survey of the results of the past what our problem is. And while the inquiry did not start from the assumptions of science, it must be a matter of more than curious coincidence that the metaphysical needs and the scientific needs point in the same direction, even though the former set a much more comprehensive and articulate program. Applying the pragmatic criterion, that we must assume only such realities as can make a real difference in our reflective procedure, we must try to make clear what are the ultimate types of differences which reality makes to our reflective conduct, or, expressed in subjective terms, what ways of taking or evaluating our world prove finally effective in our understanding and appreciation of it. Such types of conduct we will call by the classic name of attributes. I will now try in brief to define these attributes, the summa genera of the reflective evaluation of the character of our world. Being. First, a word about the attribute of being, as it has been called since Parmenides. By being, we mean the stuff character of reality. This stuff is capable of making definite differences under statable conditions. This dynamic continuity of stuff, with its equivalences, we call energy. The stuff that has been emphasized by modern idealism is meaning stuff, our reflective purposes. These constitute one type of stuff and must be taken account of as of final importance for our appreciating and understanding the world. They enable us to differentiate the processes and spread them out in a series. Similarity, difference, causality, reciprocity, etc., as general categories or modes of functioning on the part of the reflective ego must be part of this account of stuff. This reflective stuff is partly content stuff, partly tendency stuff, which makes the particular content significant. I want to point out, however, that in order to make a difference to experience, reality need not necessarily be reflective. On the contrary, reflective experience will be seen to be dependent to a large extent upon non-reflective processes. The meaning of the object reflected upon depends largely upon its unnoticed background. There are three ways in which attention may be dependent upon unnoticed facts. Thus, processes not attended to make up the larger associative context. 
the background of feeling and tendency of the object. The different meaning of man or evolution to the scientist and to the common man is largely in the fringe, or the unnoticed may be instrumental to the activity of attention without itself being attended to. For example, the words on the page that we read. We have a different consciousness when we are attending to the meaning of the words from what we have when we make the words themselves the object. There may be processes, however, which are entirely irrelevant to the purposive consciousness of the moment as well as unnoticed by it. Thus the pressure of our clothes, the furniture of the room, the temperature, etc., even though not attended to, make a difference to our consciousness which we can easily see by an alteration of these processes. We have a very different consciousness in reading a book out of doors under the open sky from what we have in reading the same book in our own study, though in either case we may not be attending to the setting. If we want one name for all these various unnoticed mental processes, I would suggest subattentive instead of subconscious, which at best is misleading. Footnote. This term was suggested in the article in the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Method, 1907. It has later been advocated by Dr. Marshall in the same journal, but the term subconscious seems to have come to stay. End footnote. Not only are there mental processes beyond the circle of reflective thought and making a difference to it, there are processes which we cannot speak of as conscious experience at all, which still make a difference to our reflective meaning. That I can take up today the problems of yesterday or last year and thus connect again with my own past seems to be dependent upon a continuity of processes which are not themselves conscious. The unity of the passing thought can account for the continuity of our consciousness only while we are conscious. It cannot bridge over the gap between going to sleep and waking up again, or account for the bringing back of experiences which have not been active in the meantime. What these non-conscious processes are in their own character must be determined by science according to its convenience. It must simplify them and differentiate them according to our needs in meeting the complexity of our world. Mere a priori classification can count for nothing. One thing is certain, and that is the close relation between what we call physical energy and our mental activities. It is a commonplace that a cup of hot coffee may change our emotional attitude towards the world. But I suppose we would not on that account be guilty of speaking of coffee as emotion stuff. Psychotherapy again has made us familiar with the differences that mental processes can make to the physiological. We have gotten over the notion that one process in order to make a difference to another must be of the same kind. Chemical energy is not the same as electrical, though capable of making a difference to it. So different are the conceptual tools which we need in each case that electrical energy is sometimes spoken of as immaterial. This, I take it, only signifies that the conception of mass is inapplicable. The difficulty of finding a common denominator between psychic processes and physiological seems still greater, yet they are clearly interdependent. All we can hope to do in science, and science must here be our last word, is to show definitely the conditions under which the transformations take place. The how of the process, the following of the minute internal transitions, may forever lie beyond us. Looking at the stuff character with reference to the implications of the reflective moment, we have found it convenient to look at it as of three levels. These levels can be seen in a cross-section, as it were, of every reflective moment, the reflective consciousness showing its dependence upon marginal or unnoticed experience, and this again upon processes to which the category of experience cannot be ascribed, and which, for want of a better term, we speak of as physical. Stuff has the advantage that it can be observed directly. It is an object of immediate perception and judgment. The other attributes of which we shall speak, viz. space, time, consciousness, and form, can only be observed or make a difference to our judgment through the difference they make to the stuff structure of the world, including our own purposes. I shall speak of these attributes as non-being attributes not because they are less real, but because they are not statable as stuff. In the language of philosophy, the stuff character has appropriated the term being. These non-being attributes can be defined or differentiated from each other by the difference which they make to the active purposes of the self. Time. It has been customary since Kant to deal with the time and space attributes as series, and therefore to insist upon their ideal character. 
I have insisted, on the other hand, that the serial character is relative, and that the real differentia of these concepts must be found in characters of reality which are not themselves serial, but furnish the rationale of the serial construction. If you speak of time and space, for example, as pure quantity, there remains, as we have already pointed out, the problem of stating the relation of time and space to the general concept of quantity on the one hand, and to show their differentia with reference to each other on the other hand. That is, the whole problem of definition remains. And what, in other words, lies the difference in our purposive attitude in evaluating space and time? To speak first of time, what difference does time make to the realization of our purposes? Energy, as we have seen, stands for constancy of process, for stable types of prediction, and there is a degree of constancy of stuff, or we would not have science. But on the other hand, it is a characteristic of our concrete world that it does not stay as it is. We must recognize fleetingness, growth and decay in much of reality. Constancy in our practical experience seems at best relative. Hence, we must recognize the attribute of time. It is precisely because the universe is in perpetual flux that the task of science, the singling out of certain leading identities which enable us to find our way amidst the ever novel and different, becomes so significant. In the frozen block world of Parmenides, we should have no need of science. The constancy aspect is limited by the flux aspect. And while we must recognize the former as real, it seems but meager in extent beside the flowing world of protean detail. While again it is convenient for certain abstract purposes of description to reduce time to quantity, this must not blind us to the nature of the processes which we intend and from whose essential character we have abstracted for the partial purpose. I insist that what we mean by the differences time makes to our purposes is not statable as mere units of chronology, the intervals of the clock. There must be flow, movement, or we would not go to the trouble of inventing units. This movement, even in the measurement of time, ever belies our static definitions. Footnote. See Time and Reality, Psych Rev, Monographic Series, Macmillan, 1904, pages 23 and 24, and footnote. Suppose that nothing really happened, no running down of energy, no being born or growing old, no change in values. In such a world, we should indeed declare time to be no more, to make no real difference. Or rather, we should have no concept of time at all. What makes time real to us is that it necessitates new judgments, whether because of transformation and novelty in the purposive meaning which evaluates or in the object which is evaluated. So long as this is the case, we cannot express reality in merely static categories. Our quantitative devices are instruments to adjust ourselves to this concrete flow. It matters not for this purpose how you ultimately conceive the stuff of the world. You may conceive the process as the rearrangement of physical entities. Even then, you must have something besides the bits and their position to account for the process of the perpetual world. I do not see myself how the bits can be indifferent to the rearrangement they must suffer, except as they are recognized as merely our conceptual models. But whether you conceive the stuff of reality in the last analysis as atoms and electrons, or as purposive systems of meanings, the question remains, when you have thus conceived reality, why should it slip away? Why does it not remain chained in the present, as Parmenides would say? Why should there be rearrangement, whether a running up or a running down process? As the world has no beginning, neither process can be absolute, for then the world must have run its course countless ages ago. The theory that the world tends to an equilibrium or an equal distribution of heat as implied in Spencer's formula and the second law of thermodynamics, presupposes a finite creation of the world. If you say again that the present arrangement is the result of previous rearrangement, and so on ad infinitum, why should there be rearrangement at all? Why should not our positional values remain fixed? Why should something creep into our equations, whether subjectively or objectively, so as to make them false? If you insist that reality remains fixed, there at least remains the appearance of rearrangement in the subject, and that is part of reality and must be met. 
Given, on the other hand, time as a real character of the world, you can account for the transformation of values, the instability of position or the falsifying of our judgments, which is what it all amounts to in the end. You can also furnish the rationale for our serial construction to meet such a character of the world, while you cannot derive the time character from the concept of series. The construction of time infinities is a secondary affair and can neither explain nor invalidate the real time character. We should not say that things move in time. This is putting the cart before the horse. Our serial construction is made necessary, on the other hand, because of the transformation of our facts and values. Time furnishes the limiting value of certain serial constructions, such as past and future, without which they would be meaningless. It is inverting the real situation to speak of contents as carried over from one moment to another, or as passing in and out of time. What really takes place is that some contents remain constant, others come and go. Our psychological moments chase each other and fade like the shadows on the mountains on a cloudy day, yet with all some constancy of outline, of tendency and content, remains by means of which we can realize their fading and fleeting existence. The more permanent contents furnish the background upon which the fleeting ones appear and disappear. Some of the latter observe a certain rhythm. In the case of the earth clock and our artificial timepieces based upon it, we have socialized this rhythm, relative though this is in the end to the process. Then we use this rhythm to measure the enduring contents with their passing or accumulating increments. Having invented intervals, we can divide these at will, even to infinity. We then invert the process and imagine that the contents run through our artificial divisions. The latter, however, have no effect on the real overlapping or change. They are an afterthought. Space. And now a word about space. If time makes the difference of transformation to our concrete realities, space conditions translation. If time makes an intrinsic difference to our processes, space makes an external difference. The character of space, in other words, is such that it does not interfere with movement. If space offered resistance, geometry, which is based on free mobility, would be impossible. It matters not for our purpose whether space be actually empty or not. It is convenient for scientific and practical purposes to posit space as a limit of exhaustion and as the absence of resistance, i.e. to assume a space zero. Only thus can we state Newton's first law of motion. Moreover, if we can approximate to such a limit, it must be as objectively real as though we had actually attained it. We cannot rule out space by mere a priori considerations. Thought must follow the facts and not dictate to them. Whatever we must acknowledge as real cannot fail to be conceivable, and pure space seems to be more than a conceptual limit. Interstellar space seems to be practically pure. The rays of light are, so far as we know, not interfered with in any way until they strike solid bodies. Michelson's careful measurements indicate that the Earth rotates as though it moves in empty space. What is true in the large may be equally true in the minute. Thus the compressibility of the atom, as indicated by the experiments of T.W. Richards, seem to point to space intervals in the elementary structure of the universe. Whether such observations as regards the existence of pure space prove final or not, this does not invalidate the reality of space as the condition of the energetic interactions in space. A more positive characteristic of space than that of free mobility is that of distance or externality of energetic centers. As distance, space conditions the equations of the astronomer and the realization of our human social purposes. For even though our purposes do not occupy space, they nevertheless operate in space, and space makes a difference to their realization. If from Kansas I wish to communicate with a friend across the sea, it makes a definite difference as regards the kind of communication and the sort of relations that are possible between us that he is some thousands of miles away. Spatial distance does not, of course, prevent energetic overlapping of centers. In the case of my friend, it is true that my purpose to communicate may become continuous with certain physiological processes, and these in turn may become continuous with certain physical energies which in turn span the distance between me and my friend. 
but the overlapping is different and the realization of the social purpose is different because of the distance. No mystical monism can remedy this difference. No mere intellectual change of point of view can alter the practical situation in which space figures as one condition. We must, of course, be careful not to confuse the real space condition with our psychological or logical perspectives, with their ideal distinctness or externality of parts. Things cannot move in an ideal system. Serial space is a construction, an afterpicture to symbolize the relations of things, whether physical masses or geometrical figures or self-conscious individuals in zero space. If space were merely an ideal system, distance and free mobility would both be figurative without any reality for the figure. If we admit a real zero space, we can easily account for phenomenal or serial space, but not vice versa. I grant cheerfully that all our quantitative measurements are relative. Our serial constructions, our geometrical as our chronological models, are our tools by means of which we strive to meet the actual nature of the world. But I do not see how any mere contradictions in our concepts can rid us of characters of reality which condition all our real purposes, whether as regards transformation or translation. Consciousness. It is convenient to treat consciousness in the sense of awareness or interest as a unique attribute. It is absurd to suppose that our cognitive attitudes and organized meanings become atoms and molecules when we are not aware of them. They change, not in stuff but in value, when they are illuminated for an instant by interest. Consciousness is a new character added to our cognitive purposes under certain conditions of intensity and readjustment. The cognitive purposes themselves may remain as constant as individual existence. They may even become permanent parts of social history. Consciousness or awareness is a neutral light. It does not create distance, nor does it create meaning. It may be an awareness of meaning or an awareness of sensation. In our developed experience, it is both. It gives subjective and unique value to facts and their relations. To make such awareness possible, there must pre-exist as conditions, on the one hand, the object context of which we become aware, and on the other hand, the system of cognitive tendency which forms the subjective condition of awareness. But neither the object context nor the system of tendency is as such awareness. When interest is lighted under its peculiar conditions, a new relationship to the organism originates which cannot be reduced to other existential relations such as temporal, spatial, causal, nor ontological or aesthetic relations, though these now come to have subjective value. Consciousness thus conditions the relation of being felt. It converts what otherwise would be a type of mere interaction into realization. What is realized may be an external meaning, a proposition in Euclid. It may be an electrical shock. It may be a relation such as distance. What is realized need not be experienced stuff. It includes not merely experienced transition, but space transition. It may be any kind of energy or relation. On the other hand, a meaning may be as objective or external to consciousness as space. We do not make Homer's meaning or the Sistine Madonna when we become conscious of it any more than we make the distance from the earth to the moon when we take account of it. Consciousness, in any case, is a gift, which for its condition presupposes, on the one hand, cognitive tendency, and on the other, the shock of a stimulus, a situation to be met whether intra- or extra-organic. A mere continuity or succession of objects is not a consciousness of a continuity or succession. Awakened tendency or interest is also required, and then the content may come in temporally discrete pulses of experience. Thus, in being conscious, there are always end terms, and one of the end terms must be a cognitive system of tendencies. The terms need not be a logical subject and object, though the exchangeable character of the end terms in this case does not prevent them from being, in the particular situation, real end terms whichever term the cognitive interest may be momentarily identified with. The end terms may even be blind instinct on the one hand and any fascinating stimulus on the other. But one of the end terms is always cognitive in character. Consciousness is always interest. Consciousness has been confused on the one hand with its conditions, on the other with its species. It has in the first case been regarded, as by the materialist, as a product or effect of chemico-biological causes. 
but the materialist himself has admitted that it is not comparable with what is ordinarily meant by effect. It is rather an epiphenomenon, a miracle added to the process without making any causal difference to it. On the other hand, we may with the idealist regard this awareness as everywhere and always present and indissociable from the contents of reality. But here we are dealing with an assumption which seems to run counter to the facts as known in our finite experience. I prefer a third alternative, which indeed is implied in the bankruptcy of the other two, in accounting for our experience. This is that consciousness is an attribute added to our energetic relations of cognitive tendency and stimulus under certain conditions, a unique gift of reality in its larger sense to some of the interactions of our finite ego. Since obeying regular laws, it is no miracle. Since an aspect of all our waking experience, it is no more mysterious than other unique types of reality such as space. Whether it is an abstract attribute of the universe or is ever present as an aspect of a comprehensive absolute experience does not matter for the problem in question. In either case, what is a gift to our finite experience pre-exists as a character of a larger reality. This character of awareness spans the whole field of interest from the immediate interest of instinctive attention, where we have the mere awareness of, to that of the most elaborate apperception or knowledge about. In the second place, consciousness has been confused with the species of its content. It has sometimes been treated as though it meant exclusively logical awareness to the ruling out of non-logical types. Again, it has been treated as though it signifies simply motor awareness as opposed to ideational. But the stating of such definitions is a sufficient refutation of them. The awareness itself is quite colorless. It is the psychological processes which color it. And here there is no reason why one process should be given the preeminence over the rest. Form. I anticipate the most difficulty from the fifth attribute of which I am going to speak, viz. form or direction. We have tried so far to state the universe in terms of four attributes, those of stuff or energy, time, space, and consciousness. But none of these attributes answer the question, does the process have direction, or is there validity in the flux? This is not accounted for by stuff, for the stuff character does not contain its own measure. It is precisely because we recognize that the process is not what it ought to be, because our finite structures seem relative, that the question of validity is raised. The question is not answerable in terms of time, for time merely means transformation. Whether transformation towards chaos or towards unity is not answered by time. It is not statable as space, for while space conditions the realization of meaning, it does not make it valid. You cannot reduce the demand for form to mere mechanical sequence, whether psychical or physical, conscious or unconscious. There remains somehow within us the longing for finality, in spite of, yea, because of, the fragmentariness of our finite meaning. The merely relative fails to satisfy us. Valid relations are a distinct type or genus from consciousness with the motley array of existences which it reveals. In the first place, our awareness may be bound up with error and delusion. That it largely is so in our experience is attested by the whole story of science. In the second place, valid relations may exist without our being conscious of them. We do not originate Euclidean geometry by becoming aware of its logical relations. While valid relations presuppose mind and also awareness at some time, we do not have to be awake all the time to keep the argument valid. And the long-buried past, which once brought to consciousness, sometimes is found to be more valid than our present cogitations. Validity implies a constitution, different from the sequential or causal, in the light of which we criticize that which happens and strive to establish clearness and distinctness in the midst of the seemingly confused relations of experience. This idealization of life, this attempt to establish the ought in what is, must be taken as a unique type of evaluation. When we insist that there ought to be truth, beauty, and goodness, in spite of the relativity of history in our individual judgments, we have at least implied a limit 
a direction of history which is not relative. Else all our judgments would be equally meaningless, and there could be no degree of worth, as in the dark all cows are gray. The absolute idealists insist that in the absolute experience we have such a standard. This absolute experience is even now shared by us. It is this that gives rise to our consciousness of fragmentariness, which accounts for our finite sense of failure, and of which we are even now conscious as the final truth, the purpose eternally fulfilled. But the irony of history gives the lie to any such assumption. The absolute itself, as our concept, is subject to the transmutation of time. It is the expression of the finite now. Each stage of the process must create its own absolute, find its own satisfaction. The absolute, therefore, is for us at any rate merely a logical ideal. Epistemologically, it is relative. The concept of it, too, presupposes direction for such validity as it has. That the idea of direction is valuable as a regulative idea or limit cannot be doubted. But can we also attribute ontological reality to the same? Or is it merely a hypothetical limit, the index of our ideal strivings? It seems to me, if it is required to give meaning to our relative and fragmentary purposes, then it must be at least as real as those purposes themselves. The straight line must be at least as real as the numberless variations of curvature of which it is the limit. And it is worth more, for without it there could be no such thing as measure. And so with our more general ideal demands as contrasted with the world of existential processes. To guarantee the validity of process, or to furnish the basis for science, virtue, and beauty, the form must be selective, that is, must somehow condition the survival of structures. Only thus can it satisfy that demand for finality which the finite process at any one time fails to fulfill. This does not mean that every item is predetermined by a final cause or idea. It need only mean that in the changes and chances of the cosmic process, in the fluctuations and mutations of life, certain ideals of clearness and distinctness are enforced by the universe, however much beyond our comprehension such operation may be. This would accomplish in the large what our selective will as a fragment and evolution of the universe strives to accomplish in the small. That formal selection may condition survival we know from experience. Evaluation in terms of ideals is an important condition in social survival. Human beings are socially approved, not so much for their size, weight, or strength, as for their satisfying certain ethical, aesthetic, and intellectual standards. They may, for example, be selected for their beauty rather than their strength, and thus continue the race. This holds to a certain extent in animal selection as well. And in the survival of plant life and even of certain conditions of inorganic nature, the configurations of hills and valleys within our human control, form often plays the most important part in our selection. If the universe is interpenetrated and controlled in the last analysis by a master mind, the fulfillment of our ideal demands, formal value, rather than quantity of energy, may be the final basis of survival and eternity. These attributes, while they are ultimate or irreducible kinds, differ from the parallelistic attributes of Spinoza in that they all make a difference to our creative purposes, whether they make any difference to each other or not. Hence, they do not involve an epistemological contradiction. They at least overlap as known. They also overlap in other ways. Space makes a definite difference to interacting energies in space. Time again conditions the existence of process at all, instead of the petrified world we otherwise should have. Consciousness makes subjective realization of a world possible, while form makes it possible to understand and appreciate such a world. End of Pragmatic Realism, The Five Attributes by John E. Budin The Metaphysical Status of Sensations by Sterling P. Lamprecht. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
The Metaphysical Status of Sensations by Sterling P. Lamprecht. When the eye and the appropriate object meet together and give birth to whiteness and the sensation of white, which could not have been given by either of them going to any other, then, while the sight is flowing from the eye, whiteness proceeds from the object which combines in producing the color, and so the eye is fulfilled with sight, and sees and becomes not sight, but a seeing eye. And the object which combines in forming the color is fulfilled with whiteness, and becomes not whiteness, but white, whether wood or stone or whatever the object may be which happens to be colored white. And this is true of all sensations, hard, warm, and the like, which are similarly to be regarded, as I was saying before, not as having any absolute existence, but as being all of them generated by motion in their intercourse with one another, according to their kinds. Plato, Theotetus, pages 156 to 157, Joet's translation. If one ever needs excuse for quoting Plato, it would do in this case to plead that the doctrine contained in the passage is brilliant, thorough, and sound. The history of philosophy in its meandering course has brought forth no improvement upon the statement put into the mouth of Socrates by his great pupil. One need not agree with all the positions of Plato in even the dialogue from which the above passage was taken in order to enter fully into the proffered analysis of the metaphysical status of sensations. Socrates is making no pretense of originating a new doctrine. He is expounding that of Protagoras. Indeed, he seems to accept as true everything which Protagoras says about sensation, except that it is knowledge. This doctrine of sensation, however sound, becomes, when coupled with the supposition that sensations are cognitive of the world beyond, involved in grave difficulties. And the followers of Protagoras through the centuries are responsible for all the copy theories of sensation which have so led philosophy astray. But in this present paper there will be no occasion to discuss knowledge. Rather, the effort will be made simply to comment upon and compare with less satisfactory modern analyses that doctrine of the nature of sensation which Protagoras formulated, Socrates accepted, and Plato so beautifully put into words. And if the points commented upon seem trivial and commonplace, the writer might reply that he wishes they were so well understood and so widely taken for granted that further restatement would be unnecessary. As so often is the case, metaphysics is needed only because there is so much bad metaphysics. Sensation is a natural event which takes place in the world under certain ascertainable conditions. We have good reason to believe that objects existed long before they were perceived by even the first organisms endowed with organs sensitive to stimuli from these objects. And we have good reason to believe that a catastrophic destruction of all organisms would leave those objects in undisturbed existence. Sensation is an event which happens in its setting, but does not produce nor control that setting. The setting consists, for the purposes of analysis, of three significant elements or aspects. First, there is the object such as a stone, a cloud, a bonbon, or an open fire on a wintry day. Secondly, there is the animal organism with its end organs of various sorts, end organs which might under different circumstances have become other than they are, but happen to be as they are, end organs such as the eye, the ear, and the various special structures in the skin. Thirdly, there is the medium of communication between object and end organ, the physical contact and pressure of the stone against the organ of touch, the vibrating ether between the cloud and the eye, the physical contact and chemical change which ensues when the bonbon is dissolved upon the tongue, or the air waves between the fire and the organ of heat. We know more about the structure of the end organs than did Plato, and also about the mediums by which objects affect the end organs. But Socrates did not need to know the details of all the species of processes involved in sense experience in order to formulate correctly the definition of the subsuming genus. 
and he allows adequately for the growth of scientific knowledge when he says that the various kinds of sensation are generated by motion in their intercourse with one another according to their kinds. Perhaps no loss of accuracy in discussing sensations will result if vision is selected for special treatment, for similar things could be said about all other kinds of sensation. The absence of one or more of the three elements of the setting in which sensations occur will of course make sensations impossible. Footnote, that sensations may arise under other conditions cannot of course be dogmatically denied. Yet the only sensations of which we know anything are generated in the way here discussed, and we have no reason for believing in any others. End footnote. A dazzling sun may shine with unparalleled splendor for countless ages, but there will be nothing seen unless the electromagnetic vibrations starting out from it chance to strike upon the sensitive retina of some physiological organism. A strong eye well constructed in all its parts and properly related to a healthy organism, may search the uttermost reaches of space. But there will be nothing seen unless there is some object within the radius of its range and some unimpeded physical force to stimulate the eye. In a world where no interactions took place between the various things of which that world might be composed, there would be no sensations. And even in a world where the requisite interactions take place, there must yet be properly formed end organs before those influences produce sensations. If the nature of the object or the nature of the medium of communication were changed, it might well be that the end organ would have to go through compensating changes before sensations would once more occur. And any change in an end organ beyond a very slight one would probably forever put a stop to sensations through it unless the other elements of the setting were altered, or those elements chanced to have other activities formerly unconnected with sensation processes, and yet suited thereto in connection with the altered end organ. The part of Plato's doctrine of sensations which is important for metaphysics and logic remains to be noted. There is no suggestion in Plato that sensations are a new sort of entity, which half conceals and half discloses the world which the organism faces. Not that he specifically denies that such is the case, but that such a consideration is irrelevant to the subject matter under examination. The followers of Protagoras, who regarded sensations as knowledge, might well become involved in such a distressing problem, but not Plato. For him, sensations are not cognitive, and there is no need of determining whether the sensation is a copy of anything else. A sensation like an explosion of gunpowder is an event, with natural causes and effects, but it no more mirrors the conditions of its occurrence than an explosion mirrors the chemicals and the spark which set those chemicals off. The sensation process is a complex process, in which, by virtue of the total situation established by object, medium, and end organ, the object and the end organ are temporarily of a different nature than before the situation was established. That is, the eye becomes a seeing eye, and the object becomes a white object. There would be no objection to calling the white object or the white alone by such terms as idea, impression, or psychic state, provided that no improper inferences were drawn from that term. Neither the white object nor the white is any of those things, however, if by those terms is meant a separate and distinct existence. The object seen is the object which was really there before it was seen, even though it was not then white and did not stand in the situation in which it later came to stand. There seems to be no warrant for calling objects white unless they are seen. But the white object seen is the same object which the eye for some reason singles out from the total environment. As Plato puts it, the eye becomes a seeing eye, and the object becomes a white object, and Plato would correctly add that no further entity or existence was involved in the process. The same eye may be the organ of many different sensations in which the same object is seen in many different shapes and colors. For the same object seen may be seen by the same eye in many different positions and under many different conditions. 
and since the nature of a sensation depends upon the total situation of object, medium, and end organ, the nature of successive sensations will vary. No sensation grasps the whole nature of the object. But what is seen is real, in so far forth under the circumstances, no matter whether it would be unreal under other circumstances. Footnote. Lest there be misunderstanding as to the meaning of real in the above paragraph, it might be noted that the term refers simply to what is there, i.e. to what exists at any moment. No supposition of always and forever enduring is implied. Recently, Mr. C. A. Strong wrote, If we say that data are real, we are forced to say that physical things are not real, while if we say that physical things are real, as I think we must, we are forced to conclude that data, as such, are not real. Essays in Critical Realism, page 225. But the bewildering dilemma clears up. When Mr. Strong explains at the end of his paragraph, in a phrase which seems to have been added at the last moment to meet the objections of one of his co-authors, that real means continuously existent. Such usage, if unusual, has ample historical precedent, but is not the meaning of the word in this paper. End footnote. There is a certain sense in which men stand in the egocentric predicament, viz. that they cannot have sensations of objects with which they are not brought in contact according to the conditions of object, medium, and end organ. But since knowledge is not a matter of sensations, taken singly or in complexes, there is no egocentric predicament about the cognitive experience. Also, since in sensation process they come into contact with the natural, the objective, the real world, there is no egocentric predicament about the metaphysical status of sensations. The world as sensed is ipso facto a different world than the world as not sensed, just as the end organ in action is different than the end organ not in action. But it is important to determine that the difference is from an examination of what goes on, and not to settle such questions by a definition of what a metaphysical difference might be. Certainly, as we observe the facts, there is no problem of the existence of an external world. There may well be problems as to the nature and the qualities of the seen objects and some of their unseen relationships, which are not directly observed. We may well ask such questions as the following. What color would the object be in a mist? What would the object look like under a microscope? Could we see the object through a certain intervening substance? Could we see the object from a certain distance? What is the chemical constitution of the object? At what rate do the atoms of which it is composed vibrate, etc., etc.? But we could not legitimately ask whether there is really an object there, for it is given as there. We could not legitimately ask whether it is really white, for if we know what the question means, we will know that in one sense it is white, and in another sense it is not. And if the question means neither of these things, there is no such thing as being really white. We never have the task of getting from the realm of psychic states into the world of physical existences, but simply the task of getting from the world as it is partially perceived to the world as it is more largely inferred to be. Footnote. Two statements in the recent essays in Critical Realism deserve comment here. Mr. Strong said, the world as sense perception presents it, and the world as it is by no means coincide. 227. In one sense, this is quite true, for the object seen is not at all times, and apart from perception, exactly what it is seen to be in vision. But in another sense, the statement is false, for the world as sense perception presents it is a part of the world as it is, though a small part. Mr. A. K. Rogers said in the same volume, the world of science is distinctly not the world of immediate perception. 151. This is true of physics and astronomy to a large extent, for those sciences are interested in certain aspects of the world not presented in sensations. But it is not true of optics, acoustics, and such sciences. And it is entirely false if it is meant that there is any metaphysical difference between the world of science and the world of immediate perception. In footnote. The problem of knowledge is the practical one of how to go from incomplete information to more complete understanding. 
that problem cannot be said to involve a dualism in any of the ordinary or historic senses of that word. It involves only a dualism between the less and the more, both of which are contained in the same total system of reality. We do not infer what things are like on the basis of psychic states or ideas wholly in the mind, but we infer what things are like in their entirety from those of their qualities and relations which we do directly perceive. Objects do not cease to be objects in becoming seen any more than they cease to be objects in becoming eaten. That, I take it, is what Plato meant when he said that the object becomes not whiteness but white. At least whether Plato meant that or not, it can be said that in vision, objects do not themselves become and do not produce as a sort of byproduct what are usually called psychic states, but become seen objects. And sensation presents us with no difficulty, except that of discovering from incomplete presentation of the world we confront certain other as yet unobserved and perhaps permanently unobservable items in which we may happen to be interested. Metaphysics and epistemology cannot properly be concerned with an alleged hiatus between two different sorts of existences, but with the distinction between and the differences in the things as seen and the things as not seen, all of which exist in one continuous realm of being. Men come into limited contact with things through sensations and need to know lots of facts about their world which can only be discovered indirectly on the basis of analogy, of inference, of hypothesis and experimentation. In other words, in addition to the knowledge which may be directly derived from such sensations as those of vision, we must have recourse to such well-guided reasonings as are furnished to us by such sciences as optics, physics, and chemistry. Section 2. The view of sensations thus outlined, whether or not it is to be found in Plato, is a realism or a naturalism. But it differs from, though it has certain sympathies with, two commonly accepted theories, by contrast with which its significance would perhaps be more obvious. The first of these is behaviorism. The second is the dualistic realism represented by the modern tradition which comes from Locke and Kant and which has recently been restated in an effort to minimize the dualism by the critical realists, though no effort will be made here to review those alternative views of sensation in any detail. The contrasts may be helpful. Footnote. A paper to follow this paper will examine the claim of the critical realists to have overcome the difficulties of the traditional epistemological dualism through their new doctrine of the datum as a logical essence. But for any such examination, a preliminary constructive statement seems advisable of the point of view from which criticism would be brought. End footnote. The position defended in this paper is in one sense of the word itself a behaviorism. We do not get sensations by passively waiting like the wax for the imprint of the seal. We would not call the images in a mirror sensations, that is, the sensations possessed by the mirror. An eye, however complete in all its parts, would probably not see objects if it were detached from the organism of which it is an integral part. Unless there is reaction by, as well as action upon the eye, vision does not occur. In other words, the eye must be the end organ of some physiological unit of response, since it is probably safe to affirm that the eye, taken by itself, could not respond at all. Sensations, as the term has been used in this paper, are certain qualities such as blue and red, sweet and sour, hot and cold. But these qualities appear only in connection with a certain process which involves object, medium, and end organ, and the activity of all those elements is jointly necessary. None of the qualities which are revealed by the process can be taken to invalidate the process, to throw doubt upon the reality of the fact that there has been such a process, to deny the reality of the conditions under which the process takes place. The description of the sensation processes from the standpoint of the organism is what behaviorism has to tell us about sensation, and is accepted as valid and convincing by the writer of this paper. Nonetheless, the standpoint of this paper is opposed to much contemporary behaviorism. 
the chief reason why behaviorism has not been even more widely and unanimously adopted in America than has been the case, and why the present writer finds it partly unacceptable, is that behaviorists have often denied the reality of obvious facts in the interests of the simplicity of their theories. When behaviorism arose shortly after 1890, largely as the result of the impetus given to psychological studies by William James, many philosophers were found describing the mind as a mere series of the sense qualities which the processes of sensation bring into existence. It was quite natural, therefore, that a reaction from this incomplete description should take place and that not simply the mind should be described in terms of the processes of sensation and the like, but the very existence of the sense qualities should be neglected and in more extreme cases denied. Footnote. Mr. J. B. Watson only harms his own cause by his impossible identification of colors or other qualities of an object with a physiological process. E.g., he recently quoted Dunlap with approval, to the effect that the so-called visual image is only an associated eye muscle strain, muscular sensation. C.F. The Dial, Volume 72, Number 1, page 101, January 1922. This is only a new form of the traditional materialistic fallacy. End footnote. At least whether natural or not, such did take place. Preoccupied with an analysis of the actions of the nervous system, behaviorists had nothing to say about the qualities which the objects have in sensation. Called to account for this neglect, they feared that they were being summoned once more to study merely these qualities, and knowing to their own satisfaction that what they had discovered about the mind could never be stated in any mere list of such qualities, however complete, they asserted that the mind was activity, not quality at all. Furthermore, fearing a renewal of the epistemological futilities of which modern philosophy has given such frequent instances, they were prompted to deny the existence of psychic states. And since their adversaries assured them that the qualities revealed in sensation were psychic states, they denied the very existence of the qualities altogether. To a certain extent, the dispute has been merely verbal. If anyone chooses to call the sense qualities which appear in the course of the sensation process by the name of mind, there should be no objection, though care would have to be exercised to keep from various of the traditional errors which have accompanied that terminological practice during the last three centuries. Similarly, if anyone chooses to call the activities of the organism in sensation and the like by the name of mind, again there should be no objection. Though we can discover no reason why certain qualities should appear exclusively in connection with certain processes, yet such seems to be the fact. If either thing were singled out as that in terms of which alone mine is to be identified, the behaviorist has chosen the better element. For the sense quality is the quality of the object. It is neither within the body nor within the confines of a mental realm distinguished from the physical world and the error of the behaviorist is decidedly less disastrous than that of the upholders of the psychic states. For their error is the enthusiastic one of youth in overstating a new discovery, and involves no distortion of reality insofar as their positive, if not their negative, arguments are concerned. Yet the issue has often gone farther than a verbal dispute. The behaviorists, assured from their own studies that the thing they called mind was a certain set of activities of the physiological organism, and assured by a long and important tradition that sense qualities did not exist outside the mind, had to deny that there were any sense qualities at all. Mind for them was not a receptacle. It was not a place in which anything could be located. Of course, their denial of sense qualities was an error. But the trap which led them into the error was the acceptance of the supposition that sense qualities are psychic states. If they erred, it was due to their trusting the word of those philosophers who, in Humean fashion, treated the mind as a series of states of consciousness and denied the objectivity of sense qualities. They are not to be much reproached for their error, for the premise which they furnished from their own experimental work was true whereas that supplied by their fellow philosophers, if true at all, was true only in a limited and unusual sense of the words. Those who are worried over the materialistic tendency of behaviorism have only themselves to blame. 
the error of behaviorism can be corrected only upon the supposition of the objectivity of sense qualities. The time has come to locate the error of behaviorism more fairly. The denial of the existence of facts which every man perceives every day of his life is preposterous. The existence of sense qualities does not have to be proved because it is given as an immediate fact of experience. Similarly, the existence of the activities of the nervous system does not need to be proved any further than behaviorists have done. What we need is to learn what various people mean by terms such as mind, and then state the well-proved conclusions in terms the meaning of which may be clear to all. No one probably would question that object, medium, and end organ are all essential to that sort of activity of the physiological organism, which we may then agree to call the process of sensation. Since mind is usually contrasted with object, we would do better not to call by the name of mind the sense quality, which the object assumes during and as a result of the process of sensation, for the sense quality is a quality of the object. Avoiding thus the term mind for the mere existence of sense qualities, we should recognize nonetheless their existence. That sense qualities are perceived and living processes are carried on by the same organism should not blind us to both sets of facts. The behaviorists have neglected or even denied the former. Their opponents have neglected and nearly always denied the latter, and then have drawn impossible conclusions from what they have mistakenly denied as well as from what they have truly affirmed. It is theoretically possible that some other cause than the sensation process might give rise to sense qualities, in which case no one surely would wish to speak of a mind as present. But it is actually the case that there are a number of biological and physiological processes which seem to go on without any sensations, any consciousness, any prevision of the future. And yet, even in these processes, we feel that we have something akin to what we mean by mind. Thus, though it is not the purpose of this paper to define mind, it can at least be said that the term seems to be best used for those of the living processes which have assumed a certain quality and a certain form. Footnote. A word of warning to the critics of a revised behaviorism may be timely here. Those who treat the mind as a matter of activity or relationship are usually called materialists. But that characterization is not always correct. It would be correct if the relations were altogether spatial, if the activity were that of gross motion such as waving arms and legs about in space. But usually the relationship and activity referred to are ideal. They can be described only in terms of meaning, anticipation of the future, inference, judgment. Mr. Sellers remarked that knowledge is not a real relation between the knower and the known. Essays in Critical Realism, page 206. I have not been able to puzzle out what he is intending to say, but his words would seem to mean either that knowledge did not exist or that the only real relations are spatial and material. I do not wish to be unfair, yet I cannot help but think that he tends to equate reality and matter and to be by implication more materialistic than many behaviorists. End footnote. Section 3. The opponents of behaviorism have almost unanimously treated sensations as psychic states, existing in the mind and having no objective status. In fact, this treatment has become so customary that it is often taken as an incontrovertible axiom, which needs no proof. Each consciousness is then cut off from the rest of the world by an absolute break, and the world of nature, the objective world, is not known directly. Footnote, e.g., in Essays in Critical Realism, it is said that psychology deals with subjective data, 31, that the sphere of the psychologist is the psychical as such, 208, that a sensation apart from its reference is but a pure state of our sensibility, 234, that perception is not direct, 103, etc. CF also pages 11, 28, 164, 192, 197, 217, et passim. End footnote. The proofs for the subjectivity of sensation are mostly indirect. 
i.e., they consist in showing that sensations could not be objective. There are three such proofs which have frequently been offered from Locke to the critical realists, and there is an implicit principle or metaphysical axiom usually assumed. These must be reviewed before the thesis of this paper can be taken as acceptable. The arguments can be briefly summed up. 1. That different people looking at the same object have different sensations, and the sensations are therefore not really in the object, but only imaginatively projected there. 2. That objects seem to have contradictory qualities, and hence that qualities must be not in the object, but in the mind. 3. That the qualities we discover are different from what we know on other grounds to be the nature of the objects, and hence cannot be in the objects at all. Footnote. For the most recent statement of these arguments in compact form, consult Essays in Critical Realism, pages 8, 15, 133, 224, 226, etc. End footnote. Now all these arguments are good as a refutation of naive realism, which supposes objects to be at all times just what they are seen at any one moment to be, though it may be doubted if the most naive man in the street ever held such a position. But none of them militates against the argument for the objectivity of sensations as set forth in this paper. 1. Different people looking at the same object of course have different sensations, which proves that the sense quality is not in the object taken alone and absolutely, but which does not prove that the object may not have the various different qualities relatively to the different situations in which it stands to different organisms. Relativity is not subjectivity, and in these days of relativity, when even physicists talk in such terms, the old thoughtless identification of the relative and the subjective requires revision. If sensations are relative to medium and end organ, as well as to object, the conditions of observation would assist in determining what quality would be seen. Under identically the same circumstances, the object has identically the same quality. Two. The contradictory qualities, being also a matter of diverse points of view, signify nothing in the way of subjectivity. For the contradictory qualities are not in the object taken alone. The trouble here seems to arise from considering qualities as distinct and separate entities, like a lot of marbles which small boys carry around in their pockets. The sense qualities of object are relative to the point of view, and unless it is contradictory to suppose that there is more than one point of view in the universe, it is hard to see why it is contradictory to suppose an object to have successively to the same organism or simultaneously to different organisms a number of different qualities. 3. The fact referred to in the third argument is not a point against the theory of this paper, but part of the position defended. But the inference from the fact betrays a non sequitur, because an object does not have eternally and unchangeably a certain quality observed in sensation, is no reason why it may not have that quality in case of being related in a certain way to a certain perceiving organism. It is a long jump from the discovery that the qualities observed in sensation are not the qualities which the object has apart from sensation, to the conclusion that the qualities are not qualities of the object at all but psychic states in the mind. Before such a conclusion could be defended, one would have to find such a mind as could contain qualities, which kind of a mind is not revealed by experience. And even then, one would need some experimental evidence for the location of qualities there instead of somewhere else. No one has ever successfully essayed this task. Rather, such a supposition is defined as an axiom and accept it as authentic before experience is examined, and experience is then made to fit into this scheme at any cost. In addition to these arguments, which are restated in various forms, there is an alleged metaphysical principle which is supposed to prove the subjectivity of sensations. Instead of going to experience to find out whether we can really see and touch objects, the advocates of subjectivism adduce on an a priori proof against such direct contact between observer and object. Footnote, e.g., Mr. R. W. Sellers said that the claim to have the object immediately present is impossible, and his reason is that it would involve the leaping of spatial and temporal barriers in an unnatural fashion. Essays in Critical Realism, page 200. 
the quite sufficient answer to Mr. Sellers and all the other critical realists who reject the contact of observer with object is contained in the wise words of Mr. Santayana in their own volume, The Standard of Naturalness is Nature Itself, page 167, end footnote. Mind and matter are so regarded that contact between them is deemed impossible. The trouble here seems to be with the concept of cause. The assumption seems to have been made that one thing cannot cause another thing unless we can understand how the act of causation takes place. But causation, however naturally matter, is not a logical procedure. A person who looked at the greenish-yellow gas called chlorine with its disagreeable odor and poisonous effect upon the lungs, and then looked at the whitish metal called sodium, which discolors so quickly as it oxidizes when exposed to the air, might never suspect that these two substances combined in certain proportions would give another substance indispensable to living organisms and delicious for the seasoning of food. We can discover certain facts which we cannot account for, yet metaphysics should not be regarded as a process of accounting for the universe, but as a statement in general terms of what the universe happens to be. Similarly, we may be unable to explain why certain kinds of matter, organized in a certain way, make living beings and in organs and nervous systems. And we may be unable to explain why under certain circumstances these living beings can perceive objects. We are entitled to seek explanation of these facts in the sense that we may search for the detailed analysis of the processes involved, but not in the sense that we may formulate a principle which will account for things being as they are instead of otherwise. However unrelated to logical processes they may be, natural processes are nonetheless real, i.e. take place. They do not wait for the logician to justify their occurrence. Causation is not anything to be explained in mass, but to be accepted and to be used as an explanation of what happens to and around us. Nature is more resourceful than the mind of a rationalist. Antecedent intelligibility is not a measure of natural possibility. What is, is possible. If we do perceive objects, then we can. Metaphysicians should start with nature, not with axioms and their principles should be generalizations from the facts, not regulations by which they, like traffic policemen for the universe, endeavor to determine the direction in which things must go. Doubtless many advocates of the existence of psychic states would reject the false metaphysical axiom discussed in the preceding paragraph. But if they carry out that rejection and eliminate its implications from all their theories, what antecedent likelihood is there that objects have not really the qualities which they are found inexperienced to have, and that we do not, in spite of every indication, really come into immediate contact with objects? Thus the way is open for a return to a naturalism, which takes the universe at face value, gives credit to whatever it finds, and seeks for as much more as it can discover, and recognizes the setting in which living, perceiving, and thinking go on. Naturalism in this sense is far from materialism. Footnote. The word naturalism has not in this paper at all the same meaning as, for example, in Professor Perry's present philosophical tendencies. End footnote. For it regards the material world as the natural basis which finds its ideal fulfillment in the achievement of the goods which the structure of reality makes possible. Footnote. These phrases are borrowed from Santayana's Life of Reason. End footnote. And thus from the slime of the seabed may arise beings who sing songs, build cathedrals, erect shrines to the saints, and dream of the kingdom of God. But the full meaning of naturalism is too much to attempt to define in a closing paragraph. It is perhaps enough if something has been said to reinforce Plato's contention that in vision the eye becomes a seeing eye, and the object becomes a white object. End of The Metaphysical Status of Sensations by Sterling P. Lamprecht.